Well, as the end of meteorological winter nears, we're already looking ahead to hurricane season. Now, last year, we saw our first named tropical storm in mid-May. It's not uncommon to see early season storms. You know, Dr. Nab, we know that for several years in a row, we've seen a tropical storm, even a hurricane before June 1st. That, of course, the official start of the season. So you kind of still have to be on your game, even outside of our calendar definition. And Alex, you of all people should know because... Yes. Hurricane Alex kind was of an off-season system yeah. in 2016. <laughs> what can I say? I don't, I don't play by the rules, people. <laughs> <laughs> no, and we as humans, we always want to put the atmosphere into this box where it behaves the way we want. And hurricane season running June through November is part of how we try to define things. But look at all of these systems that have occurred just in the last decade before June 1. Now, Hurricane Alex in 2016, that was a January hurricane way out in the eastern Atlantic. That was really meteorologically more part of the end of the 2015 season and really isn't part of the discussion we're having uh, in the weather community about what do we do about all these May systems? Look at how many, nine May systems that have been named in May prior to uh, the official start of the hurricane season. And the problem with these is number one, that a lot of them tend to form close to home. Look at all of those tracks that where the systems are forming close to the United States and sometimes making landfall in the United States. And what the Hurricane Center has to do is write special tropical weather outlooks to talk about the possibility of these forming, and then they kick off the advisories when it actually becomes a depression or storm. That's one problem, because they don't routinely issue their outlooks until June 1. The other problem is that some of these have been pretty impactful. So we want to have as much routine product issuances and heads up that these are coming. And in fact, Barrel, that was a tropical storm in 2012 that went into the Jacksonville, Florida area, was a top end tropical storm at 65 miles an hour. Um, and so it was almost a hurricane when it came ashore. But what's not happening, what's ma what makes this complicated and difficult to deal with is we've had no hurricanes in the last several decades, only two hurricanes on record in the Atlantic Basin and no landfalling U.S. hurricanes in May. So that does make it difficult to figure out when does hurricane season really start and what should the hurricane center be doing differently to deal with this recent problem prior to June 1, Mike. All right, so Dr. Nab, you know, if storms form before the official start of the season, June 1st, the Hurricane Center is going to issue outlooks and advisories anyway. They're going to issue them as needed, right? But now they're actually proposing to start issuing those on a regular basis beginning on May 15th. It would coincide with the Pacific hurricane season, may catch some of these early season ones. What do you think about this? I know you have, you kind of have a unique view of this because you were once the Hurricane Center director. How easy would this be and do you think it's logical? You know, back in the day, I was one of the hurricane forecasters, and starting May 15th, they go on to their routine operational shifts, and every six hours, they're issuing the East Pacific Tropical Weather Outlook. It would not be that big of an increase in their workload and their schedule to also issue an Atlantic Tropical Weather Outlook every six hours starting May the 15th, instead of the current procedure, which is that routine issuance starts on June 1, and then they issue the special outlooks when there's something trying to get going uh, uh, you know, before that time. I like this mm -hmm. idea because it's an easy fix and it is a product enhancement from the Hurricane Center. We would all be on a regular schedule starting May the 15th, but you can do that because you're mainly trying to get the word out about the potential for depressions and tropical and subtropical storms to form without there being hurricanes, which hardly ever happens in May in the Atlantic Basin. You know, there, then there's the conversation of do we move the start or do we change the, the official start? That comes with some complications. It's not just as easy as being like, okay, yeah, it doesn't seem that hard. We'll, we'll call it. We'll call it May 15th. Well, if the Hurricane Center and the International Committee with the other countries in this part of the world that they work with, uh, if they wanted to change the official start of the hurricane season, they could. But the Hurricane Center realizes that has pros and cons, so they're not proposing to do that this year. They're proposing to put a team together, talk with the other countries, talk with stakeholders, and figure out if that's a good idea. One reason why it's not a good idea, in my opinion, is as soon as you declare that the official Atlantic hurricane season starts May the 15th, then if you continue to go years and decades without any hurricanes occurring in the Atlantic Basin in May, then everybody's going to go, 
Well, that's not the real hurricane season. They, they, they could lose yeah. a little credibility there. And I think it's yeah. best to leave it the way it is, issue these outlooks sooner, and handle the tropical and subtropical storms with those routine outlook issuances. Uh, pros and cons to it all, but Dr. Nab, thanks for breaking it down for us here. Well, I'm sure that the debate will continue on, no question about that. Well, Mike, this week the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, announced that it is officially retiring four previously used hurricane names. The names are Dorian from 2019, replaced with Dexter, and Laura from 2020, replaced with Leah. Ada and Iota were also retired. So these are the two years worth of retired names on the Atlantic side that were decided upon this past week in a virtual meeting. Mike, last year they didn't even meet to decide on retirements because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but they uh, took care of both years all at once yeah. this week. Anything controversial here or do you think storms that, they, that should have gotten retired that didn't? I don't really think there's any strong case to be made. I mean, Dorian and Laura were obvious mm -hmm. uh, choices, as were Ada and Iota because of the back-to-back -back horrendous hits in Central America. Uh, I, I could have made a case for Isa Eas, uh maybe on the east coast of the U.S. from 2020, in addition to the fact that I'm biased because I don't want any four-syllable names yeah. left on the list. But uh, I think they got the four big ones from the last two right, years. That brings up another topic then. We had to retire... Uh, Greek names, but we're actually just flat out retiring the Greek alphabet. Yeah, because when you look at the two names uh, that were from the Greek alphabet that were retired, Ada and Iota, it's always been a dilemma. What do you replace them with? Mm -hmm. And I went to the committee several years ago and I said, this problem is going to happen you know, one of these days where you're going to have Greek names, when you exhaust the conventional name for that year, that need to be retired, what are you going to replace it with? And, and they didn't want to make the change at the time. And I said, someday you're going to be forced into it, and now they've been forced into it. it they didn't want to have... Ada and Iota get used again in any way, shape, or form, and that uh -huh. just pretty much blows up the Greek alphabet system. Yeah. And plus, that name list was never that great anyway, Mike. You had <laughs> right. Beta, Zeta, like Ada. And all too much of rhyming, Although, and you got to Z too fast. Dr. Neff, yeah. I will say this. Last, end of last hurricane season, you were a little skeptical that they would even change this. Are you surprised they made the change so quickly? I, I, I'm pleasantly a little bit surprised, okay. although I think the collective discussion in the offseason has really steered most people to the realization that it was mm -hmm. going to be really confusing to keep using those names. Uh, but because they were so in favor of it and, and, and pushed back on me getting rid of it in the past, I thought maybe they would still be now. Yeah. But they also, Mike, they implemented the system that I'd been talking about is to come up with a seventh list of names. You don't come up with a brand new list of an entire uh, uh, worth of uh, names mm -hmm. Uh, every year, A through W, this is the auxiliary list that replaces the Greek name list. So you go back to A after W is exhausted in a really yeah. busy year. Dr. Nab, um, I know you're not going to do it, but I'm going to give you a little pet on the back there. You planted the seed, and they finally they finally took your advice this yeah. year and pulled the trigger on it. So it's uh, a good decision. Whole new, yeah. whole new convention next year, and that's a good thing. Hey, stick around. A recap of our top stories and weekend forecast next. Well, the National Hurricane Center recently released its final report on Hurricane Laura from last year. The deadly Category 4 hurricane produced storm surge levels up to 18 feet. You can see that there on uh, some of the buildings there. Um, by the way, um, you look, look at that. See, there's the surge, 18 feet, just under the gutters of that home right there. Laura, one of 30 named storms from last season. So what can we expect this hurricane season. Well, today, researchers from Colorado State University released their annual hurricane forecast. So we're bringing in our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Nabb, also the former director of the Hurricane Center for more on this. Dr. Nabb, the numbers above average here. What do we know about this forecast? What could it tell us about the season? Well, I think it tells us some things that we've learned when we've had past years that were really busy. And then what did the next year look like? Because a big reason why last year was as busy as it was was because we didn't have El Nino. We had a La Nina. And now it's really hard for the atmosphere ocean system to do a complete 180 and go all the way over to El Nino, which would lessen hurricane activity. So we're either going to be in the weak La Nina we are now or go to neutral. And that's the main reason why the numbers in the forecast are still above average, because we just don't see us going from something that's highly favorable for activity to something that's highly uh, hostile to activity. See the blues uh, over in the Pacific on the equator? That's still La Nina going on. 
on. And Mike and Alex, look at all that fuel on the Atlantic side. The Atlantic waters are warm. So everything is pointing to at least an average and probably an above average season. What else are they looking at in terms of making this? So are there any other factors that stand out to them and to you in terms of saying, OK, we still think this is going to be a pretty active year? Yeah, and some of this has to go you know, with history, you go back to 1995, we're in an active era. A switch got flipped around 1995, where we are just at a higher baseline, right? And you see those those uh, blue lines on there are the La Nina years, including 2020, that's after that graph. And then the red years are the neutral years. And we have learned that unless you have El Nino uh, in this active era, you're going to have a large number of hurricanes and major hurricanes. And you know, if you go back to 2017, for example, that was a gangbusters year, way above average during La Nina. And then in 2018, we went to a neutral phase, but even though the numbers were down, we still had Michael and Florence. So uh, again, we, we're just not going to go back to an El Nino. That seems highly unlikely. It's got to be, but there's more to it, Doctor Nav, than just El Nino, El Nino or La Nina, mm -hmm. because that would it seems like it would just be too easy to forecast, right? But having said all that, all that, right? We had 30 yeah. storms last year, and forecasting about half of that this year. Well, again, the, the skill in the seasonal forecast is pretty low when it comes to the total number of storms, especially like last year when you had so many relatively short-lived and weak storms. The skill in the seasonal forecast is in terms of the hurricanes and the major hurricanes. And even though it's, it's really hard to forecast a, a way above average year like last year, the seasonal forecast for last year was still above average. But... Compared to last year, the conditions look just a little less conducive for a lot of hurricanes and majors, but they're still forecasting above average because of the lack of El, of El Nino. And look at the Atlantic Ocean temperatures. They are still really warm, especially in the subtropics out of the Caribbean. So what, what they see right now with the warm Atlantic and the La Nina kind of hanging on, and they compare that to past years that looked like this year, that's why the above average. So uh, takeaway once again is don't get caught up in the numbers. It only takes that one, you know, yeah. four hurricane or major hurricanes, what they're forecasting. None may hit the U.S., but four may. Yeah, and also don't think, well, if last year was so busy, we're going to catch a break this year. 2018 was pretty bad after 17. 2012 was bad after 2011. So get ready again. All right, Dr. Nam, thank you. We'll continue through the early evening hours. Tropical season underway. Hurricane season officially begins on June 1st, but watching this blob right here, Hurricane Center says there's a chance as it moves over warmer tropical waters as we head toward the weekend that it could become a subtropical storm. If it does, it would be called Anna. You can see the odds pretty good right now up to about 40%. Again, hurricane season officially starts on June 1st. For us, though, it's warm, very windy. When the winds will finally slow down when I'm back with my forecast in a couple minutes. Meanwhile, today in the tropics, it looks like preseason activity will get going very soon. Hurricane Center keeping tabs on this non-tropical area of low pressure about 700 miles to the east southeast of Bermuda. It's going to move into some warmer waters where it could become a short lived tropical system, subtropical system. And if it gets a name, it'll be Anna has a 90% chance of that happening very soon. And if it develops, most of the models have it looping around over here here and then eventually moving back towards the north and northeast. And what's really interesting is we still have this hose of moisture coming in from the east south we east. As a matter of fact, if you're standing uh, on, on Galveston Island and you're standing right on the seawall, you're just feeling that air coming right at you, not to mention uh, a little bit of a water rise too. We've actually got that on the Texas coast because of the fetch. It's been so persistent. This morning, our big batch of rain uh, into New Orleans and of course south into the bayou, heading uh, toward the north, northwest. And in all honesty, this is one of the quieter mornings to start with this week, believe it or not. Um, it may not end up that way, certainly by the time we get to the end of the day, because we are watching a little area of low pressure here east of Brownsville, Texas. You can see the precip shield with that. Not a lot of deep convection at this time, um, and the models do bring it on shore, if you will, to the mid-Texas coast later on today. But it just you know, keeps funneling this feed up here into western Louisiana and eastern Texas, and that's going to persist as we head in toward the weekend. Where did this thing come from? 
Well, it looked like it came at least in part from an old thunderstorm complex. Remember the one that moved through South Texas the other morning? We had a severe thunderstorm watch. We had heavy rain down through Harlingen and Zapata and Corpus Christi and Brownsville. And from that DNA, well, voila, we've got ourselves a, a, a low pressure system area this morning. And actually, even before the first visible pictures come up, it looks like we've got something spinning down there, uh, potentially low level. We'll just have to wait and see uh, when we look at the visible. All right, here's the deal. 20% chance it's developing. It's got a very short window to do that. It's coming ashore, as I mentioned, uh, tonight and tomorrow, whatever it is. You can see the guidance has some type of broad low in through here. Let's see what they do with it, though, as it takes it uh, on in time. So here comes some of the moisture. Moving north, yeah, Houston, you're in this again. Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, by the time we get into this afternoon. Uh, you know, huge slug of moisture all the way north to Shreveport, all the way in Arkansas, southeast Louisiana, into the Arbuckle, or Oklahoma, into the Arbuckles. And there's the low. You saw it coming ashore uh, well to the south of Houston. So areas of very heavy rain and concern now all the way up to Fort Smith that we have in through here. So the big question this morning that I have for Stephanie is, Okay, Steph, we got this little twist in the Gulf, but we also have one northeast of Bermuda. Exactly. Which one becomes Anna first? We have Anna and we have Bill. Could we have two named storms I'd... before the start of the hurricane season? We did last year. Yeah, we did last year. <laughs> I would not sleep on this. If you look at the models right now, it's kind of stretched out, but Jim said we got to get that visibility in to see. You can see kind of a twist trying to develop there. Is it at the surface? That is the big question. Places like Lake Jackson, Matagorda, Aransas Pass down towards Corpus, you'll get a lot of rain with that, regardless if it gets a name or not. Regardless, you're going to get a lot of rain. But Jim was alluding to this system. All right, so this is going to be affecting Bermuda. Now, this could be subtropical Anna or subtropical Bill. What is a subtropical storm? Well, remember, we got the tropics, which is down towards the equator, and the tropics, technically, the region goes up to 23 and a half degrees north. Then you hit the subtropics in the temperate region, and then you got the polar region at 66.5 north. So if this is subtropical storm Anna or Bill, you still have the same effects. It just it depends on where it develops and also what some of the characteristics are. But the wind speed's still the same. If you have a subtropical storm versus a tropical storm, 80% chance there of development. And we do have the potential to see some issues here in Bermuda. Jen, just to show real quick the path of this system, Kind of meandering around, but it definitely could be breezy and those waves yep. could be kicking up. That's why a tropical storm watch is up for Bermuda. You know, we've got tropical activity now in the Gulf and the Atlantic, as you saw. So it's fitting that NOAA has released their annual forecast predicting an above average hurricane season this year with as many as five major storms new this morning. This comes on the heels of what was an unforgettable 2020 tropical season. With memories and the mess of last year's historic season lingering. Today, we're learning what the 2021 hurricane season could look like. We're seeing more storms. We're seeing more intense storms. Scientists with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration predicting above average activity. With up to 20 named storms over the next six months or so, six to 10 of those expected to reach hurricane status, with as many as five major hurricanes, category three or higher. Typically during high activity areas and above normal seasons, we do see a more storms that get closer to the U.S. Um, and have more landfalls. The warning comes on the heels of what was the most active hurricane season on record, 30 named storms. Seven that each cost more than a billion dollars in damages. 11 making landfall in the U.S., six of those designated as hurricanes. According to NOAA's Hurricane Research Division, that's well above the average of one to two hurricane landfalls each season. And this year, things could get started early. Okay, so if 90L in the Atlantic gets a name, it will be the seventh consecutive year. Either storm gets a name. Seventh consecutive year with a name storm before the official June 1st start of the hurricane season. Jim, um, by this point last year, the hurricane hunters had already flown into tropical storm Arthur. Remember that, right? So we, you know, right. we were ahead of schedule last year as well. Do you think they'll fly into what's happening in the Gulf? That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, if they do, it'll be one of these things where they send a, send a plane out. But I, I think from satellite and the fact that it's coming in, you can see it a little bit better. Uh, even on radar, they may not have to do they that. Right. right. And, and, right. And when we've it's seen that. Quick. We've yeah. seen that. We saw that, you know, with Hannah last year. Spotty to isolated shower. We should be okay. And then as we head into the start of the work week, we'll still deal with those winds out of the east. Lighter, though, beginning to warm up and low rain chances across South Florida. Now, switching gears, 
The hur hurricane season doesn't officially begin until the 1st of June, but we're already dealing with our first named st system of the season. Subtropical storm Ana formed just northeast of Bermuda, and you can see here on satellite cover, uh, satellite how we are seeing that swirl here across portions of the Atlantic waters. So this is a large system, but the good news is that this system will continue to move farther away from Bermuda in the days to come. So right now it is maximum sustained winds of 45 miles per hour, and it is expected to meander here through the next 24 hours and then eventually be picked up and quickly move out towards the northeast away from my friends in Bermuda. Right now there is a tropical storm watch in effect for portions of Bermuda. This system will pose no threat to the United States. Oh, Anna has arrived. The storm becomes the first of the Atlantic hurricane season, which hasn't even officially started yet. And Tropical Storm Anna is not headed our way, thankfully. Right, that yes. is the good news. But our Luke Doris is here to tell us about what we can expect this year following such an early start to the season, like a broken record, Luke. Yeah, the forecast is for an above active season. So, you know, we're not expecting what we had last year, but the ingredients are there yet again that we could see a fair amount of activity in 2021. Now, here we go. We're starting early. Uh, here we are in the end of May, and we've got Tropical Storm Anna. Now, it's 1,200 miles away. This thing's not going to cause much of a fuss. It's near Bermuda. Bermuda, but it's far enough even away from Bermuda that it's not causing much trouble there just swells. Winds have picked up a little bit there at 45 miles per hour, but this is still going to die out by Monday as it gets absorbed into this system in the North Atlantic and then it'll be history. So this is the seventh straight year where we've had a storm form before June 1st. These early season storms do tend to be pretty weak. Uh, and just so you know, in May, you know, we haven't had a hurricane form in May in 50 years. So the real hurricane season, that's yet to come. That's down the line. Felicia? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's that time of year where it starts to heat up, but it's also that time of year where we're talking about the tropics. And we've already had our first named storm as we edge closer to the official beginning of hurricane season for the Atlantic Basin. That happens on June 1st. Tropical storm Anna churning away here in the North Atlantic was initially subtropical, now being called tropical winds at 45 miles an hour. It is moving off to the northeast, so farther away from Bermuda, not causing any issues there. Uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of a wave action, but generally not bothering. Bermuda at all and that has been the case as this continues to pull farther away to the northeast into early Monday you see those winds becoming from 45 to 40 miles an hour so losing some of that strength now when we're talking about storm origin in late May we typically do see it there along the southeast coast or portions of the Gulf or off the coast of Central America so not too far off from what we'd expect Paul live local late breaking WPBF 25 news at 6 starts now First at six, our first named storm ahead of the official 2021 hurricane season, now downgraded to a depression after becoming a tropical storm earlier today. Good evening, and I'm Shane Wright. Thank you so much for joining us. Lots of dry air and low humidity in South Florida this weekend, but that's all going to change later this week. First warning, meteorologist Brooke Silverang is timing out when the humidity returns. But first, Brooke, what's the latest on tropical storm Anna? Right, well, now downgraded to a depression, Shane, earlier this afternoon, and it has weakened tremendously, and that's typically what we do see with these storms that develop preseason, very short-lived, not very strong either. On record, there's only been two storms that we've seen become hurricanes back in May, but this storm will continue to move away from land. If you're curious how far away it is, it's actually about 1,400 miles away from us here in South Florida. Again, it is expected to weaken and not affect any land at all, but it's not uncommon to see storms developing prior to hurricane season in May. This will actually be the seventh year in a row with the storm starting off very, very early. Again, of course, the first official day of hurricane season, as we all know here in Florida, June 1st. So there's a look water vapor mid upper levels of the atmosphere. This is going to keep us pretty stable, keep us pretty balanced. So we're really not going to see much in the way of sea breeze storms developing. Of course, this is the time of the year where that's where most of our rain is fueled from. Now taking a look at our satellite, looking at all that moisture, none really over Florida. We have this big area of high pressure and then as we take a look well out to our east right along here this was actually our first named storm of the season it was subtropical anna then it was tropical anna and now it is post tropical cyclone on a rather and it is moving off still to the northeast look how fast almost 30 miles per hour so it is really speeding up it's lost its tropical characteristics and again still not expected to be any threat to land our tropical update today marking the first day of hurricane season and that's why we're going to see and talk to local 10 hurricane specialist brian norcross and joining us right now hey brian 
Hey, Christy. Hey, Louie. And uh, happy hurricane season, everybody. A lot happier this year because nothing's going on out there uh, to be concerned about. Here we have, look, a couple disturbances way down here in the tropics. You see one way down here. Here's another one right there. But the only really one of prominence is right over near us, as Betty's been talking about. That's an upper level disturbance, but not really a threat. The reason we don't have any threats is because the upper level winds blowing across the tropics are very strong, and that's just going to keep anything from developing uh, in that uh, pattern as long as that's in place. We have had one hurricane affect South Florida in June, and there was the track. It was Miami's very first hurricane after it became a city in 1896. Came right over downtown in June of 1906, and uh, it was a Category 1. That year was a funny year. There was another hurricane that was much stronger that came along in October of 1906. Look at 2020. This is the way it worked out. Look at all the reds. Those were the hurricane force winds. Notice they were all in the Gulf. Over here in South Florida, yes, we did have some tropical storm force winds, but somehow everything avoided us in that uh, amazing year last year. There were the numbers, of course, how could we ever forget? 30 named storms. Now this year, as you know, the projection is that we're gonna have about 17 uh, storms, plus or minus, and compare that to an average of 14. But here's the thing about that 14. It's really a little bit low from reality because if we look at the storms lasting less than two days, Dr. Phil Klotzbeck put this together, and, and we look at those, we see that over the years with new technology, we're just seeing more of those. So if we add one or two to that 14, we're up at 16. So bottom line is, looks like this year is forecast at this point to be about normal well, on average for what we've seen over the last 20 years or so. It's just that the averages are different now because we detect more storms here in the right. uh, modern world with better technology. Anyway, good news is nothing going on right now. Guys, back to you. And we'll take that. A quiet start to the uh, 2021 hurricane season. Thank you, Brian. The American Red Cross plans to keep COVID-19 restrictions in place at shelters throughout this year's hurricane season. The organization saying there was no significant spread of COVID-19 in its shelters with protocols in place. The Red Cross says it provided millions of meals and housed hundreds of thousands of hurricane victims last year. Gracias, Yoneski. Muy linda historia y muy buenas tardes para ti también para los amigos de Telemundo 51. Y comienzo hablando rápidamente del trópico. Por el momento todo está tranquilo, no se espera formación ciclónica en las próximas 48 horas. Sin embargo, un área de baja presión pudiera formarse el jueves o el viernes sobre este sector en la porción suroccidental del Mar Caribe, cerca de Costa Rica, también Nica Nicaragua y Panamá. Y esa zona de baja presión pudiera encontrar un ambiente un poco favorable en los próximos cinco días y organizarse mejor. Es por eso que el Centro Nacional de Huracanes le atribuye apenas un 20% de posibilidad de desarrollo. El sistema no representa un peligro para nosotros en el sur de Florida, pero sí va a estar llevando intensa lluvia hacia sectores de Centroamérica. Pero ahora regresamos acá al sur de la Florida. Como pueden ver en la imagen de satélite y radar, a esta hora toda la lluvia se concentra hacia sectores de la costa del Golfo, con buen tiempo predominando hacia sectores de la costa este. Y todo eso en respuesta otra vez a esa brisa que hace posible que esa lluvia se mantenga mantenga alejada de nosotros y confinada hacia sectores de la costa del Golfo, condiciones que todavía se van a quedar presentes por los próximos días. Time now for our daily check on the tropics. The meteorologist Luke Doris is in the Weather Authority Center with a look at what's out there, and thankfully I'm hearing Saharan dust. It is. There's a ton of that going across the Atlantic, keeping the main basin way out here nice and dry. But the National Hurricane Center is spotlighting two areas uh, that we're watching. One is new as of today. It's off the coast of the Carolinas. Low chance of forming. Even if it does, it'd be weak and it goes out into the Atlantic. We're not going to talk about that one very much. This one, though, I think we're going to talk about much of this week. 50% chance that this one develops. It's a region right now of unsettled weather, showers and thunderstorms that spends a lot of time just festering over here in the southern Gulf of Mexico. This is by Thursday. It's still here. Conditions do improve and become more favorable for development by late this week. That's where we could get a depression. Steering currents keep it away from South Florida, but this could bring about uh, a week or so from now. A lot of heavy rain to the Gulf states. We'll be watching that. The big deal that's happening is that we've got something developing in the tropics off the coast, Alex. Yeah, we do. We have a tropical depression. Yeah, if you're just 
joining us here. New depression that has formed. There it is just off the coast of uh, North Carolina. But look, there's a few other areas. Things are lighting up a little more here in the tropics. You have an, even have an area to watch here off the coast of Africa. Now the chances for that developing in the uh, uh, near and short term uh, and long term aren't very great. But still, keep an eye on that. And a few other areas, southern Gulf of Mexico, East Pacific, where we actually have a tropical storm, Carlos, uh, there that is spinning away. So let's get a little bit closer here. This is our depression, and we've been watching sort of the big flare-ups here. You can see that here on the satellite view. Flare-up of thunderstorms right around. There is the center. You can actually see the center that shows up and it gets exposed a bit here in the last bit of that loop. Notice where it is headed off towards the north and the east and away from the coast. So that's some better news, but can't rule out maybe a shower or two kind of clipping the outer banks within that, maybe a gusty wind or two. But for the most part, the core of this thing will continue to move away. And right now it's moving in that direction off to the northeast, 21 miles per hour. So this thing is hauling, moving very, very fast. Uh, good news there. Watch, though, there could be some rip current issues. That's something that we'll have to watch out for the next couple of days. But in terms of direct big impacts to the east coast of the U.S., not anticipating that. There's the projected path over the next uh, couple of days through Tuesday evening. In fact, look how fast this thing's moving by Tuesday evening. This thing's way up into the northern portions of the Atlantic. There's a European model showing you the area of spin associated with it. Again, moving away from the U.S. Uh, East Coast. So that's a good scenario. Hopefully all these systems continue to uh, move away. The ones that too, do try to develop moving away is where we want to see them going. Exactly. Yeah. However, we're still looking at the potential for some big downpours here. We have this batch of rain, even though it's starting to slide away, we could still see some of those downpours kind of skirt right up and down the coast of Miami-Dade and Broward counties. And then there's another huge area of very heavy rainfall making its way east out of Collier County. Some of that could impact us overnight. In the tropics, three areas that the National Hurricane Center is eyeing. Uh, recently upgraded tropical storm Bill, a disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico, and a wave off of the west coast of Africa. We're not expecting anything off of that wave. Meanwhile, tropical storm Bill, as of 11 p.m., 45 mile an hour winds, it will continue to track towards the northeast and possibly coming to an end sometime on Wednesday by the Canadian Maritimes. This other area of disturbed weather in the Gulf of Mexico is getting a 70% chance for development over the next five days in this area highlighted in red. Everyone here from Texas through Louisiana should be on the lookout for that just in case it does organize. So let's talk about what's going on. Hopefully uh, uh, the, the tropics will cooperate with us here as we go on in time. It, you know, things got really active starting yesterday. Last night at 11 o'clock, we had Bill. You can see it this morning. Uh, great looking satellite picture this morning as this thing moves north toward Newfoundland and starts to be, take on what we call extra tropical characteristics. Look at that CDO, that central dense overcast. You can see how it got tropical uh, just during the overnight hours and through there. But our focus is really on 92L, uh, 25 miles an hour now our development area again is still going to be once this is on the move if that because not a lot of the guidance here really does a lot with this except bring this huge slug of moisture north but i don't trust anything uh down in this neck of the woods in the bay of campeche so there you can see where the low is it's just basically just skimming off the land so it's not going to develop all that much there it's going to have to get a little move water's plenty warm enough shear is a non-issue now here's the european the latest european uh, from zero z last night you can see they bring a low pressure system up just to the east of houston but look at where the moisture is focused right over New Orleans. And this is very similar to what we had yesterday morning. The potential here for anywhere from three to essentially over a foot of rain. That is a disaster in the wettest part of the country right now. All right, so we watch this slug of moisture head north and then eventually northeast. A lot of the guidance holds this together all the way to the mid-Atlantic. So interestingly enough, we're gonna get some rain later on this weekend in North Carolina from a tropical system, but it's gonna be from the west side versus coming in uh, off of the Atlantic. One thing to note here, we're watching the Pacific as well. Whether this develops or not is probably irrelevant because it won't you know, be a big deal. But the big deal may come from the moisture surge up through the Gulf of California. Could we, by next week, get some needed moisture here in the low levels of the atmosphere? 
Um, this is a very distinct possibility, Jordan, and we're going to be watching that. Quickly developing by the beach, uh, by Liberty City. So these are rather quick. I mean, it was quiet just moments ago, just what, about 10 minutes ago. So we'll see this isolated chance for showers and thunderstorms, but they'll become spottier and scattered through the rest of the afternoon, especially towards the evening hours. I'm also watching this area here of moisture. This could be an actual impact for the keys if this rain holds together. So it looks like that's going to be coming our way even as we head into the overnight. We're still under the influence of this trough of low pressure over southern Florida. And so that's actually drawing in that tropical moisture with that southwest flow. We continue with this pattern as we head into Wednesday. Now Thursday, rain chances are going to drop a little bit because that's when we start to transition with a southeast flow. So showers and storms will most likely go out towards the west. Plus on Friday, we start to get that Sahara and dust. There is Bill racing along over the waters of the Atlantic Ocean and here's a look at the latest advisory as of 11 a.m. It has upgraded a little bit uh, so but it's not a concern for us or in the U.S. And then there's that tropical wave out in the eastern Atlantic Ocean and then one to watch is over the Bay of Campeche as it still has a high chance to develop later on in the week which could bring impacts to the Gulf Coast. A look at the tropics and uh, quite a bit of circled activity out there from the Pacific into the Atlantic. Really one area that we're watching closely. But Dr. Nab, it is kind of interesting to see something uh, that Invest 94L off the coast of Af Africa here in mid-June. Yeah, it is. Uh, but uh, Alex, I promise to erase some of these circles off the map here uh, <laughs> in short order because while that wave that has been leaving Africa has looked impressive at times, uh, the thunderstorms are waning and its chances of development are going way down uh, really fast. Hurricane centers lowered that to 10% over the next five days. And that's because it's going toward a little bit cooler water and drier air and stronger wind shear. Now, it, when it came off the coast, it looked very, very impressive. That's where the waters are really warm out here. But as it moves farther west, it's running into a little bit more stability in the environment and a little bit cooler waters uh, as it moves toward the west and west-northwest. Uh, but it is impressive uh, that the system has looked as, as healthy as it did this early in the season. But uh, upper level winds are going to be on the increase as this moves toward the west along with some dry air. So uh, we'll be watching each one of these waves as they come off every two, three or four days and the formation out there in June and July can happen, especially when you are having uh, above average temperatures in the water and an, an above average hurricane season as we're expecting now. Tropical storm Bill isn't going to be tropical much longer, but it did get up to 60 miles an hour. Uh, its, its max winds are not a whole lot more than its forward speed, 36 miles an hour as it races off to the northeast. It was born in a frontal zone, and it's going to die in one, too. Here's a frontal zone out here, and here's little Bill right there uh, zooming off to the northeast, and it's leaving the Gulf Stream. So it's getting out of the warm waters, and it's getting entangled with the frontal zone. And if you're in Halifax, Nova Scotia, up in here it's passing by to your south very very quickly uh, losing its characteristics so the next advisory from the hurricane center likely to be the next i mean likely to be the last one but they'll be writing their first advisory in the gulf here uh, over the next few days 80 percent chance of development and this is not a small system this is a large sprawling area of low pressure that is likely to focus into a depression and probably a storm in the northern gulf over the next uh, couple of days especially by thursday and friday that's when the time frame is most likely that it would develop. Uh, it's got some upper level high pressure overhead, but it is tangling with land a little bit, uh, especially because we have a broad area of spin like this, and that's why it, we, we expect this to be a large and sprawling depression in the storm when it goes farther north. But it does have a little focused area of spin that we were watching yesterday that has kind of rotated back to the south and west, bringing heavy rain near Veracruz, Mexico. But it will eventually get its act together. See that spin tangling with land, but get to Thursday and the spin is starting to focus a little more as it starts to make its move to the north. There is going to be upper level low pressure that's going to induce some wind shear on it, so it'll probably be lopsided, a bit east loaded uh, when it comes ashore Friday into Saturday somewhere in the northern or northwestern Gulf of Mexico. And then it'll be moving pretty slowly over the south central and southeastern United States over the Appalachians on Monday, and then it's going to follow in Bill's foot steps uh, uh, to see. 
on the way inland and after it makes landfall, increasing risk of rip currents and not just that, but we're going to have possibility of storm surge if it strengthens as much as Cristobal did last year and starting Friday and lasting for multiple days, Alex, a wet Father's Day weekend that could bring more flooding to the southern U.S. Live. The one and only Local 10 News starts right now. Off the top at 11, another day of heavy rain, leaving several streets swamped across South Florida. This was the scene in Miami Beach. And the strong storms toppling this tree over in Lauder Hill, right into a residential building and a possible strike from the sky sparking this fire in Oakland Park. And the rain isn't over yet. We have live team coverage across South Florida. Janine Stanwood is in Lauder Hill and Christian De La Rosa is in Oakland Park. But we begin with our chief certified meteorologist, Betty Davis. And Betty, I guess uh, people can put away the their umbrellas just yet, huh? No, 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 no. Not unless you want to get soaked tomorrow. We do have more showers and storms in the forecast. Satellite and radar imagery is showing more clouds over Broward and Dade as opposed to rainfall, but there are some showers out there starting to make a move back to our area, particularly around South Dade. We'll have to keep an eye on some showers coming in there. For now, though, I've been tracking some activity, hit and miss, little shower activity off mainland Monroe, and then a little shower developing down here, just off Key West near Marquesas Keys, and also this thunderstorm right here drifting on over toward Florida Bay. That may make a run into South Dade. So the bottom line on the forecast for the overnight hours is that we will not rule out a few showers before things ramp back up tomorrow afternoon. Now let's get you the tropical update. It is the first 10 minutes of this newscast. We want to talk about what's happening here. Tropical storm bill, well, that is now a post-tropical system. The National Hurricane Center has written its last advisory on this one. It's just off Nova Scotia, running out toward the northeast, not a concern. And then this area right here, this wave in the far eastern Atlantic, the National Hurricane Center has now dropped the development potential for that one to near zero percent, so we're not even going to worry about it. This other area, though, way down in the southwestern Gulf, this one has a high chance of developing over the next five days, the development potential at 80 percent. So by Thursday, it should start to move a farther north over the Gulf, and as it does so, likely to become a tropical depression. But Luckily, not something South Florida has to worry about. Parts of the Gulf Coast, though, will want to watch this one. Heavy rainmaker, it has the potential for that. Calvin? Okay, tropics heating up. Thanks a lot there, Betty. Our team coverage turns down to Janine Stanwood in Lauder Hill. And she's live with more on the mess left behind by today's wet weather. Janine? A mess and a dangerous situation. Check this out. This giant tree just fell right into this apartment complex. The top part of it getting cut off. Those are the palm fronds on the floor above. This happened after a full day of rain. Into the night, the streets are still wet. The aftermath of a day of pounding rain. Before sunset, Miami Beach roadways south of 5th were underwater. An evening drone video shows this Davie neighborhood east of I-75 absolutely flooded. Oh my God, how did this happen? Earlier in the day, high winds and a soaked ground might have caused this giant palm tree to fall into the walkway at the Brookfield Square condominiums in Lauder Hill, breaking off the fronds on top, sending the trunk into the level below. I was at work and my boys text me and then they call my cell phone. They're like, Mom. A tree fell, a tree fell, and it's really loud. This thing could have been so much worse. This is a massive tree, and take a look. That is a big piece of railing that came down. In what seems like a miracle, no one was walking here at the time, and no one was injured. Relentless rain all day flooded streets. In Fort Lauderdale, this shopping center parking lot was underwater. Drivers had a hard time navigating on I-595, and Cooper City was downright blustery. As for that tree in Lauder Hill, the walkways are blocked off for now, and we're told inspectors will take a closer look at the damage. I've never seen anything like that before. So no individual apartments were damaged. That is the good news. But neighbors are really worried about this. What a mess. What a safety hazard. They're hoping that tomorrow crews will come remove that tree. And of course, the inspection has to begin. The cleanup and the repairs have to begin as well. There's a lot of work ahead. We're in Lauder Hill. I'm Janine Stanwood, Local 10 News. Evidence of a big storm right there behind you. Thanks a lot, Janine. Firefighters rushing to put out flames at an Oakland Park home. And authorities believe a lightning strike may be to blame here. Let's go to Local 10's Christian De La Rosa live now with this part of our team coverage tonight. Christian.
That's right. The woman that lives in this home tells us she heard a large boom. Next thing you know, she was running for her life. Look at the smoke billowing from the home. And the cell phone video showing crews in the middle of their fire fight. Well, I was in my room. Tina Testaverde says she and another man inside barely made it out. Well, I was trying to crawl out and the smoke was... A look from Sky 10 at the home on Northeast 7th Avenue near Cypress Creek Road in Oakland Park, just off of 95. But it was a Fort Lauderdale firefighter first to respond. Rescue 53 was on the way back from a call, happened to be here at the light, looked to the left and saw a fully involved structure fire, which uh, thank goodness they saw that because time is people. The Oakland Park Fire Rescue Chief telling Local 10 News the flames may have been caused by a lightning strike. Uh, we're going to have our fire investigators and the state fire marshal look into that. No human lives were lost, but Testa Verde says her pets did not make it. My cats are dead in there. Mm, it's just an awful day for that woman and the man who lives here. Both of them are displaced tonight, and the Red Cross is stepping in to find them a place to stay. The National Hurricane Center has just issued its first advisory on potential Tropical Cyclone 3. Mike mentioned this could become Tropical Storm Claudette. We've got Tropical Storm warnings up along the Gulf Coast, parts of the Louisiana coastline, and all of the Mississippi and Alabama coastlines. So obviously, you're looking at New Orleans. You are included within that. I want to get straight to Dr. Nab with the very latest. So, Alex, why are they writing advisories on potential tropical cyclone number three? The main reason is so they can issue tropical storm warnings. Back in the day, before this procedure, you wouldn't get the warning right now. You'd have to wait until it actually becomes a tropical depression or storm, which it is not yet. But they're expecting that to be the case. And so we got formation pretty close to land this strategy of using potential tropical cyclone allows them to issue advisories, get the forecast track intensity out there and get those warnings up. So it is a large sprawling sloppy system. It is not a tropical depression or a tropical storm yet. Max winds though at 30 miles an hour and the motion nine miles an hour. See how this all looks, smells and feels just like a tropical depression. That's, that's basically the way we should all treat it. And moving northward toward the US coast, uh, so it's not a really fast mover, but it's not stalled anymore either. So it has started to make its move up to the north. And this is the reason why these advisories are being issued now, so they can get these warnings up. They even had the option to have done this earlier today to put watches up, but they decided to wait to make sure they had the confidence on where to put uh, watches and warnings. They put the tropical storm warning where you see here from Intracoastal City, Louisiana, around through Lake Pontchartrain, uh, Metro New Orleans all the way through the coastal areas of Mississippi and Alabama and it isn't just the Gulf front those warnings go over land for some distance inland as well. Now let's take a look at the forecast track and intensity. Now for potential tropical cyclones it's a little harder to make an accurate track forecast because you don't have a really good beat on where the center is but uh, the global models have a pretty good representation of the system, so the details could vary depending on where the center actually ends up focusing, because we don't have a well-defined center yet. But we do expect it to move northward, and you see by um, afternoon time, a little after lunch tomorrow, it's made its way a little farther north, and by that time, they expect it to be a tropical storm. And then coming ashore somewhere in this time frame, you know, late Friday night into early Saturday, and then moving over the southeastern U.S. and gradually strengthening. You don't see a lot of strength here, but enough to make it a, uh, a tropical storm. Now, the upper level pattern doesn't look very tropical, does it? Look, what, see that spin in the water vapor? That's not the center of the uh, eventual surface low pressure system that will become a tropical storm. This is a middle upper level low up in here, so it's producing a lot of wind shear, making the system lopsided. It will be very right loaded as we've been expecting all along. Here's the broad area of low pressure. Here's the flow on the east side of it. Then all the weather is mostly to the east and north. But you can see, Mike, it does not have a well-defined center. So it's an area of low pressure that we're expecting to get better organized as it moves northward. So without a lot of strengthening, wind is not gonna be as bad as it could be, but the water impacts, we've got to really take those seriously. Don't underestimate this.
We'll say mainly because much of the area will stay dry, but possibly by tomorrow morning, start to see a rain shower coming in. Big area of low pressure watching for development here uh, as this uh, continues to slowly look a little better organized. Uh, this was connected with a trough of low pressure all the way up there in eastern Canada, but those are moving away. Our wet weather pattern breaking down, southeast wind coming in at the surface. So with that, you typically see a few showers passing through the area in the morning. Hour by hour tonight, 11 o'clock all the way to about 5 or 6 o'clock, maybe a pass shower quickly moving with the breeze and we're pretty dry tomorrow. A few showers may develop possibly a thunderstorm, but they get pushed up towards the Gulf Coast. Drier air coming in by Saturday, so we'll see sunshine, a little haze with Saharan dust in the air, but very little rain on Saturday. Sunday, we'll see a few more showers increasing, and by then, this tropical disturbance bringing some flooding rain here to the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, all the way to the Panhandle of Florida. The next five days, specifically, it'll come down in a pretty short period of time, five to maybe six inches of rain, but our rain showers get pushed up to the north. Some areas just pretty dry right off the coast. Clusters of showers and storms to the eastern side of this area of low pressure. New information coming in. Still potential tropical cyclone, not a depression yet, but it could make impact to land in within 48 hours. So they issue these products. There's the tropical storm warnings, and it looks like it could be possibly tropical storm Claudette impacting the Gulf Coast sometime tomorrow night to early Saturday. All right, we're tracking the tropics here with our developing system in the Gulf of Mexico and not quite a uh, tropical storm or tropical depression yet but anticipating that it will become one. So now it's a potential tropical cyclone. Uh, Hurricane hunters were out here uh, earlier or late last night, however you want to call it, and it didn't fight really find it too organized. The center's way over here, but could be reforming underneath that. If it does, uh, then we could be getting a, a name storm here. It is expected to become a name storm. Claude, that's the next name, and it will make landfall Louisiana coastline. Very uh, right-sided storm here with all the weather basically to the right, and that's where all the rain will be and the heavy rains from, say, New Orleans all the way to the Panhandle. Concerns growing along the Gulf Coast as potential tropical cyclone three is inching closer to the Gulf Coast here. Biloxi, Mississippi, Destin, Florida, just two cities under our first tropical storm warning of the season. Yeah, conditions in both places will continue to deteriorate as we go throughout the day. That means heavy rainfall, tropical storm force winds are expected, and it doesn't stop there. These impacts will be felt well inland as well. You saw how rough that water is there in Florida, and you can see that the roads already wet in Mississippi. Welcome back in to America's Morning Headquarters. I'm meteorologist Stephanie Abrams alongside meteorologist Kelly Cass, storm specialist Dr. Greg Postel, and we also have uh, Reynolds Wolf joining us live in New Orleans this morning. We're going to get you right now caught up on what we know this hour. Governor, Louisiana Governor, I should say, John Bell Edwards, has issued a state of emergency that cuts some of the red tape to help get exactly. supplies going. Yeah, in fact, in New Orleans, the city has activated a, their emergency operations center to monitor and prepare for potential impacts from this system. And 90,000 sandbags have been delivered to coastal residents in the state of Mississippi. Because, Steph, I think flooding really is going to be the main calling card when it comes to this it system. It is. So let's talk to Dr. Postel about that because Dr. Postel, everyone obsesses over the cone. It's hurricane season, <laughs> and we have to emphasize that this is actually a pretty widespread system, and we will see impacts outside of that cone. Yeah, it's a big one, that we are going to have lots of impacts outside of the cone, so don't focus on that with this particular one. But we will be dealing with, I think, rain moving into the, uh, let's say, Florida Gulf Coast, Mississippi, Alabama, even Louisiana, in the next few hours. That's really kind of what we're dealing with. The impacts will begin shortly, and we will continue to see them probably get worse, the weather, through the evening hours along, let's say, areas from New Orleans through about Tallahassee. There's the main area of thunderstorm activity. And if you, you don't need to know anything about meteorology to know that there's more storms now than there were like six hours ago. So perhaps it's trying to get its act together a little bit. And I have a feeling it will become our next name storm, which would be Claudette. And we have tropical storm warnings out in place across parts of Louisiana all the way through the northern Gulf Coast. Where is this system, whatever it ends up being, where is it going? Well, the center of it is probably going to be going somewhere inside of that cone. But most of the nastiest weather will be along into the east and south of that zone. Latest satellite picture shows sort of a lot of thunderstorm activity now starting to bubble up near where the area of low pressure is which is probably, it's hard to tell from here, but probably somewhere about there. So we're not dealing with a situation that's going to 
get out of hand very quickly. In other words, this is not likely to strengthen in, into a hurricane. It doesn't matter. We're going to get a lot of rain. You can already see that here. A lot of thunderstorm and heavy rain out here as well. So there is a ton of impacts for many of us to contend with way outside of the cone. And this is going to be one of those situations, Steph, where we're going to see the rain and the wind, at least somewhat, but mostly the rain, increase during the late morning and early afternoon hours along the northern Gulf Coast. Well, it's a free street cleaning day in the Big Easy. New Orleans, Louisiana already starting to get some of the outer bands of our tropical system heading north through the Gulf of Mexico. Much heavier rain, though, expected for the central Gulf Coast over the next 48 hours. In addition to storm surge of strong winds and a few isolated tornadoes. That's right. We are going to be looking at quite a bit of water headed towards the Gulf over the next few days, kind of just the appetizer to what's to come tomorrow in New Orleans there. Thanks so much for joining us here on Weather Nation. I'm meteorologist Lucy Bergman. That's meteorologist, ooh, reverse. Yeah. That's meteorologist <laughs> Rob Bradley. It's always tough in the side boxes, yeah. Uh, we are tracking, uh, Delor uh, excuse me, we're tracking our tropical area of low pressure right now. Dolores is the tropical storm in the other area. So Lucy, I'll let you take over. Yeah, we have uh, quite a bit going on. So this is our area of low pressure in the Gulf. It continues to track to the north. We are looking at some Hurricane Hunter reconnaissance mission to give us a bit more information on this storm from the center of it itself. But regardless of if this storm uh, intensifies any further or stays where it's at. What we're going to see is pretty much just the same. The only difference will be in the wind speed. Regardless, heavy rain anticipated across portions of the Gulf, and that will begin. It's already begun today, but only get more intense as we head into the nighttime hours. We're going to continue to see that track bring us inland here, and then the storm should weaken as it moves uh, farther into the Gulf states and more into the deep south. We'll be seeing, though, the concern for gusts up to around 35 miles an hour across portions of Louisiana, coastal Mississippi, and into portions of Alabama. We do have a tropical storm warning, which means those strong winds are anticipated. Now's the time to kind of wrap everything up outdoors that you may have so that you don't run into any of those problems. And if you live along the coast south of I-10, you need to be aware of the storm surge potential. It's not huge, up to three feet in some locations around New Orleans, but enough that it will cause some damage. If this storm continues on a track, it'll be Claudette and we'll continue to keep you updated. Of course, the peak of tropical cyclone uh, is usually in September. So we're off to a solid start here this year. Meanwhile, in the eastern Pacific, as Rob was mentioning, we have tropical storm Dolores as it continues to churn right off the coast of Mexico. And our track here is going to continue to strengthen this as it moves north uh, with areas right along the western shores of Mexico uh, impacted farther to the coastline from Guadalajara and then up into uh, areas closer to the Baja by Tuesday morning. Landfall could happen as soon as tomorrow morning. Already, Louisiana's governor has declared a state of emergency as those rain bands are starting to hit the Gulf Coast states. First warning meteorologist Vanessa Vanette has the very latest advisory this afternoon. And good morning, Aaron and Tiffany. So, so far we do have potential tropical cyclone number three over the Gulf of Mexico that will eventually track towards the north and heading towards Louisiana later tonight and into tomorrow morning. So basically it's not that well organized, but it will likely become a tropical storm. That's a possibility later tonight and into tomorrow morning. So right now the latest advisory as of the 11 o'clock advisory has sustained winds of 35 miles per hour, moving pretty quickly towards the north and northeast about 14 miles per hour. It will be making landfall near New Orleans tomorrow morning between 1 and 4 o'clock in the morning, then tracking towards the northeast and then it will dissipate by Saturday night and into Sunday morning. So we say goodbye to the storm and the next name on the list will be Claudette. And of course, we'll keep you posted throughout the afternoon hours. Meanwhile, here it is very cloudy out there and we're going to keep those clouds all day on your Friday and rain chances will be pretty low today and tomorrow. I'll have more details on your weekend forecast coming up in about 15 minutes. All right, if you're just joining us right now, we still don't have a tropical storm on our hands, but it may get confusing because there has been some up 
upgrade to the wind. So there's been an increase in the winds here with potential tropical cyclone three. The latest advisory as of 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Obviously, there's been observation to support that. So winds have now made it to tropical storm force, yet there's still no organized area of low pressure. So, um, you know, tropical storm warning, I think, is fair in this case, and that's why they deemed it a potential tropical cyclone so that they can go ahead and issue the warnings just in case this were to become a tropical storm. But it's running out of time. I mean, it's a Approaching the coast of Louisiana here probably in the next six to eight hours. Um, it's a quick mover and you can see the rain now really starting to get close to New Orleans and already pushing into southern Louisiana. All right, so there's a look at the path again. Winds likely going to be subtropical storm force, maybe around 40 miles per hour. There will be some thunderstorms though that could be severe and I think that's where you may get up to 50 mile per hour gusts in those in those individual thunderstorms. But aside from that, this is a rain event and flash flood concerns will be our most concerning threat. Molly. It is time now for our tropical update and we are watching a system in the Gulf. So let's get right to local tense hurricane specialist Brian Norcraft here with more of that. Brian. All right, Louis, uh, this is uh, kind of one of those nasty systems because it won't come together like we would like it to. So it has normal names. So it has this funny name associated with it. It's still called potential tropical cyclone three, uh, which just means that it doesn't have a circulation. It just has the bad weather. And of course, it's the bad weather that causes the problem. So that's what we'll concentrate on. Winds 45 miles per hour, but they're not anywhere near the center. They were way outside of the center. So this is another one of those lessons that you don't track the center all the time. You just uh, uh, worry about where the weather is actually bad. All right, let's take a look at it a little close up here. And you can see where the model analyzes this broad center right in here. There's actually kind of two centers, and it's a real long, stretched out thing. It may never actually come together before the center gets up over the land. But the main thing is the weather, the bad weather, is already moving in. You see this line here? See the line where that red is in there? That's where the strongest winds are. And the when the analysis from the satellite of the strongest winds came in, it was well displaced from the center, so moving into Mississippi or Alabama, something like that. So nothing like uh, in the New Orleans area. New Orleans, even though the track looks like it's going to be right over or very near the city there, that's uh, not likely to be where the worst weather with this system is going to be. It's more likely to be over in here somewhere as this all these thunderstorms out in here. You see the bright uh, the cloud tops there as the sun is going down. That's where really strong storms are, and they're heading toward the Florida Panhandle. So it's a really sloppy, uh, messy system. And then it's going to move on up here into the southeast and drag all that moisture over the southeast. So significant flooding is possible, some places up to a foot of rain, widespread four to eight inches across the south. Across the Atlantic, there is a lot of Saharan dust. Well, the good thing about the Saharan dust is it keeps things under control out there, so we're not going to have any kind of tropical development. The bad thing about it is it makes a murky day like we have outside here right now, and it's going to come in our direction in surges. So this will let up eventually, but we have more dust uh, in our forecast. We have a brand new intermediate public advisory in from the National Hurricane Center on what is still designated potential tropical cyclone three. But they do say in the advisory that it is still likely to become a tropical or subtropical storm before the center of the low comes ashore later tonight, either very late tonight or maybe right after midnight. But midnight plus or minus. Uh, they're expected to be a tropical storm or a subtropical storm before it makes landfall. But in many ways, it doesn't matter at this point except for what goes in the history books. Is it Tropical Storm or Subtropical Storm Claudette, or is it forever known as PTC3? In any event, the impacts are going to be the same. The warnings have been up uh, for tropical storm conditions since yesterday, and we are, have already seen tropical storm conditions. And there's where the center of the low is uh, probably going to go. And again, that forecast point from the 4 p.m. Central Time Advisory is valid at 1 a.m., Central time, so you back that up, you know, it's midnight ish when the center might cross the coastline. And then over the weekend, it will be moving across the southeastern US, and a lot of you 
not just inside, but outside the cone, and a lot of you not just at the coast, but inland as well, are going to experience a lot of wind and water impacts. Tropical storm warning area has not changed on this intermediate advisory. It's possible that some, some part of this might change at 10 p.m. Central Time on the next full advisory, but for now, uh, that warning is still up for Morgan City, Louisiana, all the way over to the Destin Fort Walton Beach area. We've had a number of reports of tropical storm force winds even sustained in southeastern Louisiana and near the coast of Mississippi and even over the causeway uh, in the New Orleans area. So uh, that's what it looks like on visible imagery from the from the big picture. And you see how lopsided it is and it forever will be because there's the center of circulation and then all of the weather is on the east side because of the wind shear in the atmosphere. You do see some outflow on this side, but for the most part, it's getting sheared from the west, and that's because of an upper level low. That's the non-tropical part that makes it even possible they would call this a subtropical storm. But in any event, it's really interesting when you get to the lower sun angle, how you can really see those overshooting tops right in here and in here and in here. That's where the really strong convection is, a lot of lightning in those areas. But again, you can tell how much better defined the center of circulation is than it was yesterday. So this is really, really close to being a tropical storm. If it never becomes a tropical storm, we can always say, well, it was darn close. But in any event, the heavy rainfall off to the north and east is affecting increasingly populated areas, not just heavy rain, but occasional lightning and some strong winds. And flash flooding is the biggest concern. Overnight tonight, this could be a life-threatening hazard if people get out on the roads, especially after dark and in driving tropical storm conditions. Look at the training rain bands that are going to be on the east side on the coastal areas of Mississippi, uh, at least through the early morning hours, Alabama area, Mobile, getting up into Montgomery tomorrow morning, and then the Florida Panhandle will get in on it. It'll be a bad beach day, might keep people out of the rip currents anyway, and then uh, afternoon and evening uh, continuing into Georgia where the flash flood risk will continue up into Birmingham and Atlanta tomorrow through Sunday morning and then into the Carolinas uh, Sunday night into Monday. The new advisory is in this area of disturbed weather in the Gulf staying steady as the drenching rains continue to come ashore. Meanwhile, much of the bayou feeling the system's outer bands. This is uh, New Orleans, the French Quarter, the heart of it, where people are dealing with, at this point, hit or miss showers. Nothing of a serious variety there at this point in time. Looks different over here in our neck of the woods. This is a live look at downtown Miami as South Florida prepares for a hot and hazy holiday weekend. Hello and welcome everyone. We begin with that disturbance in the Gulf. The system packing tropical storm force winds. It's not classified at this point as a storm though. Chief Meteorologist Phil Farrow is here to explain all this for us. Phil. Yes, this is indeed a very interesting system here in the Gulf of Mexico. 11 p.m. advisory, the center, 60 miles south southeast of Morgan City, Louisiana. Moving north at 13, 45 mile per hour winds. Again, that's strong enough to be categorized as a tropical storm, but it is not, and I'll show you why in just a moment. Notice, by the way, that most of the cloudiness is away to the east of the center of circulation and actually moving away from New Orleans. While the center might go right over New Orleans, most of the impacts will be away from that, moving in across uh, the coastal Mississippi, Alabama, and even the panhandle over the next uh, 12 to 24 hours. 35 mile per hour winds Saturday evening, uh, moving in between Mississippi and Alabama. There is a tropical storm warning in place from Morgan City uh, through New Orleans, Mobile, and Fort Walton Beach for the possibility of some gusty winds to 40 to 45 miles per hour. Right now, the wind speeds are uh, getting up there, especially by the buoy sites. We have 43, 47 mile per hour wind gusts, and that will continue to be the norm overnight. Heavy rain just to the east of New Orleans, uh, Lake Pontchartrain, seeing some heavy rain. Uh, some more starting to move in across I-10. That'll be the, uh, uh, the norm at least over the next 6 to 12 hours. The big issue with the system will be the rain to the east. Once again, to the east of the center of circulation, 6 to 7 to 8 inches of rain possible through Panama City Beach. This is the reason why it is not a tropical storm. The center of circulation is exposed on the western side. A lot of dry air uh, moving in, and that is keeping it 
from getting any stronger. We'll have a lot more on this a little bit later on in weather. Well, Phil, this is the first major system to affect potentially the Gulf region. So some people spent some time getting uh, prepared just in case. They are going to see a good deal of rain. My team coverage continues with Jeff Lennox and that, Jeff. Well, that's right, Craig. And right now, around 7 million people are bracing for impact from what may develop into the first tropical storm to make landfall this year along the Louisiana coast. On Friday night, it's normally packed along Bourbon Street in New Orleans, but instead of crowds of people, rain moving in and more is in store this weekend. The system is expected to drop up to eight inches across portions of the Gulf Coast. The sandbags are filling up and piling up, people getting ready for stormy weather. I loaded up a bunch of sand and uh, I'm going to put them around my pins, that way my dogs not there being knee high of water, you know. Millions of people from Louisiana to Florida are under tropical storm warnings, bracing for a direct hit from a system that's forecast to strengthen into the first tropical storm of the season. In Louisiana, a state struck by four hurricanes in 2020, they're starting off this hurricane season right where they left off last year's in the direct path of another tropical system. We can expect all of South Louisiana to be impacted. The range of rainfall will be somewhere between one inch and eight inches. Uh, right now, the expectation is that the eastern side of the storm uh, will have the most significant impact. Now as the storm brews and barrels toward the coast, those potentially in its path wait and hope for the best. I hope that's all we get is rain. No, no bad stuff with it. Just hang in. That's all I can say. It is what it is. Louisiana is already under a state of emergency over flooding concerns from recent rain in the region. Live in the Plex, Jeff Lennox, 7 News 19. Welcome back to the Weather Channel. Hope you're having a great Friday night. We are watching a tropical system in the Gulf of Mexico that has not actually been designated as a tropical depression or a tropical storm because it is so disorganized. You can kind of make out a low level center right in there. You can see a little bit of spin showing up right in there, but all of the weather has been displaced off to the north and east because there are very strong winds that are coming right over the top of this thing so it's being sheared really thoroughly right now and that's good that worked out for us because without that wind shear being in place with this thing sitting over the gulf for a few days having plenty of time to cook we could be talking about an entirely different situation if the upper atmosphere had been favorable we might be looking at a hurricane coming into the northern gulf coast tonight so that's the good part about what's happened the bad part is even though it's a weaker and more disorganized storm, it's still going to bring a terrific amount of rain into the Gulf Coast and then farther inland up into Alabama and also into North Georgia. That's happening right now. And in fact, the Weather Prediction Center just upped their forecast for flash flooding. So they've added this very likely area for flash flooding, uh, rainfall rates of two to three inches per hour, likely in the Mississippi and Alabama Gulf Coast, and then also maybe as much as 10 inches of rain by the time it's all said and done. I mean, it's really coming down tonight. You can see that very clearly now in southeast Louisiana and southern Mississippi. And there is a flash flood warning in effect for St. Tammany Parish, Hancock and Harrison counties, where you're getting rainfall rates right now of one and a half to two and a half inches per hour. And we'll probably see about three to six inches by the time it's all said and done. So you're talking about just a terrific amount of rainfall and it's starting to step up now in Mississippi and also in, Louis in uh, Alabama. So that is what is coming for that I-10 corridor right in there. And it's going to go on like that for a long, long time. It's going to rain for a lot of the night along the Mississippi Gulf Coast and then much of the morning farther eastward into Alabama. There's the model forecast, 1 o'clock in the morning. That is tremendously heavy rain coming up into Mississippi and Alabama. And then we'll go into 3 o'clock in the morning. It's more of the same, really has not changed much. It has shifted a little farther to the east, but just barely. And then we'll go into 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. And finally, it does begin to move on. But that's many, many hours 
and with rainfall rates of one to two to three inches per hour. So that's why we're so concerned about flash flooding. Then we're going to see heavy rain coming up into Montgomery. Could be some flash flooding there. We're also going to see it coming up into Atlanta, into Birmingham. Could be heavy rain there. I mean, by the time you get up here in North Georgia, there's a lot of terrain there. So it takes less rain to cause big problems. So there certainly could be flash flooding there as well. And there could be some very gusty wind in Atlanta by late tomorrow. Late tomorrow night, maybe 40 or even 50 miles per hour. And then beyond that, into Sunday morning, the storm really does begin to stretch out and sort of thin out. It's not nearly the same storm. There will be some gusty wind, some thunderstorms, but things will be improving most likely on Sunday. But again, this is going to be affecting millions of people. And as the crow flies or the albatross flies over in places like Gulfport, uh, they are getting plenty of rainfall and flooding is occurring and that unfortunately is going to continue. Let's go right into it and show you our, our tower cam here in the Big Easy of New Orleans where last night between the hours of six and nine, we had some of the heaviest rainfall that came on through. We had at the same time with that wind, pushing a lot of that water across the northern end of places like Lake Pontchartrain. So we have the flooding this morning that stories of rising water persist for much of the region. Biloxi and Mobile, you see those spots there again. Uh, one of the big fears that we have this morning is with the winds coming through much stronger near that center of circulation, even points east, we could see some toppled trees and with it some power outages. Please use extreme caution to driving out and about because with poor visibility, and rising water it is a terrible mix. To radar we go, and it really does tell the story. This has always been, since day one, a very lopsided system, but still has a pretty strong right hook. Think of it being like a, a heavyweight boxer. Now you see in Biloxi and Points East, heavy rainfall. And if you look south of Biloxi, you see that orange and yellow line. That is a lot of moisture that's going to chug its way on through. I am thinking Bayou La Battery, let's see, LaFleur, Mobile, all being affected. Hattiesburg, you've got plenty of rainfall. Notice also the polygons that are popping up across much of the, uh, let's see, south southeastern Mississippi. That's where we're going to see it. And still, Kelly, four winds of 45 miles an hour. And it's a relatively quick mover, Kelly, with uh, winds, let's see, going north, northeast at 12. Hard to believe this thing way down in the Gulf will be affecting spots like uh, eventually uh, Atlanta, perhaps Birmingham and beyond over the next several hours and days. Kelly, let's send it back to you. And, and we are hoping for dry weather, right? So we are getting that once again today. However, you'll notice it's very hazy out there, kind of hard to see far out. So this is actually causing some low visibilities, especially in higher altitude. But nonetheless, it's still a nice day. Now it's very warm. Temperatures getting a head start, ready heating up and close to the mid 80s at this hour. And before you know it, we're going to be hitting a high of 90. Now the clouds should try to break apart, but overall we're still going to have that hazy sunshine and filter sunshine because of the cloud cover. Now let's talk about tropical storm Claudette because Claudette is still bringing the threat of tornadoes into areas of the West Panhandle. You see that most of the rain is on the east side of the center of Claudette, so it's a lopsided storm. Now for us, we're not expecting the rain here, but here's a look at the latest advisory. I do want to mention tropical storm Claudette actually formed early this morning and it is producing maximum sustained winds at 45 miles per hour. It will race across the southeast and out into the Atlantic. Tropical storm warnings are still stretching along the northern Gulf Coast. Back to you, Kate. Very strong winds over 80 miles per hour in some of the thunderstorms on the distant edge of tropical storm Claudette very early this morning. Right now, 40 miles per hour in the wind speed. This is the latest advisory. It is well inland now, 75 miles north, northeast of New Orleans, Louisiana. In southern Mississippi is about where the low level center is, but notice the bad weather, and we've been talking about this all along, has been on the right or east side of the circulation center at low levels, and that continues to be the case. But Justin was talking about that 81 mile per hour wind report in Pensacola. That was, again, with a line of thunderstorms that moved through. Other areas nearby also reported those 50 to 60 mile per hour winds, well removed from kind of that circulation swirl around Claudette, but kind of on the edge of it with those thunderstorms. And that has been the case. And so we've had very significant impacts, even though perhaps the center of circulation, not all that impressive uh, on tropical storm standards. Rainfall estimates in the last 24 hours. We talked about east side loaded. We'll have a picture of this. Look at all the heavy rain that has fallen. And there's the track of the center of Claudette. So there's the track, right? And all the heavy rain, most of it, has been loaded on the right or east side of this thing. And that's going to continue to be the case. So when you look at the cone, 
Think about that. We're going to have a lot of bad weather outside of the cone and on the south and east side of where this thing ends up going. Notice, though, that by Monday morning, we may pick up the intensity a little bit as it approaches the North Carolina coast, and that may happen actually inland a little bit with some help from an incoming upper trough and some other factors. So we may get some intensification here Monday morning, and that is why we have tropical storm watches out for parts of North Carolina, including areas from Nags Head, Hatteras, down through Cape Fear. This is what overall the circulation looks like. Again, the weather really not so bad near the circulation center. Some clouds and some breezes, that's it. Heavy rain and thunderstorms rolling through parts of the western Panhandle, Florida. This is where the action is now. Severe thunderstorm warning out for Santa Rosa County. Wind gusts over 50 miles per hour likely and a lot of heavy rain, Jen, and cloud to ground lightning as well tropical storm band coming off Claudette. These are very common to get isolated tornadoes. Unfortunately, this one appeared to be on the slightly stronger side based on some of the apparent damage to homes. And this happened again right around 735 to 745 local time. The update just now coming in from the National Hurricane Center showing that tropical storm Claudette has now transitioned into a tropical depression. I like to use that word transition because while it technically has weakened by five miles an hour, the storm is still producing some hazardous and dangerous weather. First alert meteorologist Ryan Phillips is back with a look at what is left of Claudette. Well guys still going uh, tonight as a tropical depression, but uh, boy, a tremendous amount of rain associated with this system as it's lifting across Alabama tonight, but the rain shield wrapping around into northern Georgia and the Carolinas. This will continue to uh, lift off to the north and to the east, keeping a severe weather threat in play and also a tremendous amount of rainfall as it exits stage right here across the Carolinas. Let's talk about it again, picking up a name first thing this morning, uh, tropical depression Claudette now with 30 mile per hour winds, but the system's not finished yet. Moving off to the northeast at 14, it will accelerate into the Carolinas and right now forecast to again become a tropical storm. So tropical storm watches are, at, are uh, excuse me, in effect and they're up now for eastern Carolina here, eastern North Carolina, likely to become warnings tomorrow. Then the system moves into the western Atlantic away from the U.S. Let's talk about Claudette and where it's going to go with uh, Dr. Postel and Dr. Postel. The storms I was just showing in the Midwest, they actually are what's pushing Claudette uh, off the East Coast eventually. Yeah, that's right. It's getting a little kick from the jet stream and all the winds aloft associated with that. And it will bring the weather that it's brought for many of us the last couple of days forward to parts of, let's say, southeastern Georgia, southern South Carolina and North Carolina as well. There's a center of circulation. It's actually right about over the weather channel. Pressure is about 10, 10 millibars, so not really that low. The winds are not strong. Heavy rain, as Steph was mentioning, is kind of circulating around it in a distant way from the center of circulation. Going back over the last couple days, this is important because we want to know what might happen in the future. Sometimes it's instructive to look backward and the most of the rain was along and to the right of the track when we got some radar estimates of almost seven inches in southern Georgia, 10 plus inches in southern Mississippi, and a whole lot of rain near nine to 10 inches in northern Alabama as well. But the vast majority of it south and east of the center of circulation. Same thing with the severe weather reports over the last 24 to 48 hours we've seen reports of wind and tornadoes those red dots there south of that track going forward there's the future track suggesting that the severe weather chances are increased today across parts of georgia south carolina and north carolina in that area where we've got torcons of three so there is a chance of a couple of tornadoes today albeit not a super high chance, but we need to track what's left of Tropical Depression Claudette and its movement to get an idea of where the weather's gonna be this afternoon. There's the cone, okay, we still got the cone, but interestingly enough, notice that the intensity actually comes up as it moves over land. What's up with that? I think it's what Steph was talking about. There's a little bit of a kick from the winds aloft in the jet stream, helping to lower the pressures a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit uh, over, let's say, South Carolina this evening. Heads up, we could see severe weather with the possibility of tornadoes, a couple of them, in South Carolina and eastern North Carolina. It is by tomorrow morning that we may see this thing strengthen again to a tropical storm before it crosses the coast and then moves offshore and strengthens even more, thankfully, moving away from the U.S. Happy Father's Day.
All right, so I want to show you some footage from Claudette. This has been coming out of uh, the South. I'm talking Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, where they've had some bad bands have moved through and also around Navarre Beach, uh, which is just east of Pensacola. That's where they had 80 mile per hour wind gusts and some of the worst of the bands. Let me show you what we have now with Claudette. It is a tropical depression, winds at 30. There's the Navarre Beach. That's the 80 mile per hour wind gust. Uh, it's a tropical depression, winds to 30 miles per hour, but it's inching closer to the Carolina coastline and it's forecast to strengthen back into a tropical storm later tonight or tomorrow. That's why we have tropical storm warnings in the yellow shade near the Carolina coastline. After that, it moves out into the Atlantic, moves away from land, and it's the only thing that we're tracking. No other development is expected through this week. Larry Nancinella. Muy buenas noches, amigos de Telemundo 51. Y comienza el segmento del tiempo hablando del trópico con el último informe del Centro Nacional de Huracanes emitido sobre Claudette, que sigue siendo una depresión tropical un poco más fuerte en estos momentos, con vientos máximos sostenidos de 35 millas por hora. En este informe, el centro del sistema se estimaba aproximadamente a unas 65 millas al nordeste de Colombia, en Carolina del Sur, y mantiene un movimiento al este nordeste rápido a 20 millas por hora. Como pueden ver, mañana pudiera convertirse otra vez en tormenta tropical mientras se mueve sobre Carolina del Norte, por eso se mantienen ese aviso y esa vigilancia de tormenta tropical respectivamente para Carolina del Norte y Carolina del Sur y como pueden ver seguiría luego moviéndose sobre aguas del Atlántico, incluso todavía el día martes seguiría siendo una tormenta tropical y ya a mitad de semana mientras se acerca a Canadá estaría perdiendo esas características de sistema tropical. Similar like yesterday and then tomorrow we will do it all over again with typical rainy season and chances and summer like conditions. So as of 5 a.m. Claudette has regained tropical storm status and this is very unusual happening over land still keeping tropical characteristics. Sustained winds at 40 miles per hour. It is located 65 miles east southeast of Raleigh, North Carolina. It's going to exit later today into the Gulf Stream and then eventually weaken as it reaches the Canadian Maritime. So hopefully we'll say goodbye to it by tomorrow. There are tropical storm warnings in effect from Wilmington through the Outer Banks and all the way to Elizabeth City. And now we're following another tropical wave located in the Atlantic Ocean. This one's located about a thousand miles west of the Windward Islands. It only has a small window of opportunity to develop before it reaches a wall of dry air and some harsh winds. Right now, the Hurricane Center giving it a low chance to develop. It will be very wet and soggy and saturated, frequent lightning across the southeast for the kids that are still in school. Maybe the recess will be indoors today. Oh, for sure. And you know, camps and everything else, everyone's yeah. dealing with that. Now, I want to take you back down to where we are with Claudette. This, this takes you back to Friday. And when we saw it make landfall, it was early Saturday morning. Actually became a tropical storm when it was over the marshy land down here across southern Louisiana. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen sometimes over land where you get that upgrade. But then we saw it as a tropical storm move through Alabama. This was really heavy rainfall. We had more than nine inches up around Fort Payne, Tuscaloosa coming in with six or seven inches of rain tracked right over the Atlanta Metro right through South Carolina, North Carolina, and now is offshore again over the Atlantic could strengthen a little bit more right now. Winds at 40 miles per hour may go up to about 45 over the Gulf Stream, but then accelerating very fast here and continuing to move away from land. So not expecting much more impacts directly here. Now we're also going to be watching. I think just a little bit of rain left around Norfolk this morning, Virginia beach but that's about it so a moisture filled tropical air mass in place uh, how could it not be we had our first real taste of tropical weather across the south into the mid-atlantic as tropical storm claudette moved through the southeast this weekend it brought squally weather extreme rainfall even an ef2 tornado into alabama these are the kinds of risks that we talk about with all tropical systems dr nab even the disorganized early season tropical systems like this one yeah, and sometimes these disorganized tropical storms can be a really big head fake. People discount or underestimate how damaging and deadly they can be. Fortunately, Claudette is on the way out off the East Coast and will be non-tropical uh, by tomorrow or the next day. So we will be able to say goodbye to it. But it was something we saw coming a week or two in advance and 
uh, it really ended up delivering in terms of impacts. On Friday, it was trying to become a tropical storm pretty close to the northern Gulf Coast. In fact, on Friday afternoon, looking at this visible imagery from the big picture, I thought, wow, that has that look of a tropical storm. And even zooming in based on satellite, looked like, oh, that probably has a well-defined center. Maybe they'll start advisories, but the Hurricane Center had the recon out there at the time. They thought it was too elongated, so it wasn't declared a tropical storm because it didn't have a, a well-defined center in their estimation at that time. But then you can see on the infrared overnight, the center of circulation was up in here, and you can see a little bit of spin in there. That's when they declared it a uh, tropical storm. But they'll have to do a, a post-event analysis to see exactly when they think uh, it became a tropical storm. So in all, for all intents and purposes, it was a tropical storm landfall uh, in Louisiana, if not yet officially. Then, after the center came ashore, Saturday was a really, really bad day. After the really heavy rains in southern Mississippi overnight, then we had that squall line go east, and that's where we had the tornado north of uh, Pensacola in southwestern Alabama. Then we had the tree fall here in the Tuscaloosa area that killed two people, a tree fell on their home. Near Montgomery is where that horrible accident occurred, and in northeastern Alabama is where the flood fatality uh, in the Fort Payne area occurred. So it was a bad Saturday in Alabama, depression went over Georgia, and then when it got into eastern North Carolina, it became a tropical storm again when the winds picked up over water, and then uh, that was this morning, and now it's back out over the Atlantic. And we had wind gusts up to 60, 70, 80 miles an hour in the severe weather, essentially, that was on the east side. Um, so it delivered in terms of some wind and the water. We anticipated up to a foot of rainfall locally and near the Gulf Coast of Mississippi and Alabama, we got just that. And you might be thinking with the tropical storm departing, things would be clearing out. But no, it's in the warm sector of this juicy air mass that remains in place. So it's hard to say it, but we still have flash flood warnings right now in New Orleans and Slidell who had too much rain on Friday and Saturday. So Alex, so we can't seem to get the atmosphere to clear no. out this time of year. No, downpours Friday, downpours Saturday, still downpours. Slidette carving out a trail of destruction in the south. Aerial views show the vast damage left behind in Alabama for more tornadoes spawned by the storm. Claudette is the first storm to make landfall this Atlantic hurricane season. Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis is here with where the storm is now and what else we're tracking in the tropics. Betty. Good evening. Well, Claudette, as of the 11 p.m. advisory, is now mere remnants and it is still pulling farther and farther away from the east coast of the U.S. So this is the last public advisory that the National Hurricane Center is writing on Claudette and our attention now shifts to this tropical tropical wave way down over the eastern waters of the Atlantic and it's a several hundred miles east southeast of the Windward Islands moving toward the west northwest over the next couple days it may try to show some signs of organizing it has a 30 percent chance of development not expect it to be a strong system as it gets closer to these far eastern islands and in fact by Thursday it should run into some hostile territory so the development potential won't be great as we move later on in the week, but we'll keep an eye on it. Nothing out there for us to be concerned about at this point. Louis. This morning, the cleanup is underway in parts of Illinois after a tornado left a trail of destruction there. Dozens of homes left in pieces in a matter of seconds. CBS 4's Elise Preston reports. A massive cleanup is underway after a tornado touched down in two suburban Chicago communities late Sunday night. It was 20 seconds of just being really scared and everybody just kind of huddling in the smallest space possible. This house had its roof and some of the walls completely torn off. It is one of more than 100 homes that suffered damage in Woodridge in Naperville, Illinois, about 25 miles west of Chicago. This has been a uh, tragic day, certainly for Naperville and for the residents of this community, but it could have been a lot worse. The storm destroyed the second floor of Bridget Casey's Woodridge home. My whole goal was to make sure my kids were safe, so that's all that mattered to me. The National Weather Service also confirmed a tornado touchdown in St. Joseph County. County, Indiana. The house just started just shaking. On the East Coast, Claudette regained tropical storm strength as it pummeled North Carolina Monday on its way out to sea. Over the weekend, the storm was blamed for a multi-vehicle crash that killed 10 people near Greenville, Alabama. The grief is uh, 
more than I can put into words. Eight of the victims were children from the Tallapoosa County Girls Ranch, a nonprofit that provides a home for neglected or abused children. They were returning from a week at the beach. It's a tragedy for Alabama, and, and it's, a, it's a national tragedy when you lose this many children. Ranch director Candace Scully was driving the van and is the only survivor. At least two of the young victims in this accident were related to her. Federal investigators are on the scene of the crash looking into the cause. Elise Preston, CBS News. Just so sad and especially frightening moments for people in that area. Incredible images coming out of there. Yeah, yeah. it's unbelievable. Here's a set. And there's still a threat for more severe weather, unfortunately, today. As we look at the map, you'll see how active it is. And I was just telling Keith and Francis that my sister and her family live just in the southern suburbs of Chicago to the south and east of where that tornado touched down. So as soon as I heard about the tornado in Chicago, I was very worried. And obviously, when you see the devastation and the destruction caused by the tornado, in those areas that were hit. Oh, it is just heartbreaking. And also, of course, the accident that was just mentioned. So right now there is some stormy weather stretching from the southern plains across the southeast, even parts of North Florida, up and down the Atlantic coast, as well as in the Pacific Northwest, where there is a marginal risk of severe weather there, as well as parts of New Mexico and Colorado. And there is a slight risk, a higher risk of severe weather for Iowa and Nebraska and portions of the northern and central plains, as well as along the Florida Panhandle and up through parts of the Carolinas Mid-Atlantic. Here's a look at the final advisory, which was issued for the remnants of Claudette, which continues to race away from the U.S. coast. It's moving to the east-northeast, close to 30 miles an hour. And then we have a wave that's about 650 miles east-southeast of the Lesser Antilles, and that just has a low potential of cyclone development, according to the National Hurricane Center. It is forecast to generally move to the west-northwest, but this morning we're certainly seeing a lot more more convection there as we look at the uh, infrared satellite imagery. 80s in Fort Lauderdale and in Miami, at least Weston is hanging on to 74, 77 in Kendall, 79 in Marathon, 81 in Key West. It does feel like the mid to upper 80s because it is so steamy out there. So very humid, but not quite as humid as the beginning of the week when we were already feeling like the 90s at this time of the morning. The breeze is out of the east to southeast today, about 7 to 14 miles an hour, turning our attention to the tropics. That tropical wave, which is now just a couple hundred miles east of Barbados, it only has a 10% chance of cyclone development. And actually this morning, not looking too impressive. However, a strong tropical wave is expected to roll off the coast of Africa and the National Hurricane Center is giving it a medium potential 40% chance of development over the next five days. So we're talking possibly by next week and then we'll have to wait and see how it interacts with some strong wind shear that's currently over the Atlantic. With that warmth, we have humidity at 74% with those numbers combined. There you go. We got the feels like temperature still feeling warm like 90 degrees with that humidity. East wind on shore 10 miles per hour. So with the onshore wind again, and any showers that do develop in the Atlantic will push onto land and push off to the west. So 80s as we go throughout the overnight hours, we should see a few upper 70s peaking by around 5 to 7 a.m. as well. Then we do warm up pretty quickly into the 80s to mid to upper 80s for your afternoon with a few spotty showers. Now let's talk tropics. We have this one area right here closest to Africa. That's about 4,000 miles off to the east of us. Has about a 30% chance of developing over the next five days as it does move quickly off to the west. We're going to be keeping an eye on this one, but it's set, again, it still has a few obstacles to get through. We're talking some wind shear, some dry air, of course, so we will be on the lookout for this system. Invest 95L again in the next couple of days, but the one a little bit closer to home, closest to the Bermuda Island there, this is sitting off to the south there, moving to the west 15. At the moment, doesn't look like it's going to have a lot of time to develop, especially early in the week, but it is moving off to the west. The model's picking up on that tropical moisture. You can see that right here. You can see a little bit of the wind there as well and this does particularly work its way close to the northern Florida, Georgia, and even South Carolina coastline. Though, again, doesn't look like it's going to further develop, but it could just be a tropical wave, giving them a good amount of rain. One more place that's seeing thunderstorms, that is the south. Thanks, Paul. Marietta, Georgia picked up about a, a quarter inch of rain yesterday. The Atlanta Metro could see raindrops today. Meanwhile, cities along the Gulf, like New Orleans, all the way to Miami, should keep their eye to the sky for foul weather. So, Dr. Postel, tis that time of year where nearly a month into hurricane season now and got something to watch. We do, and it's actually not that far off the coast, off the southeast coast. If you're just tuning in, you might be thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? Right. We, there was not much on the Hurricane Center's radar yesterday. 
It was on our radar. But we are watching an area of disturbed weather that in the next 36 hours will be moving westward and very likely bring in some showers and maybe some gusty winds to portions of, let's say, North Florida, uh, Georgia coast, also South Carolina, anywhere from Jacksonville on north to Charleston. 20% chance of developing into a tropical system. In other words, a depression or a named storm. And there's not much time for that to happen or much room for it to happen, but it will be moving this system over warmer waters of the Gulf of Mexico. We might get some more thunderstorm activity with it as it moves roughly in that direction. Lots going on on the satellite pictures and you might be drawing your attention to here. There's a lot of swirl going on. You can actually trace that back to the North Atlantic to a decidedly non-tropical system way at high latitudes that came swooping around into this part of the world. But it's also merged with another area of low pressure at the surface. There is a trough there, no doubt about that. But with the trough, the winds are kind of circulating around it like that. There is some curvature to the flow, right? But there's not a complete circuit. So we're not seeing the kind of uh, setup that we would normally be wary of for development. Right now, this is more just an area of low pressure moving westward, but it will bring some impactful weather kind of like this future radar suggests. Going westward, you can see that thing swirling around. Most of that is circulation aloft, and that will be moving westward. So heads up, Let's say if you have interest in Tybee Island, Georgia, maybe uh, near Charleston, uh, also areas to the north of that, maybe as far south as Ponte Vedra. Be careful because this thunderstorm activity could be kind of gusty during the morning hours tomorrow before it moves inland during the afternoon and evening. Really not so concerned about, you know, a ton of rain, but there may be some localized areas where we could get two to three inches, depending on how those showers and heavier thunderstorms produce the rain, Paul. So there's a lot of uncertainty with the rainfall forecast, but there's a lot of certainty about where this thing is going to go. Tourists and residents in Cabo San Lucas need to pay attention to the forecast this week. Hurricane Enrique is tracking parallel to Mexico's Pacific coast. If, it tr if its track holds, Enrique could slam into the southern tip of Baja, California at midweek. But you know what, Dr. Posto? What's that? Uh, some palm trees, some water. Uh, I'm liking it. And, you know, I've seen a ton of people uh, vacationing in Cabo recently, so I do think this is an important forecast that a lot of us are going to have to pay attention to. Right, and the weather's going to get worse. I, I don't think we're going to have a hurricane moving through, but still, bad weather, showers, gusty winds, big surf, that could be problematic. So keep yeah. that in mind. If you happen to have interest there or plan on visiting there, let's say in a couple of days. Right now, Hurricane Enrique, a 90 mile per hour hurricane, maybe a brief window of strengthening is possible today day before it probably begins a weakening trend as it moves northward toward, let's say, Cabo San Lucas, and that would likely be during the middle of the week, more likely than not as a tropical storm. That's the official forecast from the Hurricane Center, that the center of circulation passes somewhere in this. But remember, showers and thunderstorms extend well away from the center in lots of cases in most cases, and that will be likely this time as well. So weather, bad weather is very much likely on the way for parts of that region. Now let's shift our attention to the Atlantic side because there is a tropical system out here called Invest 95L, meaning the Hurricane Center is investigating this for possible development, 30% chance over the next five days as it rolls westward across the tropical Atlantic. Interests in parts of the Caribbean, the Greater Antilles, the Lesser Antilles, Puerto Rico, uh, everywhere in that region. Heads up because this system is probably going to be moving through in about a week, roughly. But keep track because there is some shot that it strengthens a little bit, but it's having a little bit of a tough time right now for lots of reasons. There's a center roughly of the thunderstorms in the area of low pressure. But notice the cloud pattern right around here. And what that is is telling us that, you know, there is very likely um, sort of the dust aloft that is sort of suppressing some of the clouds, and that indeed is the uh, Saharan dust there. And I'm trying to close off that thing. Oops. Uh, I'm going to have fast forward this and I'm unfortunately not able to clear off the screen but uh, let's see if what I can do now nope, sorry about that I left that telestration on but here's the idea forget that little red circle there but that arrow tells you that we need to be watching out across this part of the Atlantic because in about five days whatever is 95 L may be right about there Paul in parts of the western Atlantic close to home so heads up
You have to repeat Telestrator 101. Don't hit the close I know. button. Greg. What button did I hit? You close like... the whole program and watch that. All right, tropical weather. Two systems. This one we've been watching for a few days has a 30% chance as it moves uh, through the Atlantic. And then this one, this is a little more interesting. It won't have any kind of direct impact on Florida, but it has a 50-50 chance. It has a very short window here, pretty much overnight and early tomorrow, before it moves in. Either it'll be around the... Uh, uh, South Carolina Georgia border where it would be a landfall or a, a site where it'll make it on shore. There's another look at it. So there are bursts of convection with this and there's somewhat of a low level center. So we could get a depression or a named storm out of this. Like I said, it stays well north of our area though. All right, let's talk about the southeast because we've got a very intriguing tropical intruder in 96L, maybe taking aim at the Georgia uh, and South Carolina coast here. It could become a depression or maybe even a storm. Uh, as it comes uh, in later on today, the hurricane hunters will investigate this area around noon. Of course, we're talking about Invest 96L. We've got 95L out there, and there's even another system behind that, believe it or not, with a low-level circulation uh, way down south, like six degrees north. So let's talk about 96L. 70% chance now is of 8 a.m. It doesn't have two days. It has about a day. Uh, what is interesting to me is if you look at some of the later pictures, does that not appear to be jogging a little bit more to the northwest? Yes, it does. But... Also, notice where all the weather is, well onto the western side of this. So I think it's interesting, you know, it could get named, but all the weather is going to come in before the circulation center unless this were to actually get more convection in and around it as it goes over the Gulf Stream, which is impossible. So you can see the thunderstorms. You could get tropical storm force gusts out of that, 39, 45 miles an hour, pretty easily, actually. So as the system moves west, it does have a chance to go over those warm Gulf Stream waters, so sure, it could pop up. And by the way, if we get a D-name storm today or tonight, it'll be the first D-name storm uh, since July 1st, since last year. We, this would only be the fourth year on the modern satellite era that that's happened. All of these, by the way, after 2010, just FYI. So here's 95 L, okay, and here's another system behind that that's probably going to be an, uh, our next invest uh, before too long. I'll show you why in a second. But there's a 30% chance of this developing. And the fact that we've been talking about these waves coming across from the Cabo Verdes, across the main development region, you know, yes, there's pitfalls, and the chances of this development are pretty low. But either way, the fact is, is now we've cleared the cool water and warm water from this point on to the islands. Some of the guidance ramps this up coming into the islands on Wednesday evening and on into Thursday morning. So there's 95L. Here's the system behind that. Both of these are moving along. So 95L here. Here's the system coming in on Friday, which is the system behind that, which may even become an invest. There's a lot of pitfalls with these. And notice, by the time we head into the weekend, both of them are gone. They just kind of disappear off the guidance in through here. So we'll see if that, in fact, is the case. Enrique, our first hurricane of the season, by the way, uh, 90 miles an hour, starting to get a little way from land, but it's going to also weaken in time. But, Jordan, could we get some of this moisture to the southwest? Some of the guidance, please, uh, especially for New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, looks really intriguing I hope going into the next couple of weeks. So, explode yeah, I'm crossing storms. my fingers here. We now have... Tropical depression number four. So this literally was happening in the moments that we were showing you those turtles. Yeah. It just came in from the National Hurricane Center. What we have out of the southeast coast is now a tropical depression. Yeah, we uh, sort of started watching this thing over the weekend, and, and we were thinking, oh, you know, chances of it developing, it's there, but window of, for that to occur would be pretty short. But it's gotten its act together a little bit here and uh, getting closer and closer to the coast. Impacts for us mm -hmm. will essentially be the same whether or not it was named or not, uh, or depression or not. It's going to be the gusty winds coming in and some of those downpours. But there is the chance, actually, it will get a name. Danny is the next name on the list. The hurricane hunters are going out this afternoon to investigate. So we'll see if they find tropical storm force winds. Um, we are expecting that. In fact, that's the forecast for it by this evening, 40 miles per hour right here. And you can see that it's very close to the coast. So, you know, tropical storm warnings are up. Now is the time to basically prepare. Luckily, it's not coming in that strong. Yes, and it should be moving pretty quickly by early Tuesday, well inland here for us. But again, it is on the way, and you can clearly see, look at that. Yeah. Clearly see the spin associated with this thing, but where all the wet yeah. weather has been has been well away from it off towards uh, the west. I mean, just what I mean, it's such a beautiful spiral, the Fibonacci sequence, right, that you see right there. Then you see all the weather with it. I mean, they're just so um, just, you know, not co-located. So already getting some showers, that will bring some showers. Though. The radar just doesn't, you know, reach out that far. So I can't see what's happening rain-wise right over it. Interesting when it comes to getting to that D storm here uh, before the July 1st. 
It only, only has happened a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020, last year, of course, a crazy of course, year. 2020, yeah. 2012 and then 2016 yeah. as yeah. well. So we are ahead of the game. And then weather-wise, we're also watching out another Invest 95L, which we've been watching for a week now. This one only has a 30% chance of developing, but it will track its way towards the Lesser Antilles by about midweek. And at the very least, bringing some squally showers here. Long way to go to track that one. Welcome into Weather Center Live. We've got a tropical depression on our hands. This is tropical depression four. It formed this morning off of the uh, South Carolina coast and it's moving very quickly towards parts of Georgia and South Carolina. Looking at it from the visible satellite, you can clearly see that spin certainly looks healthy from there, but we're going to talk about some of the factors that is maybe prohibiting this from developing. Either way, there is a chance. Slim but there's a chance it could still become a tropical storm calling. Welcome back to Weather Nation. We're showing you tropical storm Danny. Currently maximum sustained winds at about 40 miles per hour, moving to the northwest at about 16 miles per hour. That pressure is dropped by about two millibars there, which Devin means it's strengthened. Yeah, and we were just discussing this over about the last 30 minutes that you watched that there was this area of convection storms. It's just an area to put that that was south first going into Georgia, but watch the area north of that that really explodes. And, and I was talking about that area of deep convection, high cloud tops and the cooling to it. And we felt that could put it over the edge and become tropical storm status, and that's what's responsible for doing that. That's right. It's become a tropical storm, and that means we're expecting landfall as a tropical storm really within the next few hours. Yeah, and as it does that, then it's still going to make its way on shore. We're looking anywhere from maybe Charleston, South Carolina, Beaufort, you get up north of maybe Savannah, Tybee Island. So within that vicinity where the actual landfall should be coming to it, visible satellite imagery is just very impressive. And again, watch the area of deep convection. It's just like throwing a pebble into the pond and you see that radiate outwards with the spirals. That's right. And you can see by this a very asymmetric storm, which means once it makes landfall, it's it's actually going to be much quieter after that time. Yeah, in, in some rapid de-intensification de or rapid weakening probably is the best way to put that one to it. So we'll have to watch over the next about 12 to 18 hours, re probably maintaining some tropical storm status to that. Absolutely, and we'll be keeping our eye on everything, including those alerts, the rip currents, the swells, a lot that plays into these tropical systems. Yeah, that's a great point, too. It's uh, also maybe even some onshore flow to this and maybe a little bit of localized flooding, but overall, that's not going to look to maybe one of the worst pictures to it. So, Caroline, we're going to get back to you in just one moment. We'll discuss some of the way in the northeast heat. Since we're right here in Danny, let's get down to the southeastern coast of the United States. What you can really look at here is that area of deep convection that's starting to show up on high res Doppler radar that is right in this vicinity. So we look at the lightning strikes that have started to come out of it. There's a look at that convection that's responsible for pushing those winds that are just over that 39 mile per hour threshold for it. Beaufort, there you go. I've spoken of that. Hilton Head Island, Beaufort, and even at Charleston looks to be heavier thunderstorms and downpours that are over Beaufort, South Carolina. Let's put this in motion over the last hour. You can start to see that I was just explaining earlier that you had out from the center of circulation into around Hinesville, Savannah. That's in Georgia. You cross over the river there, the boundary in between our two states, and you get into South Carolina. Zoom out a little farther here. And it looks like the center of storm and there might actually be some recirculation taking place or maybe some eyewall recentering to it. And there's the general area of the low pressure. And again, to talk about the symmetry of the storm that Caroline was mentioning to it. Everything's kind of been blown west of that, too. It's not like you would find in those normal hurricanes, tropical storms where the convection's in 360 degrees surrounding this. Everything has been blown off with those trade winds that are running east to west in this part of the country here, too. All right, live pictures right now of, uh, of course, the tedious and delicate work still being done at the condo collapse. And they're having to deal with, of course, weather conditions, uh, getting rained on super, severe weather throughout the day sporadically. They really haven't had uh, a significant break, and it looks as though this pattern is here for the next few days. Chief Meteorologist Phil Farrow is back with us, Phil. Yes, indeed. It's going to be wet at least over the next few days across South Florida. Plenty of moisture moving in. And we're also tracking the tropics. There is a brand new tropical storm by the name of Danny, and it is impacting the southeastern coast of the U.S. right now with 45 mile an hour winds. As of the 5 p.m. advisory, that has come in, and it looks like it's going to make landfall right in between Savannah and Charleston later on this evening. So it will continue to track towards the west-northwest, making landfall and basically raining itself out 
rather quickly. This system is going to be more rain than wind. And as of the 5 p.m. advisory, it looks like by Tuesday night, just west of Atlanta, it should be done. Now, the tropics are also heating up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The National Hurricane Center keeping their eyes on a tropical wave, and they're giving it a 40% chance that it could develop somewhere in this area highlighted in orange over the next five days. So the Lesser Antilles, Puerto Rico, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, the Bahamas, and eventually Florida should be keeping their eyes out on this just in case. For us, we continue to deal with a lot of rainfall across the area. And right now, all of that energy is focused in across of Broward County. We're looking at that rain moving in across of the uh, southeastern part of the county, all the way in through the Sawgrass Expressway, and then up and down the coast here as well. There's more rain sitting just offshore with plenty of lightning. We focus in once again just to show you that we have one strong thunderstorm now that has developed uh, not along the coast, but basically starting to move in across Coral Springs and Parkland. That does have the potential for gusty winds and some hail as it moves into Palm Beach County. Now, the rest of the uh, area does have a lot of lightning sitting offshore, and we'll be keeping our eyes on that. Well, hey, everybody, welcome into a special extended edition of Weather Underground. We're with you until 9 o'clock Eastern as we track Tropical Storm Danny into the southeast, as well as all those other weather stories, Mark. We have so much going on. Uh, Mark Elliott here with me. I'm Alex Wilson. Of course, we've got Dr. Nab in-house as well. Absolutely, and with a tropical storm basically forming right on our doorstep, there are indeed tropical storm warnings now, Alex, that have been issued, uh, including near the Charleston area down through, say, Savannah or so. We've got tropical storm warnings up. You're also looking at a couple of different images there for uh, the Charleston region. Threat of tornadoes along the South Carolina coast. Uh, and South Carolina and Georgia's coast will also see very heavy rains. And some of that slow-moving rainfall has already begun. You can see the raindrops on the lens. I want to bring in uh, our own uh, tropical weather expert. Dr. Rick Nab is standing by. And Dr. Nab, you never like to see uh, a storm that is getting organized as it comes into land. Where we've seen this before, you know, Claudette was doing kind of the same thing. This is a much smaller tropical storm and you can't trust small tropical cyclones. They can ramp up in a hurry and they can be torn apart in a hurry. And this one waited till pretty much the last minute to ramp up. Uh, we've watched this weather system since it was south of Bermuda last week and only today did it really uh, kind of get its act together where the thunderstorms were organized near the circulation center. And it's doing this uh, when we're only, uh, you know, a couple hours from the center circulation coming ashore. Now, max winds are now up to 45 miles per hour based on a combination of aircraft reconnaissance data and what we're seeing on the radar. But it is not a well-organized system, and a lot of the weather is well removed from the center. The center's going to come ashore down in here, but on the north side of it, that's where you could have the tropical storm conditions and spots uh, for a brief time as this fast-moving system moves ashore. Always the chance for an isolated tornado to the right of where a tropical system comes ashore. Chance isn't real high, uh, but it can happen. And we've also got the possibility of isolated flooding. So it's not a big, big, big uh, flood risk, but in some spots we're already having some problems. Uh, now, because it's moving so quickly, this is going to be a short-lived event, and it is not going to hang out near the coast for very long, and it's not going to remain a tropical storm very long. This is shortly after midnight tonight. Uh, it's getting into Georgia, and it'll be dissipating uh, as it moves farther inland. Um, now, the reason it's moving so quickly, Bermuda High is steering it ashore, and along with the tropical storm, you see how small it is in the big picture? of things, but there's a lot of area of onshore flow that's not only pushing the tropical storm ashore, but it's pushing the ocean ashore. So it's not just Danny, but it's the whole flow around the Bermuda High that's presenting uh, the moderate to high rip current risk even down onto the east coast of Florida. So careful at the beaches. Now let's zoom in on this thing for much of the day and much of the weekend. It was an open swirl, but you see how the surface circulation right in there now is tucked underneath the thunderstorms that have blown up right there 
between the center and the coast uh, and see the, the winds around at Hilton Head and Charleston, um, you know, gusting to, you know, 25, 30 miles an hour in places. But the biggest weather right now is that cluster of thunderstorms on the west side. This has always been a sheared system because an upper level low off to its southwest. So the strongest thunderstorms are up sheer or to the west of the circulation center. And that's where you got this line of storms uh, moving into the Savannah, Georgia area. So vicious lightning and also we've got these flood advisories are in effect. Uh, there's one to the west of Savannah until 8 p.m. Then Savannah itself uh, is under a flood advisory as well. So downtown Savannah rocking and rolling right now and going up uh, across I-95. So careful on the roads uh, as you go through that area. And again, this is going to be a short-lived event because this small tropical storm is moving quickly inland. Wow. So if uh, we make a habit of this uh, the rest of the year, Mark, with things developing on our doorstep, we better watch every little thing out in the tropics, and we will do just that later in the show. So many families affected there, Alex, including all across South Florida, even our very own WSVN family here. Chief Meteorologist Phil Farrow losing two loved ones in this terrible tragedy, and he shared some beautiful memories with our Robin Simmons. The Champlain Towers South tragedy is being felt by so many, including Seven's chief meteorologist, Phil Farrow. His cousin, Sergio Lozano, seeing the unimaginable. I tell her, Lola, the building's not there. She's yelling and saying, what do you mean? I go, my parents' apartment's not there, it's gone. In the morning when my uh, cousin called me, and uh, he was basically uh, in tears, and I still couldn't believe it until uh, we got the surveillance video that showed the building collapsing, and that kind of it kind of breaks your heart. Phil says his family is still processing the loss of 79-year-old Gladys and her husband, 83-year-old Antonio. Gladys was Phil's godmother, Antonio his uncle. Here's the pair celebrating Antonio's 80th birthday. The couple just weeks away from another milestone, their 59th wedding anniversary. So my godmother was probably one of the most beautiful people in the world that I've ever known. For any occasion, she would cook. She, they would be the life of the party. Uh, my, my uncle, Tony, uh, very much quick with a, a joke, and, and they were truly the kind of people who, whatever you needed, they were there for you, for the entire family. Phil says his uncle's dream was to live on the beach. After more than 20 years of condo living, watching their two boys have children, and even getting the chance to meet their first great-grandchild, that dream turned into a nightmare early Thursday morning. In the blink of an eye, everything is gone, everything changes. And uh, so we just need to love each other. Phil says his cousins are coping, grateful to have something they know dozens of families still don't have, the ability to lay their loved ones to rest. And they were found together. And so we're all going with the, uh, with the thought that they never knew what happened. They fell asleep, and that was it. The man who has helped countless 7 News viewers get through weather events has this advice for those bracing for a different kind of storm. They may be gone physically, but they're not gone from your heart. So, um, yeah, just have faith. The Lozanos will be laid to rest this week. Reporting from the news desk, Robin Simmons, 7 News. You know, the center of Tropical Storm Danny has come ashore. That's uh, best I can tell from all the available satellite and radar data. And the National Hurricane Center will come out with an intermediate public advisory be sometime between now and 8 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm quite sure they will tell us uh, that the center has come ashore. Maybe they'll put a time on it. Uh, I'll show you why I think that has occurred um, based on what we can see on radar and satellite, but I'm also going to show you what's going on in Savannah. It has really been coming down there. So this is a quick mover. Uh, the 5 p.m. advisory had the motion as west-northwest at 16 miles an hour, and if you do the math, it was about an hour and a half away from making landfall if you just follow the path. Well, that would put us right around 6.30, so I think that's about when it came ashore. Um, being steered around the Bermuda High, uh, so it's in a pretty fast steering current. That's good news. That lessens the duration of the rainfall and the wind. 
for most of you. <laughs> in Savannah, it has rained really hard for the last couple of hours. Now, here's the long loop. So there's the open swirl uh, going back to one o'clock this afternoon, uh, you know, when it was a few dozen miles offshore and on a west-northwest path, that would also, you know, bring it on shore in the 6, 6, 7 p.m. Uh, time frame. Now, let's take a closer look. Take a look at the radar, okay? If you look through this, if you go back to about 6 p.m., it's pretty clear it's offshore because you have right in and there, the, what appears to be the west side of the open swirl. And then by we get to 7 p.m., everything's on shore. And now look at how, with the center of circulation on land, the heavy rainfall down in Savannah between there and Hilton Head is now being drawn northeastward. So that's another indication that center of circulation is well on shore. But wow, it has really been coming down on the west and now the southwest side of the circulation center. And that has meant for uh, some... Uh, you know, heavy downpours that have really added up. Uh, now here's on the visible imagery, you can see those overshooting tops. Look at, the, here's the center of circulation coming this way, but those overshooting tops just keep bubbling Savannah and then northward along I-95. So it has really been an, an amazing persistence of those thunderstorms. Now this is gonna move quickly northwestward uh, and it will weaken quickly. So uh, we're not gonna get an update on that track at 8 p.m., we will at 11 p.m., but you know, it's moving west-northwest pretty quickly. But there you can see the center circulation up in here and look at the vicious lightning that has finally moved north of downtown Savannah but there and northward along I-95 uh, we've got a flood advisory till 930 local time and radar estimates are somewhere between four and six inches over the last hour especially near and just north of Savannah my goodness be careful on the roads folks Alex and that warmth eventually translates into the waters and could we be setting the stage for an active, you know, and fast start to the tropical year? Dr. Nab here. Uh, Dr. Nab, we've seen Danny, we have, you know, storms on the Pacific side and there's a couple of other features lining up as well. Yeah, and all the way out to the west coast of Africa where we tend to think of that being a peak of season area to watch. Well, we're having to watch it a little earlier because those tropical waves out in the central and eastern tropical Atlantic uh, are a little more active with the thunderstorms than they sometimes are this time of year and the models are suggesting at least the possibility of development so is the hurricane center so let's go through all of it uh, with Danny having made landfall uh, probably a little before 8 p.m. Eastern time uh, max winds at 40 miles an hour it's not gonna be a tropical storm much longer I think on the 11 p.m. advisory it's back to a depression because everything will be on land including uh, the eastern part of the circulation which is where those 40 mile an hour winds almost certainly are west northwest at 16 miles an hour a fast mover because of the steering currents around the Bermuda High that are not just bringing Danny on shore but bringing the uh, high risk of rip currents from Florida to the Carolinas with a little extra energy added by what was our open swirl most of the day, in fact, most of the weekend. And then at the last minute, the thunderstorms over the Gulf Stream and over land, the center circulation snuck under there, and the winds came up to 45 miles an hour just before it came ashore. Here's the longer loop on the radar. You can see finally uh, the Savannah area has quieted down after a rocking and rolling couple of hours with vicious lightning and some flooding rains, even um, you know, some, uh, some strong winds. And the heaviest rain now is south of Augusta and northwest of uh, Savannah. So the, the, set, the satellite appearance is not, uh, uh, you know, really impressive, but look how uh, potent that convection was over Savannah. And even though it's not raining anymore uh, of any significance there, we still have a flood advisory in effect till 930 because there still could be some low spots, uh, some water covered roads. So be careful driving. Uh, but the good news is uh, with the lightning moving inland here, but not being as potent as it was. I think the rain rates have come down to the few inches per hour that we saw, but you still could have some problems on the roads uh, in northern Georgia as this moves inland. But the wind issue I don't think is going to be a real big deal. Just with the low moving into uh, Atlanta tomorrow afternoon with the heating of the day uh, could you know, gin up a few extra afternoon thunderstorms. A tropical storm on Enrique, it was a hurricane over the weekend. This slow moving system near the coast will continue to weaken uh, we still have a tropical storm watch for Cabo San Lucas, but the bigger picture is that it's going to bring some moisture through the Gulf of California here and could bring uh, some 
added moisture to the southwest monsoon in places like Arizona when we get to Thursday, Friday, and into the weekend. That's one thing that East Pacific tropical cyclones can do is contribute to one of these Gulf of California moisture surges. So maybe some benefit out of that system. Now, East Atlantic, here's the west coast of Africa. Two tropical waves uh, over water, another one um, about to come out of the hopper and again the farther west they go the warmer the waters get and that's why the lead wave has the chance of development 40 percent according to the hurricane center over the next five days it will tangle with land and some wind shear but there's at least some chance along the way that we get a depression or storm and then i don't think that's the last one we're going to be looking at uh, this week because the first wave gets to the islands uh winter and leeward islands by about wednesday but then the next wave that i showed you near the cabo verde islands will be moving pretty swiftly westward south of this uh, you know, subtropical high. So it'll get to the islands maybe on about Friday. And then it's at least possible, if a euro is correct, that we could have some spin arriving north of the Caribbean surrounding that high ahead of the trough over the east coast of the U.S. Something at least to watch. Because remember, before we had Danny, we had just a little hint in the models that something could form near the coastline. So this is another one of those hints. And when you get into July, Alex, you know, sometimes these things can develop on our doorstep, like we saw with Hurricane Arthur, 4th of July weekend, seven years ago. I'm not saying that will happen, just saying you can't turn your back on the tropics in early July. You cannot, uh, absolutely. Well, storms may hamper in the search efforts that are continuing in Surfside, Florida. The rescue wor workers were looking today for survivors of the rubble in the rubble and of a condominium building that collapsed early on Thursday morning. Now, the death toll sits at 10, but more than 150 people are still missing. Unfortunately, crews are still going to be battling uh, the chance of thunderstorms again Tuesday and Wednesday. I know that's put a pause on some of the search efforts uh, over the past few days, and we'll be watching the sky again Tuesday and Wednesday. Another update on Danny after this. And Danny makes landfall. Right now, parts of Georgia are getting drenched. Danny's just been downgraded to a tropical depression. As we come on the air, that is on the move. Good evening, I'm Todd McDermott. And I'm Felicia Rodriguez. Thank you for joining us. Danny was the first tropical storm to make landfall in South Carolina in June since 1867. Severe weather expert Mike Lyons joining us now with the latest on Danny. Mike? And it was a short lifespan for this tropical system. It was upgraded this morning at 11 to a tropical depression. At 2, it became Tropical Storm Danny. 8 o'clock tonight, it made landfall. And tonight, downgraded once again and falling apart. Thankfully, the impact on the Carolinas and Georgia, minimal our favorite kind of storm. Off we go. Satellite imagery of Tropical Storm Danny. Now, as Todd mentioned, downgraded to a tropical depression. You have to look hard. There it is. Look at the cloud cover just kind of going away. The rain continues to come down. They could get between one and three inches of rain. That's about it. Again, very minimal impact from the second storm to make landfall in the United States this year. Of course, Claudette about 10 days ago. Here's Danny now forecast to continue to weaken, bringing some rain to Atlanta. Winds right now about 35. This thing will be gone on Tuesday. Meanwhile, the tropics continue to be active. We're watching a second system. This one, a fairly well-organized tropical wave here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And the Hurricane Center says by Friday, there's a chance it may develop. Some of our computer models want to develop it into at least a depression this weekend in the Caribbean and perhaps moving into the Gulf of Mexico. At the moment, this poses no threat to us. Meanwhile, back here at home, routine summer weather, hot, humid, but the pattern begins to change as we head toward Wednesday. Talk about the return of heavy rain. When I'm back with my full forecast in a couple minutes. All right, talk about your gully washers. We had them on Monday along coastal Carolina, Beaufort, and all the way down the Carolina coastline and up the coastline to towns like Myrtle Beach. Oh my gosh, right there. Look at the raindrops coming down along the Grand Strand, and then all those low lying clouds coming right across Beaufort, Paris Island, Hunting Island, Fripp Island. It was a mess out there out across the South Carolina low country. Why was this happening? Well, because of Tropical Storm Danny, winds 40, 45 miles per hour. 
shower and some folks got two or three inches of rain out of this tropical storm. One of our first of the year here and we're still in June already up to our fourth named storm. It's mm -hmm. going to be a busy season. We think just like last year. It certainly is. Now the one good news with this storm that came through, we didn't really see a lot of impacts. We saw the heavy rainfall, but in terms of reports and any kind of flooded areas out there, it has been a little bit on the weaker variety yeah, of storms, which is good. Yes. Yeah, we like these weak storms. We don't want the big ones here, but we certainly got at least a taste mm -hmm. of a tropical system coming on through. Yeah, but we're not quite done, done with Danny here. We continue to track the latest on this. You can see the bands continue to make their way in towards Georgia, South Carolina. Still going to be bringing in that potential for heavy rain and flooding through the overnight hours tonight. And as we keep tracking the latest on this system, it's going to be fizzling out within the next number of hours here. So as you can see, the latest on this system as it continues to push through Georgia will potentially be bringing some impacts to Atlanta as we get into those overnight hours. But what happens next? Once the system makes its way through Georgia, most of our forecast models, it's either going to completely fizzle out. The National Hurricane Center will likely expire some of those alerts here. And then it kind of gets caught up in this frontal boundary across the northeastern United States. That could mean it runs into that energy and then some of the rain bands that move into the northeast were once what was tropical storm Danny. Now what's left of Danny that'll continue making its way into these areas. There's the latest and fourth name storm, the second landfalling storm in the United States. We do have another area of interest in the tropics. Uh, we'll be watching out for that, but Elsa will be the next name on our Atlantic 2021 season. As we look at our forecast models across Georgia, South Carolina, still some lingering rainfall, possibly a couple little thunderstorms up through the Atlanta Metro as we get into early Tuesday morning. Uh, we'll still be bringing and some heavy localized rainfall flooding impacts through those early morning hours. And then by about midday, it runs into that frontal boundary and completely fizzles out here. National Hurricane Center will likely uh, stop issuing those advisories. First 10 minutes of the newscast, we promise you your tropical weather update. And the remnants of Danny just located over Georgia dissipated as it pushed on shore. As of the last advisory, winds are at 25 miles per hour. Though there is another area we're watching well east of the Lesser Antilles and the Windward Islands with a 40% chance of development in the next five days. To the other corner of the country, the southeast, Danny, drenching part of the region this morning after coming ashore as a tropical storm on the coast of South Carolina yesterday. That was fast. We were talking about it yesterday morning. It wasn't even a depression yet. Right, right. Boom. One little convective burst and we got a tropical storm. That's the new uh, new way of doing things these yeah. days. But either way, uh, this was very beneficial rainfall for the low country. This is what Good. they call it down here. So very, very beneficial rainfall. So Steph's going to give us an update on the leftovers of Oof. Danny this morning. Yeah. They're cooking right along. Here, it Steph. is cooking. I mean, this thing is cranking right along the highway. change the map. Exactly. I know. We literally have to shift this. Uh, Jillian, I don't know if you're watching. Maybe you can shift it over so we can actually show where the moisture is. I think this one's kind of stuck where it is. But look at that. Moving at 17 miles an hour right along 20 there. And we have that moisture not only at the surface but also in the mid to upper levels. And it's going to continue on this path. But notice, look at the dark greens associated with this. The convection, convection, convection. Ah. Starting to die out a little bit. And that's what it's going to do. There is your swirl, a little bit of lightning, but watch the system because it no longer has its fuel. Jim is drinking some coffee right now to fuel himself up with a Paul yes. Goodlow mug, with a Paul Goodlow face right there. That's what you need, I right? had yours yesterday. I, did you? The fact that you weren't here, I was missing you, so I had you on a mug. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, true story. Um, but he uses that coffee to fuel him up, right, and amp him yes, up. he does. This low pressure needs water. It needs the ocean, the gulf, something like that. It doesn't have it. And so it's slowly going to open up, as we say in the weather world, this low pressure. It'll open up because a low pressure is nice and tightly packed like this, but this is when it opens up. It's more of a trophy area, but that's also low pressure. It's just low pressure. You can think about the low, like, strung out along this whole place. So we'll see that, and you'll see it brings the moisture, brings the clouds but it doesn't, it's not as intense. Time now for your tropical update. There are two systems to watch in the Atlantic. Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis is here with more on that. We focus right on these disturbances. They are turning over the Atlantic waters. And what we find is this first disturbance is about 600 miles east of the Lesser Antilles. And then there's another behind it and more south of it. Now the thing to watch on this first one, or the one thing that stands out, is the dust. It is embedded in Saharan dust. And not only that, the upper level winds that it's encountering are not necessarily all that de ideal for this to organize. But nonetheless, it is moving toward the west-northwest and should reach 
the far eastern Caribbean islands by about tomorrow night, bringing some squally weather there. The National Hurricane Center is giving this a 30% chance of developing over the next five days. Now, this second dis disturbance is farther south, so not necessarily in the core of the dust. We'll have to keep an eye on this one, too, as it is moving west northwestward over the next five days. They're showing a little higher development potential on that one at 40%. Right now, too soon to say exactly what we're going to be looking at as we head later in the week, but as these near and maybe cross over those far eastern Caribbean islands and get into the Caribbean Sea, definitely worth keeping an eye on. I'll be back in a few minutes with our weather right here at home. We know the rain continues to be an issue out there and uh, still scattered showers and storms are upon us. Calvin. And we've been talking about that record breaking heat wave in the northwest, but thankfully at least today temperatures will not be in the triple digits for places like Seattle and Portland, but still in the hundreds for Phoenix, 97 in Vegas, and check out the upper 90s expected along the mid-Atlantic northeast New England areas. It is a hot one for folks up north. Now, in terms of the tropics heating up as well, I've been watching that wave just east of the Lester Antilles, which now only has a low potential of development. Now, as we head into the weekend and early next week, really going to be watching the second wave that is behind it, and that's in the Central Atlantic. And the National Hurricane Center is giving this a high potential of development as it generally moves towards the west-northwest. I want to show you the models because for the first wave, some of the models don't even keep it moving here once we get past the Sunday time frame. So there is a chance that it could impact the Lesser Antilles and parts of the Caribbean. But then the second wave is the one that looks like it continues to move through these warm waters of the Caribbean and does have a high potential of developing as we head into the Sunday and Monday time frame. Yes, things are heating up in the tropics. Breaking news right now as we've been tracking that tropical wave in the Atlantic, the National Hurricane Center now deeming that potential tropical cyclone five, so PTC five, and they have already started to issue watches for the lesser Antilles. So again, they're going to start these advisories now as we've been watching this cluster of thunderstorms that had a very high potential of developing. And now we are going to continue to watch this as we head into the next couple days. This would be Elsa. That is what's next on the list. So again, PTC five there with this latest update just around the five o'clock hour here, 35 mile an hour winds just east of the windward island. So here's a look at these alerts. Tropical storm watches now posted around Martinique all the way through St. Vincent as well as St. Lucia, Barbados. A lot of rain and wind headed in their direction in the next couple days. And then this will continue to scoot through the Caribbean Sea, getting up around parts of Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Cuba possible as we head into the end of this upcoming weekend. So the Caribbean, also the Gulf of Mexico, the East Coast, all need to monitor this closely. A lot can change in the next several days. But come the beginning of next week, we'll really need to see what happens with this tropical cyclone as the National Hurricane Center, as well as us, are tracking it over the next several days. So there's that potential cone and where it may be. And you can see here, this is Monday right there as we head through parts of Cuba, as well as getting close to the Gulf of Mexico. So more coming up here on the Weather Channel. Weather Underground is next as we continue to track the tropics, as well as severe weather in the Northeast. This is 7 News at 5.30. What could be cause for concern, something stirring out in the Atlantic. Well, it could make things even more difficult for rescue crews searching for victims of the Surfside condo collapse. The first responders watching and now waiting. Good evening. It may develop into a depression or a storm. That's right. Officials do have plans in place, they say, just in case that happens. Let's go to Simmons' Alex Browning. He begins our team coverage with what is being done. Alex? And Lynn, we saw over the past couple of days, rain really slowed down that search effort. So it's really unclear what a potential storm would do to these operations here, but state officials say they are ready. Those folks are gonna be working on that pile and it's not gonna stop. That's the promise to the families of the more than 100 unaccounted for as a disturbance develops in the tropics. If a system does develop, I wanna ensure you we have contingency plans, which include facility relocation, communications, backup plans of how we will continue to respond here while responding to the hurricane. Search crews have already dealt with wet weather slowing things down, and now they're watching a tropical system out at sea. It is the season, and you got to be ready. Where it will go or how strong it could be, it's too early to know. 
but state officials are planning now since a majority of state assets are here in Surfside. The division requested a federal USAR team that we mentioned yesterday. We'll need that team to augment the efforts here so that we can free up some of our state assets to be able to respond to a tropical cyclone. That team on standby as a potential storm looms over this search effort. One that's had its share already of bad weather as first responders continue to work to clear debris and hopefully find survivors. And this afternoon, it's really unclear what Mother Nature will, nature will push our way. State officials waiting to see what that forecast ends up looking like. We're live in Surfside, Alex Browning, 7 News. First at 6, we are keeping a close eye on the tropics. A potential tropical cyclone has formed in the Atlantic, and now tropical storm watches are in effect for the islands in the Lesser Antilles. Good evening. I'm Felicia Rodriguez. I'm Todd McDermott. Thanks for joining us here at 6 o'clock. This weather system could intensify into the first hurricane of the season. We go to our severe weather expert, Mike Lyons, with the latest advisory. Mike? And Todd, we're talking about the July 4th weekend. Typically, we're thinking barbecue and fireworks, but this weekend, you're going to have to think about hurricane plans because there's some potential as we head into Monday that some form of this storm is going to be close to our part of South Florida. We're going to help you with those hurricane plans. Get out your smartphone. We're going to show you a QR code in just a second. But first, let's spin the globe and show you what's going on with our tropical system, which is now located about 1,300 miles or so away from the Woodward Islands. But boy, this guy is moving fast. 20, 25 miles per hour. It will be in the Eastern Caribbean by this time Friday night. After that, it moves into the Caribbean and Cuba on Sunday and very close to South Florida on Monday. At the moment, it's not that organized, but it's starting to show signs of organization. A lot more convection near the center. This could be upgraded to a depression, more likely a tropical storm either late tonight or early tomorrow morning. At the moment, it's called a potential tropical cyclone. Hurricane Center convinced this will be tropical storm Elsa, perhaps even Hurricane Elsa. And you can see the forecast track lickety split. Look how fast this is moving. By Friday afternoon, a tropical storm moving right across the central Windward Islands, which, by the way, are under a tropical storm watch right now. After that, it's really critical where this system goes, critical for us here in South Florida. If it stays south of this big island, it has the potential to intensify. At the moment, the Hurricane Center believes a good part of it will move over Haiti and the Dominican Republic and the 10,000-foot mountains here. After that, it should weaken as it moves across Cuba and on Sunday. And then finally, as we head into Monday, some form of storm, a tropical storm, a tropical depression, maybe just a little bit of rain moving across Cuba. At this point, way too early to tell. First tonight, though, our focus on the tropics. Two areas we are tracking in. One is now a tropical depression. Let's bring in First Alert Chief Meteorologist Steve Weagle with those areas that we are watching right now. Steve. Yeah, the very latest just came in in the last minute. Now a tropical depression. That was potential tropical cyclone five. That's the one that looks very impressive on the satellite loop. This other wave is falling apart and shouldn't be an issue at all, at least as far as any kind of developing storm. But this is expected to become a tropical storm. If it's named, likely it would be Elsa, the uh, E name storm for this year. You can see it's got lots of convection and it has uh, the potential. It's in a very favorable weather environment, which is very unusual for this time of year. Usually there's lots of wind shear in this area of the Atlantic. Not this time, and it's over some very open water. It has a fairly south track uh, across Barbados on Friday and then into the Caribbean. There's Saturday, 8 a.m., winds at 60, and then moving uh, just along the south coast of Cuba on Sunday, 8 p.m., and you'll notice uh, almost pretty much our entire viewing area now in the error cone at day five. Tropical storm with 60 mile an hour winds. There are lots of scenarios here, and we're going to talk about those. The model guidance tonight is reasonably good out three days. We start to get into some changes, though, as we get into day four and five. Some of the models shift it north. Others bring it into the Gulf of Mexico. The Euro, it washes it out over the mountainous areas of Hispaniola. The uh, probability of seeing tropical storm force winds, so winds uh, 40 or above, are still extremely low, less than 10 percent. And in most cases, less than 5% in our viewing area. We do have tropical storm watches in effect for some of the islands. Now, here are some of the scenarios. Uh, not all of them, but some of the common ones.
ones that we might see. It moves west and intensifies. That's really the official forecast here. Storm weakens over the mountains of Hispaniola and dissipates. That's what the Euro is doing. And we also have a third scenario where it stays east. It gets caught up in the trough that's coming down. So there are many scenarios here that we could see. We're just going to have to watch it. It's still about six days out if it has any impact at all. And we will get to our coverage on the collapse in Surfside in just a few minutes. But first, tropical depression number five, now a tropical storm. And we have the very latest advisory as of 5 o'clock this morning. South Florida in the storm's cone of concern. This as some islands are under a tropical storm watch. Meantime, a live look at downtown Miami on this Thursday morning. Nice and clear so far, but it sure feels wet out there. The roads... Definitely a little soggy this morning as we came in. With that system out there, how concerned should South Florida be? That is the question. It sure is. Meteorologist Vivian Gonzalez live in the flex with what we need to know. Viv? And there's still time to monitor now newly formed tropical storm Elsa as of the five o'clock advisory. It's churning here in the Atlantic Ocean and you can see that it's trying to get better organized. It's still contending with some drier air to the north, but there is a visible spin and a strengthening system. The latest advisory 40 mile per hour winds. It is moving at a fast pace to the west at about 25 miles per hour and located over 800 miles east southeast of the windward islands on the forecast track the center will move over portions of the windward islands throughout the day on friday late friday it will be centered over the eastern caribbean sea and then the center of elsa could be to the south of hispaniola sometime on saturday it could brush with land over here but then eventually impacting areas of cuba and then maybe the center being over the waters keeping a tropical storm, but the center of the storm could be anywhere in this dark shaded area in the days ahead with potentially 65 mile per hour winds on Tuesday and the cone of concern does include practically all of South Florida into the lake region. So something certainly we need to continue to monitor in the days ahead and there are new watches and warnings that have been issued with Elsa and that includes St. Vincent and the Grenadines deans now under a warning, not a watch under a warning. St. Lucia, Martinique also included under this warning. Guadalupe and the Butterfly Island definitely under a watch. Now All right, South Florida, latest advisory as of 11 a.m. on Tropical Storm Elsa has wind speeds a little stronger than they were earlier this morning. 45 mile per hour winds. It is still moving towards the west, but has gain some speed now moving at 28 miles per hour. It's a little over 650 miles to the east southeast of the Windward Islands. So we're taking a closer look at satellite view and you can see Elsa looking a bit more organized here as it continues to move rapidly across the Atlantic and the latest forecast track does keep it as a tropical storm through the next few days. Some strengthening is possible within the next 24 hours as it continues to approach the Windward Islands and then eventually continuing to push on its westward track across the Caribbean Sea. Now intensity levels should remain steady through the next few days, but you'll notice that once it moves to the south of uh, Hispaniola or near it, there could be some land interaction not only with Hispaniola, but also with Cuba, and that could cause some weakening by the end of the weekend come Sunday morning into the afternoon hours. What happens after that, we'll have to wait and see, and you'll notice the forecast cone begins to diverge just a little bit as it crosses somewhere over the island nation of Cuba and near portions of the Keys. You can see that the cone extends anywhere from the Atlantic waters all of South Florida now in that cone, and it also extends across into portions of the Gulf of Mexico. And this is why we have two very reliable models that we keep a close eye on. This is one of them. The European continues with that westward motion, but then eventually you'll notice it begins to take an early turn towards the north after interacting with the island of Hispaniola. This system takes it through areas of the Atlantic and through the Bahamas as a much weaker system before pushing out towards portions of the northern Atlantic, not affecting the United States. The other more reliable model as well, this is the GFS, the global model, continues with that westward track that we just talked about, but this one's a little different. It continues with its strengthening with some, but barely 
land interaction, possibly coming close to Cuba and Jamaica, and then continuing west instead of pushing towards the north as the European model did. And then, of course, that one would be a more westerly track. We'll have to keep a close eye on it um, as uh, by the end of the weekend and into early next week. One and only Local 10 News starts right now. Right now at 6 o'clock, we are tracking Tropical Storm Elsa in the Atlantic Ocean. It's expected to bring heavy rain as it churns toward the Caribbean. And South Florida is in the cone of concern. The models show we could be affected as early as Tuesday morning. All eyes are on Elsa and where she's headed. And your weather authority is on it. We begin with Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis. Betty. Good afternoon, Elsa. A tropical storm moving towards some of the eastern Caribbean islands. These are the stats as of a 5 p.m. advisory, about 400 miles east-southeast of Barbados. That's where the center of circulation is. Winds of 45 miles per hour, so still hanging on in that area as terms of the maximum sustained winds. It is moving quickly toward the west-northwest at 29 miles per hour. Still on track to pass over or near some of these islands as we get into Friday. And then we'll be tracking it by Saturday afternoon right near Hispaniola or Haiti and Dominican Republic. And then as we're moving to Sunday-Monday time frame, right there in the vicinity of Cuba and then Monday, Tuesday in the vicinity of Florida. Still plenty of unknowns in terms of exactly what this may or may not mean for Florida, the track, and also unknowns with this intensity, Brian. And the one thing we have noticed about this system is it has managed to stay, stay just south of some dust and drier air. Yeah, that's how this one got going. It uh, avoided for the most part, the Saharan dust, and you know everybody wants to know about the computer models. Well, they're all over the place, so that's why there is high uncertainty with exactly what that cone means. If we could make the cone wider, it would be very wide for this storm. So there are the numbers that uh, Betty showed you, and the key one is this forward speed here at 29 miles an hour, and that is racing, and the atmosphere very often can't keep up with it at that speed, and the systems very often can't intensify quickly at that speed, and that's the expectation. Uh, a little bit of a interesting twist here. We can see up here, there's lots of Sahara dust up here to the north, and we can see there's kind of a notch in the northwest side of it here, and it looks like some of that is getting wrapped into the system. But when we look at the internals of the computer models, it doesn't show that. So that may be a sign the computer models don't quite understand how influential the dust uh, is at this point. All right, so here's the uh, cone close up of what Betty was showing you there. And you see it goes through the, uh, the uh, southern part of the Caribbean islands. Uh, Hurricane Center estimating a 60 mile an hour tropical storm when that happens tomorrow. And then we get uh, south of Puerto Rico. And by the way, these islands to the north here will be affected with the least heavy rain. And there are uh, tropical storm watches up in Haiti. But this is where we get in the Saturday time frame that the big question marks come into play because this is where the models really diverge. Then the cone goes up, and as you've seen, it goes up over Cuba and has Florida in the cone. But that's because there's this very wide range of possibilities, and the models, like I said, are all over the place. From the UK Met that says weak over here to one that doesn't show here, the Europeans shows that it washes out, just gets rid of the system over here to in the middle. So the bottom line is that some models show a very strong storm in the Gulf that could affect the Keys and the western part of Florida. All of us are going to have to watch this here for the next few days. CBS4 Weather with Chief Meteorologist Craig Setz. Well, of course, we're talking about Elsa tonight, a little bit stronger with 50 mile an hour winds, but still moving quickly to the west northwest at 26. No surprises here. This slightly stronger storm was expected as well as this fast motion. We like the fast motion because that kind of tends to limit uh, too much strengthening. Here's the latest future track. It is through the islands tomorrow, starting uh, in Barbados tomorrow morning early and then passing through the Windward Islands during the day. And then it's out of the islands by tomorrow evening. It's been a kind of a stormy few weeks in the islands because of these tropical waves that have been pretty heavy coming through. And then after that, it's on to the northwest. Here is the Saturday evening position. So closest approach to the southern coast of the Dominican Republic as well as Haiti during the day and evening on Saturday. And then Sunday morning approaching Cuba, skirting Jamaica there on this track. And then it's on the slowing down and turning more and more to the northwest there. And, uh, is the turn going to occur sooner? That would put it to the east 
that's possible, but it would also go over more land, so it would likely be weaker. Is the turn going to uh, take a later to turn? Uh, is it going to take place later on in the track here? That would put it over here in the western provinces of Cuba, which are pretty flat and uh, not much transit there across the land, so likely a stronger storm if it ends up on this side. Still too early to tell for sure. It's probably not going to be until Saturday before we know for sure, even Saturday night, where and how close it's going to get to South Florida and the Keys. This evening, tropical storm warnings remain in effect for parts of the windward and leeward islands there and now tropical storm watches for Jamaica, Haiti and a small portion of the southern coast of the Dominican Republic. As we've gone through the evening, a pretty good burst of thunderstorms there. Sometimes these occur kind of almost like on a clock schedule. We call it a diurnal cycle and uh, it'll probably wind down a little bit, but it has helped bring the winds up just a little bit. There's still this very dry air that's going into the system. So what's steering it? There's a blocking high pressure, a real strong one to the east of us. That's giving us this fast motion here. There's a uh, break in the block right here. That's the opportunity opportunity to go north put into motion here with the hurricane centers track there and here we are into Sunday afternoon and this is where how strong is this block here and what does it do to the storm steering currents? If it's weaker, the storm is going to want to turn more to the north. If it's moderately strong, the storm is going to want to go northwest. And if it's staying much stronger, the storms could want to go more west. So lots of questions we just don't know, but that's what we're going to be watching for as we go forward into time here, how it's going to negotiate getting around that blocking high. But also, Florida is in the cone as Elsa approaches over the holiday weekend. Cities like Miami and Tallahassee, Tally, yes, uh, places in between. We all need to be on alert and monitor the forecast. Over 36 million people are in the cone this morning. Let's have a deeper look right now. There's a nice shot, by the way. Uh, pretty nice skies across parts of Florida, but not so nice skies here, closing in on the windward and leeward islands of the Lesser Antilles. This is Tropical Storm Elsa, and there's a lot here. I don't have time to get into all of it, but the thunderstorms are more concentrated near the center. Overall, the satellite appearance and presentation is healthier than it was yesterday. So this is moving through a region where we still expect some strengthening, I think, as we go forward. It is bringing some very squally weather to parts of the Caribbean. And Kelly just showed some of this, but I'm gonna show it again. And it's important to recognize that we have sustained tropical storm force winds at Barbados with 40 mile per hour winds there, gusting to 60. That kind of wind can do some damage depending on the infrastructure and some of the uh, surrounding areas. But overall, this is the kind of weather that is moving through parts of the region that we can expect to see perhaps later on today in St. Lucia and maybe St. Vincent with wind gusts in the 60 to 70 mile per hour range as Tropical Storm Elsa moves westward. Everybody wants to know, a lot of us want to know, where does it go beyond there? Does it move into other parts of the Caribbean and then into the United States? Well, Kelly showed you the comb. And that gives you sort of the historical uh, perspective of Elsa and where it indeed might be tracking sort of toward the northwest and to the north, likely early in the upcoming week. But the models, the individual models, each one of these lines represents a different forecast from the models. They're kind of leaning even a little bit to the left, albeit the European models a bit farther to the right and outside of that. It is pretty much an outlier. When you look at the rest of the guidance, it's leaning toward perhaps an eastern Gulf of Mexico solution, and that brings lots of bad weather into play for Florida early next week. It's a long way off. We know that, Jordan. But I'm showing you the GFS because based on the history, mm -hmm. the GFS last year performed the best model in the track forecast for tropical cyclones, and we are watching it all very carefully as the southeast U.S. next week is in play. More on the breaking news just in from the National Hurricane Center and their intermediate advisory. They upped it to a hurricane. A Category 1, winds around 75 miles per hour. Really no surprise, as Dr. Purcell talked about earlier this morning. In Barbados, they had a sustained wind of 74 miles per hour. That's hurricane status right there, and a gust to 86 miles per hour. And there are reported power outages on the island of Barbados. It is moving so so quickly, especially for a tropical system, west-northwest at nearly 30 miles per hour. So it's going to go right through the Caribbean islands, the Lesser Antilles, the Windward Islands. Uh, look for squally conditions there, the possibility of flooding, of course, with any tropical system as it moves on through. And those tropical storm conditions are likely where you have the tropical storm warnings in effect, including Martinique, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, down towards Grenada, tropical storm watch. Uh, but look over here toward the 
Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, not under any alerts, at least not right now, but over toward the Dominican Republic and portions of Haiti, basically Hispaniola, we are on hurricane watch for the potential of hurricane force conditions. So here is a look at the visible satellite as the sun comes up, the sun's rays shining down on the cloud cover here surrounding the center, pretty organized system. And again, our first hurricane of the Atlantic season, and you can see what it's doing right now to the Caribbean islands with those heavier bands of showers now reaching towards St. Vincent. St. Lucia, you've got some downpours going on as well. The mark that Elsa could leave on some summer destinations in the tropics from the Spice Island to the Sunshine State. Families will have to watch their plans, see if any changes need to be made. It is a holiday weekend, I know, and across the Caribbean as Elsa moves closer to its 4th of July landing spot. All right, the new update is in the 11 o'clock advisory from the National Hurricane Center. So new information that they have going in is they've had their aircraft uh, uh, their Hurricane Hunter aircraft flights. Also, the new model data that came in this morning it is still a Cat 1, still at winds 75 miles per hour. Right now, it is located five miles to the north of St. Vincent. And so, as I mentioned, something really important the Hurricane Hunters do is make that fix of where that center of circulation is. And that, plus weather observations from on the islands and satellite data and radar data all help make that fix of the exact location five miles to the north of St. Vincent. The movement actually has increased by just a little bit, but still very fast to the west northwest at 29 miles per hour. The pressure is down to 995. So that's a decrease from the last advisory as well. All right, so we are watching now at Elsa as it continues to move to the west northwest very fast. It is moving just to the north of St. Vincent, which is right here. The northern part of the island is where the volcano erupted in April. And so that is the area, unfortunately, most susceptible to getting into mud mudslides and flooding. Uh, also so though this very heavy rain is over there right now. So that's certainly a concern. St. Lucia up here on the northern side of this, and it looks like the eye is just the center of circulation is scooting just to the north of St. Vincent and just to the south of St. Lucia. Um, we saw Barbados with winds gusting over 70, over 80 miles per hour. Barbados had sustained winds at hurricane force, and we're still in the squalls actually around Barbados. You can see some of those deeper thunderstorms there on the uh, satellite picture. This is the visible showing you all that convection that's kind of bubbling up. All right, so let's talk more about what's happening with the rain. You know, we have the rain coming down, those bands, those outer bands. How far north do they extend? Um, uh, pretty much south of Guadalupe is where those rain bands do extend and all the way down through the islands. You're at least getting some showers out of that. Grenada is under a tropical storm watch, but hurricane warnings are up for St. Vincent and the Grenadines as well as a tropical storm warning for Martinique. We also have the tropical storm warnings for the DR, for parts of Haiti, other parts of Haiti, that southern portion is under a hurricane watch and a tropical storm watch is up for Jamaica right now. And again, quick look at that forecast. Here's the latest cone we've got now. This is new, an increase in the winds. It is already a hurricane, increase in the winds to 80 miles per hour by tomorrow morning, still acceler accelerating through that time. And we'll watch that. Here is the uh, European model. Let's also go ahead and look at the GFS model again and their differences because are, they are different. In the short term, there's a, there's a lot of agreement, but much more of a difference in the longer term. The uh, specific aspects of the storm, uh, we want to check in with Angie Lastman. She, of course, has uh, been up throughout the course of the night looking to see what uh, the information is about the latest on the storm. Angie. Yeah, Willard, you know, it actually became our first hurricane of the 2021 season, Hurricane Elsa, Category 1, uh, impacting the the leeward and windward islands at this time. Barbados already has started the impacts there, and now it's moving west away from it. You see St. Lucia right here, St. Vincent and the Grenadines still under that hurricane warning as that Category 1 hurricane continues to move west-northwest at a speedy pace of 29 miles per hour. Those winds checking in just barely at Category 1. They're at 75 miles per hour, but either way, it's going to continue that west northwest movement through the Caribbean. It does uh, look like over the next 36 to 48 hours impacting folks in Hispaniola. You can see hurricane warnings in effect at this time for parts of Haiti, the southern portions of Haiti. Uh, hurricane watches for parts of the Dominican Republic and tropical storm warnings and watches there as well. As we move through the weekend into the later parts of the weekend, it looks like by Sunday Cuba could be seeing some impacts there. Winds down, so intensity comes down as it eyes the state of Florida. We are still in that cone of concern, but there are a lot of uncertainties with the forecast down the line as far as impacts for us here in South Florida. A lot still to be determined. We will be watching for those here late into the weekend and seeing the timing Monday into Tuesday. Best bet for us here, but we'll keep you updated on that. Guys.
Tracking also right now on the Weather Channel, I'm meteorologist Chris Warren here in the lab with a look at the very latest. I want to get you caught up right now with what we know about this. Also, what we don't know about this. Here's what we do know. Uh, hurricane conditions uh, are and tropical storm conditions are impacting the Lesser Antilles with more heavy rain, winds and potential storm surge for a lot of the Caribbean islands here, especially the northern part of the Caribbean. And this is what we know. We know there's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty right now uh, as Elsa does approach Florida and or the southeast U.S. Uh, so what we know right now is it's an 85 mile per hour. It's stronger than it was an hour ago, according to the National Hurricane Center. Instead of a 75 mile per hour hurricane, it's an 85 mile per hour hurricane, both category ones, and it's still moving very quickly here. A nice little fast clip at 29 miles per hour. And sometimes when they're moving really fast, these storms essentially have a hard time keeping up with themselves, if you will, and kind of come apart a little bit. Uh, not the case right now, actually getting stronger. And the forecast again can take it. Again, this is the forecast with the errors. The possibility still exists for this to go on the east side of Florida or stay over some warm waters, just clip Cuba and go to the east side or the, the west side of Florida, Florida there in the Gulf. So, uh, and depending on which way it goes too, Chris, or if it goes right up the middle, we'll have a huge impact on how strong it ultimately is in the next uh, few days. Yeah, and for uh, those who are watching, we'll get a new updated track at the uh, main advisory update. That'll be at 5 p.m. We'll get that to you here as quickly as possible on the Weather Channel. These islands that caught that lashing earlier, like Barbados, really very early this morning. So let's get to the projected path on Elsa. And also you can see the intensity forecast from the National Hurricane Center. We'll be tracking it tomorrow as it's moving near that south coast of Hispaniola. And then on Sunday, forecast to move uh, over Cuba or pretty close to Cuba, but over Cuba, we'll say, and then emerge off that northwest coast and up into the uh, eastern part of the Gulf waters. So with this uh, projected path, there still is uncertainty the farther out you go in time. Notice it's forecast to be a hurricane as it comes into Cuba, uh, but then uh, that interaction with land and some unfavorable winds brings it down to a tropical storm. So Brian, we like the idea of maybe once it gets into the vicinity of our area, it's, it's a weaker system, but we have to remind people that we cannot look at this and decide we're not gonna pay attention anymore because more and more we're liking what we're seeing for the moment. Yeah, Betty, that's a very important point because Things can still happen, uh, like we saw this morning. The storm intensified pretty quickly in an environment that did not look especially favorable, and it went to a hurricane, and then it went into an 85-mile-an-hour hurricane. Uh, a large part of that addition is because it's speeding along so fast, but still, uh, just conditions can come together at the wrong time, and the intensity forecast can be quite a, a bit off. Our ability to forecast intensity is not great. So here's the main point of what Betty was talking about there is that 30 mile an hour forward speed. I don't recall that actually with a hurricane in the Caribbean. I'm sure with all the hurricanes that have been there, we've seen that, but I don't remember one recently. In any case, if you think about on the right side, that fast speed is adding to the winds that are blowing with the direction of the hurricane. So if it were in a more normal 15 or 20 miles an hour, this would be down in a 70 or 75 mile an hour uh, type storm. So that 85 is a little bit uh, different than what the total storm is. Okay, here's what the uh, the storm itself is producing. Here's the cone that, that Betty was talking about. Here's the important time period now as we get into uh, late tomorrow into early on Sunday because this is where part of the circulation is going to get involved here with these very tall mountains up here in Hispaniola. Of course, we have mountains here in Jamaica. We have mountains here in southwestern Cuba or southeastern Cuba and uh, those mountains the thinking is are going to affect uh, the circulation of Elsa and be one of the factors to 
uh, cause it to diminish in intensity. And that's why the National Hurricane Center is slowly taking it down as it drives over the Cuban mainland. Now, remembering that two-thirds of the time the system stays in the cone, and about a third of the time it goes out of the cone, and out of the cone can still take it here and kind of avoid the, the landmass, but then it would be out in the Gulf. And that was kind of the idea yesterday that we were afraid of. There's less indication of that uh, in the models here today. The models uh, are closer together, so there's a little more confidence in the direction of the thing, but notice we're still in the cone here in uh, southeast Florida, even though the tracks uh, tend to be over to our west into the Gulf or along the west coast. But remember, the right side of the storm is the storm where the heaviest rain, nastiest weather is. So we're, we're not you know, just forgetting about this. We're just saying we're a little optimistic. It's not going to be a strong storm, and hopefully it'll stay well to the west and not really bother anybody. Here's a little different look at the models. These are the GFS ensembles, they're called. This is like all the possibilities that the GFS uh, model uh, can uh, project, and you see it's still a wide range. So this is some indication of still the uncertainty in the forecast. The kind of good thing here is it shows that most of the uncertainty is well to our west. So we have some optimism that the storm is going to go to the west of us. Does it go far enough west that we don't uh, get the bad weather here? That's uh, the big question. So the steering is still the same. It's this big dip in the jet stream that's going to want to turn it to the north. The thinking is now it'll be a little farther west, so somewhere near the peninsula to in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, most likely. Again, tomorrow being the critical day. And of course, we'll be here to cover it for you. Back with more coming up the next hour. All right, indeed, the latest advisory has just come in, and they're telling us that the uh, hurricane hunters found the system a little weaker, so the winds are down from 85 miles an hour to 80. It is now about uh, 400 miles or so to the east-southeast of Isla Beata, which is that little tip on the southern edge of the Dominican Republic. It is still moving to the west-northwest at 29 miles per hour. So the cone has the system moving as a category one and coming very close there to Haiti and Jamaica and Eastern Cuba, sometimes Saturday and Sunday. Then the Hurricane Center suggests that once the system cuts across Cuba and emerges into the Florida Straits, it'll be down to a tropical storm. And now the cone is uh, nudging a little further west uh, still keeping southwest Florida in the cone of concern. Taking a look at the close-up cone, it will track towards the northwest and uh, possibly impacting that peninsula there of Haiti and then moving in between Jamaica and eastern Cuba on Sunday. And it will impact much of the island of Cuba as a Category 1 and then a tropical storm emerging into the Florida Straits with 65 mile an hour winds and the uh, little edge of uh, Miami-Dade and Broward County is not in the cone of concern but do not let your guard down this just means that the center of the system could be anywhere in the area shaded but we all know that systems are a lot larger than one dot on a map so we could still see some gusty winds and some heavy rain. Speaking of rain, a lot of it impacted the Windward Islands early this morning. Now that rain mass is in the middle of the Caribbean Sea and it continues to track to the west northwest. Key West Florida kicking off this holiday weekend with a chance of a few pop-up storms, which the National Weather Service says will favor any preparations that need to be done ahead of Hurricane Elsa's approach. So get it done while you can. You've got a window of opportunity, and uh, there is that chance that Elsa could at the very least be a high-end tropical storm. But you need to prepare for hurricane. That's what it is right now, and we'll have to see what happens when Elsa interacts with land, including the island of Cuba. So we'll have to see. For now, though, here it is is moving through the Caribbean Sea at a very fast pace for a tropical system. 31 miles per hour. It is a Category 1. Uh, yesterday we did see those winds rise to about 80, 85 miles per hour, but it has weakened somewhat, but it's still a formidable storm, and it did cause quite a bit of damage here in some of the islands like Barbados. They had some power outages where winds gusted as high as 86 miles per hour. So we'll continue to track it. We do have the watches and warnings for Hispaniola, obviously for Jamaica and Cuba. Notice as it goes 
over Cuba, though, we've got mountains that are well over 6,000 feet, especially on the eastern end of the island. So there is that potential we get it knocked down to tropical storm status before it comes back out over the water and approaches the Sunshine State. Here's a look at the alerts that we have. We've got tropical storm warnings for Haiti as well as parts of the coastline, Dominican Republic. And you'll notice that we also have hurricane warnings in effect for portions of Haiti, Jamaica, and a hurricane watch for the eastern side of Cuba. Reynolds? Dr. Postel, you know, we say this every single time, and there are still people who said, well, uh, I wasn't in the code. I was never in the code. And we just could not stress enough. This forecast is going to evolve over the next couple days. And I have a graph for that. Yes, Felicia, you, just because you're not in the cone doesn't mean you're not going to get impacts. That point is so well taken. Paul and Felicia, you guys are exactly right. And here's something to consider. If you're just tuning in, yes, we're dealing with now a tropical storm, uh, no longer hurricane, but it only lost a few miles per hour in the wind speed. So materially, uh, in the wind department, it's you wouldn't notice the difference. But the weather is still very significantly leaning on the east side of it. Look at all the cloud and the rain to the radar's ability to capture it. There's more there, of course. But the center of circulation, or the lowest pressure, is here. Now, when you have a system like that with the lowest pressure there and most of the weather, like, on its edge, clearly, well, that is a sign that this thing is struggling. And that's why you may be tuning in this morning and thinking, wait a minute, I thought we were dealing with a hurricane. Well, we're dealing with something close to it, but it's having a bit of a struggle. It is not sort of uh, oriented vertically. Nothing's aligned in the vertical. Everything is kind of leaned over a little bit. And you can see this leaning as evidenced by this 250 mile per hour extent, excuse me, 250 mile extent of the cloud and rain at least. So this goes to Felicia's point. Yeah, you can track the center all day long, however you want to, but keep in mind hundreds of miles away from it, especially in a situation like this where the system is tilted, do expect the bad weather to extend great distances from that area of lowest pressure or the center of Elsa. Hurricane hunters slicing and dicing their way through. Uh, this is the reason why it was downgraded to a tropical storm is because we didn't find any winds at hurricane force, generally in the 60 to 70 mile per hour range. So that's why the system was officially downgraded in the latest advisory. But the hurricane hunters are still flying. They'll be flying over and over again. And we will indeed watch for signs of intensification, like more thunderstorm activity, kind of like what we're seeing now. And you might be tempted to think, wow, that's a ton of thunderstorms. We got to be dealing with a strengthening system, right? Well, no, going back to that leaning theory, right? The center, the lowest pressure is here on the edge of this thing. The reason why we're seeing the sort of the knees outrun the shoulders, you know, Paul and Felicia have been doing this dance all morning long. Well, the legs are going quickly this way. Remember, this storm is moving at 30 miles per hour, practically faster than I've ever seen a tropical system move. But the winds aloft are not catching up with it. So it's kind of, you know, one of these things where the storms and the clouds are like that tilting back toward the west. And when you have a tilt like that, that is not a sign that this thing is ready to strengthen quickly. But here's the latest Kona, and I do want to show you that now we keep Elsa underneath excuse me, underneath hurricane strength. I want you to keep it here because we have not only the factor of the atmospheric problems that it's got right now, but it's going to be moving over Cuba, which will probably weaken it more, and we will likely find ourselves with a tropical storm in close proximity to Florida early next week, that still, Felicia, as we all know, will bring impacts, and a lot of them with rain, potentially some pretty strong winds, and some coastal flooding as well. All right, South Florida, the 5 p.m. advisory on Tropical Storm Elsa is out, and is out, and we continue with max and sustained winds of 70 miles per hour. A strong tropical storm still moving towards the west northwest across the Caribbean at 28 miles per hour. It's currently located a little less than 130 miles to the southwest of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and it continues to soak in these warm Caribbean waters, but it hasn't been strengthening, and actually we're dealing with a very ragged-looking system this afternoon as compared to 24 hours ago. So when it was just uh, past the Windward Island, 
Island, we saw a strengthening system yesterday, and now today, really not looking all too organized, and it could be some land interaction with the southern coast of um, the island of Hispaniola as it continues to move towards the south, uh, the northwest, and also dealing with some northwesterly wind shear. That means the upper level winds are kind of pushing the tops of the storms out um, away from the center of the storm, so that could also be why it's not looking all too organized this afternoon. So here's the latest forecast cone close up to the south of the island of Hispaniola, and you can see it's moving towards the west northwest over the warm Caribbean waters and we'll be keeping a close eye on any strengthening through the next 24 to 36 hours because it remains over the water. Now, we'll have to keep a close eye on once the interaction with Cuba happens later in the weekend and into the start of the early next week, but there are a couple things I do want to show you. The latest forecast track as of 5 p.m. has shifted a bit more towards the west, so now it's a little farther into the Gulf of Mexico, but you can see most of southeast Florida, all of West Palm Beach, all of Broward County, and all of Miami-Dade, and the Upper Keys are out of the cone. I don't want to center, I don't want to focus on that center icon, though, because if this system were to take a more easterly track and ends up right here on the eastern guidance of the cone. That means we here across southeast Florida would be seeing impacts a little stronger and possibly as early as Sunday evening. So we'll have to keep a close eye on that. Here's the latest on the hurricane and tropical storm watches and warnings still across the island of Hispaniola for Jamaica, also for Cuba and the Cayman Islands. But one thing that is different now with this advisory is that the Florida Keys are now part of these watches and warnings anywhere from Craig Key westward all the way down into the dry Tortugas. As far as the intensity is concerned, that's the part that remains uncertain because with the forecast cone, will it be farther west and remain over the Caribbean waters in the days to come, or will it be farther east and interact with portions of Cuba? That means it could be a weaker system as it approaches the Florida Straits. If it remains over water, it could be a stronger system. Here's what we know right now. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency in 15 counties today. In Surfside, Florida, rescuers suspended a search and rescue operations at the collapsed condo building this afternoon. Officials are quickly preparing for demolition ahead of the storm because strong winds could bring down the rest of the building. At least one death has been reported in St. Lucia and two people were killed in the Dominican Republic after walls collapsed on them according to the country's emergency operations center. Now let's get the latest on tropical storm Elsa and where it's headed from storm specialist Carl Parker. Now it's always interesting when tropical systems get in this part of the Caribbean because there's so many factors at play. Yeah, and you know, a lot of it is land interaction. That's going to be one of the biggest things that we're watching for over the next couple of days here because it is going to be passing along Cuba and then right over Cuba at some point. How much time will it spend over land? What part of the land is it going to be over there? Very tall mountains in southeast Cuba. Will it be close to those? And, you know, the thing spent a lot of the day today not being all that organized. That is now just starting to change a little bit. We're starting to see a little more organization, and that could have something to do with what's happened with the forward speed. For a lot of the day today, it was moving west-northwest at nearly 30 miles per hour. Now, that forward speed has slowed to 23 miles per hour, and so that may be allowing the storm to become, as we say, more vertically stacked. And I'll show you that here in the satellite in just a moment. So here's the forecast track and intensities from the Hurricane Center, and what they're calling for is for the storm to enter interact with land and that weakens the circulation so it drops back to a mid-grade tropical storm at that point then comes back out over the open water has some time to get reorganized as it approaches the west coast of Florida now keep in mind some modeling shows a much weaker system coming off of Cuba so that is something that's possible but right now what we're looking at is the potential for a strong tropical storm to come up along the west coast of Florida and I'll tell you if everything went just right, we certainly could even be talking about a hurricane coming up towards Florida. It looks less likely at this point, but it is a possibility and something we want to keep in mind. Now, this is what I was mentioning earlier. So pay attention to the center of circulation. Early on here, you see it's at the leading edge of all that deep convection. And so the low-level center is racing out 
off to the west, and then the mid-level center is trailing behind that. And so as long as that's the case, the storm is not, as we say, vertically stacked. It's not going to get more organized. But notice what happens just in the last couple of frames. That low-level center starting to slow down a little bit and probably allowing that mid-level center to catch up. So it's starting to become a little bit more vertically stacked. And that probably is a big part of why we're seeing this big blow up this big flare up of thunderstorms near the center and it's got some time now there's going to be more interaction with land it's near Hispaniola but moving away there's Jamaica of course here are the very tall mountains in Cuba so it's possible that it could sort of thread the needle here and then come up over the open water and have some time to continue to get a little bit more organized. Elsa is still a tropical storm tonight as it approaches Cuba. Thanks for being with us. I'm Alina Machado. Just a few hours ago, Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency for parts of the state that could feel the impacts of this storm. Chief Meteorologist John Morales is here now with the latest advisory from the National Hurricane Center. John. Uh, indeed, and the uh, new 11 p.m. advisory, the headline there is that Elsa is even weaker now than it was just uh, three hours ago. Now, Oftentimes, we can let ourselves be guided by satellite pictures of tropical cyclones, and we can determine based on just how many thunderstorms are out there whether it's strengthening or weakening. Well, tonight is not one of those cases, because while you see all these thunderstorms blossoming here to the uh, west, actually over Haiti, to the west and south of Haiti, well, the reality is that Hurricane Hunter aircraft have been flying in this system all evening and have found it to be disorganized and weaker. I step out briefly here just to change sources and show you the latest statistics on uh, Elsa, which has winds down to 65 miles per hour. Look at that central pressure, 1,004 millibars, super weak, really, uh, when we're talking about tropical storms. Uh, it is, however, slowing down, moving west-northwest at 17 miles per hour. You might recall at one point it had reached 31 miles per hour, a new record for how fast a tropical storm or hurricane can move. As a matter of fact, that's what eventually hurt this system because it had reached winds of 85 miles per hour, but it was moving so very quickly that the low level center of circulation ended up detached from all these thunderstorms that you see here. And right now it continues to be kind of a tilted system. It's a fragile system and that's really important. Elsa is very fragile tonight despite the amount of rain that it's producing across uh, Haiti tonight. I should mention there's been two deaths in the Dominican Republic directly linked to Elsa because of rain and winds. Uh, hopefully none will come from Haiti or Cuba or Jamaica as it moves towards the northwest. Eventually, though, thanks to the steering currents of high pressure to the east and an incoming front from the northwest, Elsa will be near Cuba, traversing Cuba much of the day tomorrow, and then by Monday, head into the Gulf of Mexico. But here's the deal. It is so fragile tonight that this interaction with Cuba is more than likely going to weaken the system very much further. Right, let's have a look at the bigger picture and show where Elsa is. Tropical storm Elsa, now 60 mile per hour tropical storm, north of Jamaica, south of Cuba. That's where the center is. But the cloud pattern extends well beyond that, as does the weather. We know that winds over 25 miles per hour sustained winds, at least according to the modeling that we're getting, does does suggest that those kind of winds extend outward hundreds of miles away, especially on the east side of the circulation. So this, again, like a lot of others, will extend the weather impacts way beyond where the center of circulation ultimately goes. But where the center of circulation ultimately goes does matter because whether or not it's over land or water, if it's over water, it will have some opportunity to strengthen, but it's, it's on the struggle bus right now. There's no doubt about that. Um, as I mentioned, the winds are really not all that strong. The hurricane hunters are in there. I'll show you in a second. And we are getting some winds, generally speaking, around parts of the Caribbean in the 20 to 30 mile per inch. Earlier at Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay, we saw wind gusts over 50 miles per hour. And like I said, the winds over 25 miles per hour, sustained winds, according to the models, extend way out over the uh, waters. So here's what we're looking at right now. You might think, okay, well, there's plenty of big thunderstorms there, right? Why is this thing not getting organized? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's things in the interior 
I don't want to get into the weeds, but there are things in the interior that are not cooperating with one another. There's some infighting going on, despite its rather you know, impressive appearance in places. The convection, though, is not particularly durable. You need that thunderstorm activity to last more than a few hours before it falls apart in order to get you know, some real chance at strengthening. But let me tell you what the hurricane hunters are finding. And they're finding that the surface pressures are pretty high. This 10, 12 millibar reading was where there was a wind at about 10 knots or so near the surface. So it's actually perhaps a little bit lower than that. That drop sign wasn't quite in that exact center. But you get the idea. 1,012 millibars, what? Are you kidding me with a system that looks like this? Yeah. It's just not working on the inside, and we'll try to uh, figure that out as we go forward. But there were some pretty decent winds in the 60 mile per hour range uh, in the inbound and outbound rides toward that center. Felicia. Certified meteorologist Luke Doris and Hurricane Specialist Brian Norcross are both here. And let's start with Luke with the latest. Luke. Well, Elsa is still a tropical storm. Its winds have held steady at 60 miles per hour throughout much of the day. It's bottled up along the southeast coast of Cuba, moving northwest at about 14 miles per hour. Generally, the forecast is it maintains its strength as we go through tonight, tomorrow as it straddles near and along Cuba. And by tomorrow afternoon, emerging into the Florida Straits, making its closest passage to the Florida Keys Monday night, early Tuesday, most likely overnight, and potentially as a healthy tropical storm with winds to 60 miles per hour. Looks like the greatest impacts will be felt in the middle and lower keys. This is where sustained 40 plus mile per hour winds are possible, thus the tropical storm warning. It's a possibility that we see some sustained winds beyond 40 miles per hour in the watch area for the upper keys. Let's bring in our hurricane specialist, Brian Norcross. Uh, Brian, more or less looks like the forecast is on track for what we can expect in South Florida. Would you agree? I agree. The uh, bit of a question mark about uh, what's going to happen as it moves over Cuba, though. We're not 100% sure about that, how much it's going to weaken. Uh, then one of the things is that it's slowed down to 14 miles per hour now. That means as it goes over Cuba, it's going to be there longer, which may mean a weaker storm on the north side. But we'll be ready for that so good solid tropical storm. Look at the radar uh, echoes coming out of the Key West radar, just showing you the storm is getting closer. The other thing I want you to notice is look at the, the clouds here rotating in on the right side. Most of the weather is well to the right of the center. One of the things to notice down here, look at this jog it did in the track. That kind of delayed it, so it's a little bit behind the schedule that we were talking about yesterday, but it is still coming on more or less uh, the same track. So here's the cone, and there it goes over Cuba, and uh, you can see that uh, overnight tonight it goes over Cuba, and it's still there through the day tomorrow, finally coming into the Straits of Florida late tomorrow. So that's a good time over the Cuban land with a weakening storm, and that band back here is over the mountains. So. Uh, it's going to have some uh, tough going, I think, over Cuba. And then for timing over us, here you see right near the Keys, uh, somewhere to the west of the Keys, in overnight tomorrow night, and then up into the west coast of the state, where they'll have to watch it. In terms of the strong winds, here are the odds. Most likely in the Keys, in the bright yellows. Slight chance of tropical storm force, 40 mile an hour or higher winds on the southeast coast. So slight chance Miami, Dade and Broward, more likely in the Keys is what we're seeing. The models keeping it the center well to the west of the Keys, but remember the bad weather is to the east of the center. That's why the Keys are our focus here. And so the bottom line is for the Keys, what we're saying is tropical storm force winds at times in the lower and middle Keys, uh, maybe in the 40, 50, up to 60 mile an hour range with gusts. Uh, just some gusts over 40 in the upper Keys, up to six inches of rain possible in some spots in the Keys. On the southeast coast, Miami, Dean, and Broward, some bands of heavy rain, but not continuous, gusty winds in the rain, and maybe two to three inches of total rainfall. That's what we see. So, especially our focus uh, on the Keys. Pay attention to all the advice that they're from Monroe County if you are down in the Keys. So with that said, Alina, I'm going to send it back to you in the studio. And Jawan, we are also keeping a close eye on Elsa as it approaches Cuba. A tropical storm warning is now in effect for parts of the Florida Keys. South Florida's chief meteorologist, John Morales, has the brand new 11 p.m. advisory. John.
That's right, uh, Alina. We'll look at the satellite picture here and not a lot of new news with this. It remains pretty disorganized. It does have a burst tonight of some thunderstorm activity, so the pressure has dropped slightly, although the pressure remains well above what you would expect to see in any tropical storm. Uh, and uh, we are seeing a northwest movement as forecast. So there's the satellite picture this evening. The burst of thunderstorm activity is right around here. So uh, there is some some attempt yet again to get thunderstorms wrapping around a low level center of circulation and trying to get uh, a, a storm that is stacked vertically as opposed to being tilted with, you know, the low level center in one spot and the mid level center uh, displaced in another. And that's the way it's really been for the last couple of days. Well, tonight, uh, trying to see some of that uh, uh, stacking going as it remains right now over waters that are quite warm here uh, just to the south of Cuba. So trying to strengthen just a bit, uh, not out of the question that it could be right at the edge of hurricane strength before it, it makes actual landfall uh, here in parts of Cuba. And therefore tonight, uh, a hurricane warning was, has been issued for parts of Cuba. Uh, the provinces of Cienfuegos and Matanzas are both uh, under a hurricane warning over, uh, as an abundance of caution uh, for that area. And that was issued by the Cuban government. Now, I'm going to show you as I switch sources here what the latest statistics are. With the wind speeds are up to 65 miles per hour now on Elsa. It's got a pressure which had been at 1,005 millibars at 8 p.m., now down to 1,004. Again, this uh, quite unusual for a, hurric a storm rather to have uh, pressure so high and the movement towards the northwest at about 15 miles an hour. Again, you look at this uh, in the greater scheme of things and you can definitely tell just in plain view how disorganized the system is. I'll mention a couple of other things about uh, disorganization here. Uh, the winds at Montego Bay uh, this evening are, are coming in from the southeast. All right. I mean, the wind there should be southwest if this was a, a large circulation, uh, even at Cayman Brack, which is kind of hard to find on this map. But Cayman Brack has southeast winds, not a northwest wind. So so this is a tiny system. Despite the winds being 65 miles an hour, it is a system that should struggle as it goes over Cuba, even going through the flatter portion of Cuba because the mountains are out here. The mountains are over here or there's a little bit of mountainous terrain right here. But let's say it goes right through here. The flatter section here. Well, the, it still gets cut off from all the moisture at the surface and it should still weaken. Uh, even having reached almost hurricane strength, it should weaken again as it comes out into the Florida Straits, and that's expected to happen tomorrow afternoon. Quick view at the computer forecast models. Uh, we only have one left here on the eastern side. We know this is going to go into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the level of confidence, confidence in that is now very, very high, and that's why the cone of concern is a little bit narrower now, right? I mean, you look at it uh, as it comes into Cuba. There is your strong tropical storm at 70 miles per hour, disorganized, but a good wind of 70 miles per hour. And then you see it down to 60 as it exits Cuba tomorrow. Uh, still daylight, but in the early evening there and then going past uh, Key West. Notice the upper and middle Florida Keys outside of the cone of concern at this moment. So the upper Florida Keys have a tropical storm watch. The middle Keys are under a tropical storm warning, but uh, your effects are going to be on the active or dirty side of the system as it passes to your west. Again, that would be on Monday night. Now, I've got a lot more to say about this, including what impacts you can expect in Key West and the lower keys, what impacts you can expect in Miami. We'll have a lot more of that coming up uh, during the course of the newscast. Back to you. Well, we know impacts from Elsa is moving into the Keys, Key West specifically today. Looking at the radar, I got a little bit of showers to the south and to the east of Key West. But we got Weather Channel's meteorologist Paul Goodlow joining us now live from Key West. And Paul, you know, big question is we just got done with a big holiday. Uh, lots of people out yesterday looking at your view. It was beautiful. Are the tourists leaving or are they sticking around? Well, some already had plans to leave today, uh, Jordan, and the ones that are, it's a great morning. It's a quiet morning. By the way, the fireworks display here in Key West, fantastic. I got a mental note, come back when I'm not covering the tropical storm to come enjoy this. 
and some chickens just walked by our live shot here, which <laughs> this place is known for. Anyway, let's talk about Elsa, and behind me by about 90 miles is uh, Cuba. Elsa is just coming towards Cuba, and if you look through these palm trees, about 200 miles, we'll start seeing that northern center of uh, Elsa, but it's still about to come into Cuba, then across Cuba, then into the Florida Straits, and then pass by us to the west. We're already seeing some of the cloud structure, some of the higher cloud structure, and even some of the, the shear going on, some of the steering flow aloft, which will eventually uh, bring Elsa across Cuba, and then hopefully, keep it west of us here in Key West, and eventually it starts uh, threatening the southwestern and western coast of Florida. But here in Key West, we are, are definitely preparing, including the governor is preparing for a state to be hit this year with our first tropical storm here in Florida. It's important to remind Floridians, in the last four years, we've had more people die from carbon monoxide poisoning than from direct impacts from the storms that we've dealt with, and we've dealt with a number of them. So the reminder is, in a storm like this where you could see sustained power outages, if you do have a generator, you have to operate that generator uh, so that the exhaust is outside. You can't put it inside your house, you can't put it inside your garage. And we're really hoping there won't be a big need for people to start their generators because uh, we're hoping that it could be kind of a head towards later on tonight and overnight and tomorrow morning. Kind of a showery, rainy day here across Key West. Far less rain up the Keys, upper Keys on towards South Florida, which is good news for the recovery effort still going on in Surfside. But southwestern Florida and western Florida, We'll see more impacts, and Jordan, we all are concerned about uh, kind of that central west coast of Florida. They are definitely surge prone, more so than here uh, on right. the Keys. Something we'll definitely watch as Elsa comes across Cuba and heads on towards Florida as we head throughout tonight and tomorrow. Jordan? Well, Paul, you're going to get a very clear view of what Key West has to offer from the beautiful sunshine, summer-like weather yesterday to tropical storm force winds, potentially, maybe as soon as this evening. All right, Kelly, let's get it over to you. All right, search and rescue operations are set to resume at a collapsed condo building in Surfside, Florida today. Last night, crews actually demolished the standing section of the structure. This is a live look, by the way. Fears that Tropical Storm Elsa would bring down the unstable building made it unsafe for workers at the site. The last part of the Surfside condominium building has been demolished. That section came down ahead of possible high winds from Tropical Storm Elsa. But officials say this will create a bigger debris pile, increasing their chances of finding more remains. Bringing down this building in a controlled manner is critical to expanding our scope of the search and rescue effort and allowing us to explore the area closest to the building, which has currently not been accessible to our first responders. Rescuers promise the mission to find the missing will intensify as crews try and stabilize the rubble ahead of the storm. We are, of course, continuing to monitor Tropical Storm Elsa. Uh, we'll cross Cuba and end up approaching Florida, uh, likely sometime Monday afternoon uh, or evening. On this day, when millions of Americans are celebrating, there's more work and heartache here. This is not an Independence Day like any we have ever experienced before. After over 10 days of searching, there is still no closure for so many family members. The video is all I see when I close my eyes, because um, to me, that's, that's the moment I'm watching my mom and my grandmother die. And now, at least six rescuers have tested positive for COVID-19, complicating a difficult mission even more. So now it's just too dangerous for residents of the Champlain Towers to retrieve their possessions from the standing units before that demolition occurred. So that means furniture, clothing, jewelry, photos, all those family keepsakes were lost in that demolition last night. The bodies of 24 people have now been recovered, but we still have about 121 still missing. We're now going on, I think, 11 days since this horrible yeah, thing happened. So hard. A lot of visitors, a lot of family members down in that area, too. And they're not just watching what's happening there at the site, but they got to pay attention to the deteriorating weather conditions. Thanks so much for joining us. Elsa brings a, a host of problems as it steams towards the Sunshine State. You got Barbados, Dominican Republic. They took the brunt of the tropical fury with down trees and high water crashing through neighborhoods. Now the next stop, that's going to be uh, the Keys where alerts are up.
will likely extend to both sides of Florida as well. Cuba in line and dealing with it now, and you can clearly see there it is, uh, getting ready to make that uh, push on shore here across central portions of Cuba, bringing the heavy rain, the gusty winds, and then eventually making its way in towards the Florida Straits. Jen, you've got a bit more on what's yeah. going on with this system. Well, I want to take a look at the visible satellite actually now that uh, we have a full view of what's happening. And you get the same perspective actually as the infrared when you see the visible. Everything's happening on the east side of the Elsa circulation. And you can see this over here. Look out. You know, these are where the thunderstorms are bubbling up. So the eastern side of the circulation is where all the action is going to be. Hurricane hunters are actually in right now flying through and you'll see well you know we get to the western side there's not very much in the way of strong winds <clears throat> and there's obviously not very much in the way of thunderstorm activity either so it's all about what's happening on that eastern side and if, after these last two seasons I feel like every single storm is at some kind of this is not normal type of uh, aspect to it right and so I think not normal is normal these days isn't that isn't that the truth now here's a look at some of the uh, the readings and the observations um, is these winds that they're finding up over hurricane force that are up at flight level. So when you bring that down to the ground, it is less. And so certainly, you know, with all this activity on the eastern side, but hardly anything on the western side, that's going to be a feature that we watch as Elsa tracks farther north, simply because what's on the eastern side? Florida, right? So as this tracks over Cuba today, we're going to be in the worst side of the storm here across portions of the Keys and up into western Florida as well. Concern, obviously, with these live pictures, folks with umbrellas, but we're expecting more of the uh, severe weather later this afternoon through the morning hours. But we've got an expert here who has the answers on all that. Let's get to First Alert meteorologist Angie Lasmet, who has a closer look at the storm this midday. Angie. Yeah, guys, so we still are keeping an eye on exactly what these impacts will be here down the line, but you've got the timing right late tonight into tomorrow morning is the best chance for us to see some impacts here, but we'll still see some unsettled weather here over the next two days, essentially next 48 hours. So let's get you that latest advisory on Elsa. This should say tropical storm Elsa, but either way, 65 miles per hour moving northwest at 14 miles per hour. Here's those tropical storm warnings that are in effect. It's just to the south of Cuba right now. So through the day today, we'll see it impacting folks in Cuba, bringing heavy rain portions of that area, possibly some isolated tornadoes, some storm surge conditions as well with those tropical storm warnings in effect. For us here in uh, South Florida, we have the lower and middle keys in that tropical storm warning. You see the tropical storm watch in, uh, in effect for the upper keys and then up the west coast of Florida. So here's that latest track. It continues to move just to the north and then eventually to the northwest, still maintaining its tropical storm strength here as it goes up the coast of Florida. Now the timing again, for folks in the Keys, it'll be just to the west of Key West here as we get into the early morning hours tomorrow. Eventually, it does impact the Carolinas here uh, in the northern portions of the, the west coast of Florida uh, and points north of that. Breaking now, we have landfall. Our first one, Tropical Storm Elsa, made landfall 85 miles southeast of Havana, Cuba, thereabouts, as a tropical storm at 60 miles per hour, pressure roughly 1,007 millibars. This just in from the Hurricane Center. So it's breaking news, and that will will continue to bring some gusty winds and flooding rain to parts of Florida for the next several hours at least, and then it's on northward from there. Here's the latest advisory, 60 miles per hour in the wind speed, moving northwest at 14. Again, it's a lot slower. If you're just tuning in and you're comparing its forward motion now versus what it was a few days ago, they're not even comparable. It was hauling at about 30 a few days ago. Now it's slowed down a lot with the expectation falling basically along the same path that we've thought all along. As Tropical Storm Elsa, as a tropical storm over the eastern Gulf of Mexico, likely making landfall again somewhere in North Florida Wednesday morning. But bringing bad weather well in advance and well outside of the cone as we go forward for the next 48 hours. There's roughly the latest position, and you can see a lot of the thunderstorm and uh, bad squally weather is along and to the east of where the center is right now. Keep that in mind. I do believe that may indeed continue to be the case going forward. So. That brings up east side of Florida as well for some significant impacts. Right now, speaking of impacts, this outer rain band, this leading one really, has brought wind gusts to nearly 40 miles per hour across parts of the Florida Keys. We'll see those winds and gusts increase in Homestead, in Perrine, in Kendall, in Miami, on up north through, through Fort Lauderdale. Eventually, over the next few hours, these outer bands are going to be moving through, bringing some pretty squally weather. Then the weather will be pretty nice after it moves by. 
and then get squally again. Kind of up and down we go, but with an upward, upward trend uh, throughout the night and into tomorrow. Uh, one of the reasons why it looks the way it does, and one of, one of the reasons why we're seeing such uh, strong outer rain bands propagating away from Elsa is because there's a lot of dry air aloft, aloft, like maybe 10, 15,000 feet and up nearby, getting into, I think, some of the circulation, eroding it a little bit from west to east. Now, what that does is that it cooler, drier air will initiate downdrafts, and that's exactly what we're seeing move away from Elsa right now, right out here on that leading edge. So we're going to see a couple of more of those guys come through as Elsa moves on northward. Well, right now, taking a look out of our tower cameras all across South Florida, I mean, take your pick. It doesn't look good pretty much all the way around. You can't even really make out what you're seeing with some of those cameras. So things have changed clearly, right? We went from sunshine to this gloomy weather, Luke. Things went downhill quickly with that strong band coming through, producing severe weather across parts of Miami-Dade County. Let's get to work on this. We have several warnings. There are three warnings for Miami-Dade County that I want to go through with you. First off is a tornado warning. This means that we're seeing rotation on the radar in central uh, and northwestern parts of Miami-Dade County. So near Hialeah, I'm going to show you where I think it is right now in just a minute. But if you're in this red box, Take cover because there's the potential that a tornado could drop. It would be brief. It would be very fast moving. These are very difficult to track because they happen so quickly and in between radar scans, especially if you're in and north of Hialeah. I recommend that you uh, take cover there. That goes until 4 o'clock in the evening. This is where the, the rotation that we see. I know this doesn't look like much to you probably, but where you see the colors change here, that's where it's weak, but it's there and it could drop a brief tornado. So right around Hialeah, moving to the north rapidly at about 30 miles per hour. So that would clip potentially the western portion of uh, Broward County if it does hold together. Here's some arrival times, roughly 4 o'clock for Miramar, 410 for Southwest Ranches, although I think it's going to go back out into the interior after that if it stays on its current trek. Elsewhere, we do have the severe thunderstorm warning, so embedded in strong squalls in the long feeder bands that we have off of Elsa is the tornado warning, but throughout the orange box for much of Miami-Dade County, it uh, also goes till 4 o'clock. This is where we can see winds to 60 miles per hour outside of the rotation. And one more. This is the third one. We have a flood advisory. We've already seen really heavy rain set up, so we may see flooding in parts of central and southeastern Miami-Dade County. That goes until 630. We're going to have more of those flood advisories as the day wears on. So there it is. Real nasty line that's pushing through, quickly going to exit out of Miami-Dade and go up into Broward County. Not a whole lot happening here yet. There's a thin little line of non-severe weather going through Broward. Pull the view out. This is it. That's band number one. But as I mentioned, it's not going to last all that long. Back behind it, this is the bottom edge of it. That will lift to the north, and then we will catch a break. Give it about an hour or so. That's what we had in the Keys earlier, where this line came through. Watch that. Middle and upper Keys was pretty rough, and then they caught the break. All right, so this is all tied to Tropical Storm Elsa, which is down here. This is band number one. There's band number two and then three and four tied closer to the center of it. Now, as the outer bands of Elsa are trying to stretch to Florida, one question is the timing of the storm as it moves a little bit closer. So we want to get right to our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Knapp, for a closer look. And Dr. Knapp, not a big surprise that uh, the numbers went down a little bit in terms of uh, the intensity, but that could change again with time. Yeah, and I think it will because the reduction in the advisory intensity is just kind of an assumption because the circulation center has come over land and you know, probably made landfall southern coast of Cuba around 2 p.m. Eastern time today. But we are going to have a Hurricane Hunter plane taking off, uh, you know, right about now if uh, everything's on schedule, and they'll fly into the storm uh, as it is coming off the north co north coast of Cuba over the next few hours. So I expect uh, at some point, maybe not right away, but later tonight into tomorrow, that the winds will come back up as it moves northwestward. Now, in terms of the overall environment other than the land interaction that it is dealing with there's still relatively weak wind shear overhead but this troughing over the gulf of mexico is probably going to limit its intensification not prevent it completely because we've got pretty warm water. It went over really warm water and is still tapping into some of that south of Cuba, but the waters over the Gulf are plenty warm as well. So now let's check in uh, more closely on the storm itself, on the visible imagery. So, you know, it is centered over land, but there's still a lot of water on both sides of Cuba that's really warm that this is tapping into. So the circulation center uh, is in here uh, near the Gulf de Batabano. That's this little batch of water there uh, in Cuba, but 
it is partially circulation is over water to the north, partially to the south. And again, tropical storms are not just a point on the map. Now, it looks like the circulation center is about right in there, but here's Key West. And if you look on the north side, uh, we've already had plenty of outer rain bands combined with a little bit of the heating of the day. So you can see the radar is picking up the mid-level uh, circulation over Cuba. But this stuff is far flung, but it's been fairly potent at times. Uh, a lot of lightning. And and uh, some gusty winds and some locally heavy rainfall. And look at all these gusts that have pushed 50 miles an hour in many portions, not just at the coast, but even inland. Pembroke Pines, 44 miles an hour. So it's kind of like tropical storm, outer band induced uh, strong to you know borderline severe thunderstorms. And we've had some heavy rain there in southeastern Florida. And it's all open exposure from the Atlantic. So on the Atlantic side, even in these outer bands, uh, it's pretty potent. We normally would have had uh, the plane in there before 8 p.m. for the intermediate public advisory, but the center, uh, with it still being over land, pushed back the takeoff a little bit. Uh, so the Air Force plane is still in transit. They're now over the southeastern Gulf, and it won't be long before they get into the storm here, maybe within the hour or so, uh, maybe even a little less, uh, to get into the center, depending on exactly where it is. They're basically going to go there and intercept the center of the tropical storm as it leaves northern Cuba. And with a flight at night and near land and spotty convection in a tropical storm, they have to take extra steps to keep the flight safe, but they're going to collect the data as best they can. Now, uh, the last few visible images of the day show how we have the blow-ups of convection in spotty locations, but where it's coming down, uh, rain-wise, it's coming down heavy. So we're very concerned about flooding in Cuba, center of circulation right before sunset, somewhere in here between Havana and Matanzas, but really coming down to the east there in Cologne. You can see those overshooting tops coming off the north coast. Here's the radar from Florida where you can see the circulation center, at least aloft, very near the north coast. So the plane will be coming in here and getting as close to the coast as they can and see if they can intercept that center and get a central pressure and start measuring the winds on this strongest northeastern side. Now this is the stuff where the tropical storm conditions are. That will be arriving in the Keys maybe a little bit after midnight. So these gusts that have exceeded 30 miles an hour will be on the increase, no doubt about it. Uh, the thunderstorms that were fueled in part by the heating of the day are waning over South Florida, but everybody's going to have their weather going downhill. Uh, overnight tonight into tomorrow, gusting 60 miles an hour plus in Key West, even though the center will be west of there. And then the southwest coast of Florida up into Tampa by this time tomorrow night, going to be getting the tropical storm conditions and the storm surge and the flooding. It's going to be a rough Tuesday, Mike. Here it is tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening. Our weather will get worse in South Florida and then gradually get better by tomorrow evening. After that, it's on up the coast and then makes landfall probably up in the Big Bend, some area sometime on Wednesday morning. And then it's on zipping off to the northeast and not going to be a big deal. All right, so let's break it down a little bit with what's going on with the storm tonight. There it is. Hurricane Hunters did what we call beach patrol, flying along there looking for the center to come off of Cuba. It has the Hurricane Hunters only take observations when they're over water. That's why they fly the coast like that. When you look at it right away, you're like, well, it's down here, right? No, no, no. It's up here. In fact, it's up here now. That's the latest advisory position. There's this odd little thing of thunderstorms down here, but the whole thing is a bit lopsided, and I'll show you that as well in a second. Here's the water vapor loop. That brown area is dry air, and there's southwesterly winds here. That's wind shear. That's what should limit limit strengthening despite the fact it's going to be over very warm water. Now here's the real lopsided look at it. There's the center. Look at all the bad weather. It's basically from the center east. So the center goes due north. All that bad weather comes through the Keys and we're going to get some bad weather here in South Florida too. We've already had some pretty good storms offshore. Look at this line coming up. It is going to be a stormy night in South Florida. Bye. The one and only Local 10 News starts right now. The tropical storm Elsa closing in near the Keys after hitting Cuba yesterday afternoon. Heavy rains flooding towns, causing some rivers to overflow there. And now all eyes here in Florida. Hi, South Florida. I'm Eric Yetzi. And I'm JC Birch. We have our uh, Weather Authority meteorologist Julie Durda. She's in the Weather Authority Center with the latest on Elsa's track. You know, the whole state of Florida is watching this system because it's not just a threat for South Florida. It's expected to ride up the West Coast and make landfall 
later this week across northern Florida. Let's talk about the immediate threats for us. Wow, this system very lopsided, but a lot of moisture. Look at all this moisture associated with the system on the northeastern edge, the eastern and southeastern edge. All of that, yes, my friends, is headed our way. We've already been dealing with some of the rain bands, but as of the 5 a.m. advisory, winds of 60 miles per hour. The movement is north northwest at 12 miles per hour. Something to note, it's about 50 miles southwest of Key West. As we mentioned earlier, we are not expecting a direct hit in Key West. The forecast cone keeps the center of the system just west of Key West, but you saw how much moisture is on the eastern edge of the system, so the impacts are going to be felt not just this morning, but even as the system passes by later today, it's going to be a very rainy, wet, soggy day. So we are concerned about the possibility of those tropical downpours. And the lower key is not catching a break. A live look at Key West, where rain continues to soak the streets. And in Dade County, rain bands crossing several cities with more to come. From Broward to Monroe County, more wind and rain is in the forecast. And you're going to want to be careful on your drive this morning. It's going to be a messy commute. Let's head straight over to meteorologist Vivian Gonzalez with the latest on Tropical Storm Elsa. Viv. That's right. And in West Miami Dade, we have a pretty strong thunderstorm moving in, and that's due to one of the outer feeder bands from Elsa that's about 50 miles to the southwest of Key West. And it finally made a northward turn, and it's moving to the north northwest at 12 miles per hour. Sustained wind are up to 60 miles per hour, but it's a very lopsided system and the wettest side, the eastern half soaking the Florida Keys right now. So here's where the center of the storm is located and you can see that the rains will be relentless and constant around Key West, Boca Chica, even Stock Island. There is a big pine key, Kudjo key getting a good batch of rain and it's going to get heavier very soon to from the south to the north and Marathon seeing some lightning. We move on into Miami-Dade County. There's a strong thunderstorm about 13 miles northwest of Homestead General Airport, and it could produce funnel clouds. It's moving through Miccosukee, Shark Valley, Observation Tower, noticing some strong gusty winds, and because there could be funnel clouds with this activity through 715, there is a significant weather advisory. Well, good morning and welcome back into Weather Nation. We're looking out into Miami, Florida. This is on the eastern side of South Florida where overcast skies and impacts from Tropical Storm Elsa already moving in. We're joined now by the director of the National Hurricane Center, Ken Graham. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit about the forecast and what we can expect because right now the system is passing to the west of the Keys. It is. I mean, west of the Keys, you can see the center right here, and it's, it's continuing to move that north-northwest direction. We expect that to be more north and eventually even northeast with time. So all this rain, I mean, you think about with the center being here, so much rain on that, that east side, the right-hand side of the storm, and with time continuing to move over the, the warm waters of the Gulf and reaching portions of central Florida tomorrow morning. So that's where we have this, you know, we're looking at most of the coastline with the potential of getting that, those tropical storm force winds with this warning area. But we do have an area in here with a hurricane watch where we could see hurricane force winds. So we're gonna be watching that so closely, but in time, it just keeps on going. So Wednesday afternoon, we're close to the Georgia um, line there. And then by Thursday afternoon, already into North Carolina. So Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, gotta watch out for the, the winds. You gotta watch out for that heavy rain. Speaking of heavy rain, uh, a lot of people, when they hear landfall, they think that's when the impacts will be, but the rain is out there already. And as this rides the coast, uh, the rain is still gonna be very tropical with that that forecast, you know, kind of giving us that chance for flooding risks. Yeah, it really is. And it just, you know, going back to the radar before looking at, at the rain, look how far that stretches from the center. You're already seeing rain Fort Myers, Naples, and the Keys well away from that center. So just because this system is, is offshore and just because we start thinking about it further um, away from you, that you're still going to see the rain. It's such a large area. You can't focus just on that point. Look at the tornado risk. So that you have a tornado risk, a slight chance in those, those rain bands. You can see some of those. And I want to highlight a couple areas of, of concern because I mean, you think about the heavy rainfall anywhere around the Tampa area back towards Fort Myers, a moderate risk of seeing some flash flooding in those areas, but not just Florida. Charleston, 
back towards just north of Jacksonville, including Savannah, some areas there that can see some of these, this tropical rainfall. So any areas you can see, Florida back through the Carolinas, just efficient rainfall, this tropical rain uh, droplets so close together, you can see this uh, rainfall totals pile up really quickly. And it's not just freshwater flooding, it's also the surge flooding and the inlets in the bays. Those are ones that we're looking a little bit closer at because that's where maybe some of the highest surge is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And we were looking at some of the inundation ma mapping a little while ago, Tampa Bay, some of those traditional areas could get several feet of water in MacDill Air Force Base, um, you know, some of these areas. But if you back out a little bit and look at the big picture, you can see some of the values. I mean, just three to five feet in some of these areas where the water gets trapped. Tampa Bay, the water enters the bay, and some of those traditional places that a lot of times the, some of the, the parks, some of those low-lying areas will see some water. But listen to the local officials because that water really piles up real quickly. And you can see the Osceola River down to Bonita Beach where we have that storm surge warning, the water gets trapped in some of these areas and it's not just on the coastline, the Suwannee River, that water will come up the Suwannee River and flood a lot of those low lying areas miles and miles inland. Well, thank you so much, Ken. Always great speaking with you. Um, we're going to be checking in throughout the rest of the day today. We're going to take the viewers to the radar now and kind of talk a little bit about what else is ongoing because we mentioned everything. We mentioned the tornadoes, the surge, as well as the flooding concerns. And as we put this into motion over the last hour, again, can mentioning it, you can see where the uh, center of circulation is. The only reason we can't see the western side is because our radars just don't go out that far. But again, the, the center of circulation is just to the west of the Florida Keys at this point, but impacts still widespread across the Keys and heavy rain still Ongoing. Welcome back to America's Morning Headquarters. I'm meteorologist Paul Goodall live in Key West, Florida here. Uh, Elsa is still well to the west of us, now treading just north of uh, due west here. It's passing us by the center, that is. But all this is also Elsa. And pretty impactful winds and rain and lashing the lower keys here all night long and now all morning long here. Again, this is a heavily weather-laden east side of that center. It can just push on in. The airport here in Key West is open, but uh, 11 of the roughly 20 flights scheduled for today have been canceled. And speaking of cancellations, Tampa International Airport shutting down all operations after 5 p.m. today. So uh, that's a big impact. A lot of people use Tampa as a jumping off point, even for or, or Orlando and other uh, kind of attractions there in Central Florida. Uh, if you have a flight after 5 o'clock today, you might have to find alternate plans of getting uh, into the Tampa area or wherever you're trying to go uh, after that. Here across the Keys, we've been seeing a pretty drastic change in the waters of the Atlantic and heading out towards the uh, Florida Straits here. You can easily see white caps uh, this morning here, where yesterday morning it was just getting a little choppy, a little rough as the winds increased throughout the morning. And even two days ago, it was glass smooth. There were people paddle boarding quite comfortably out here with a very little wind, a very little wave action. That has changed dramatically as now the center of, of El emerged off of uh, the island of Cuba and is trying to get reorganized. Some of the forecasts from the National Hurricane Center is calling for a strengthening of the system as it approaches uh, the west coast of Florida here, although that strengthening is still going to bring more impacts here across the lower keys. This is going to be a, a washout day, at least the good first half of it here across the keys in terms of outdoor activities. We have a producer uh, driving around the island reporting Roads are starting to get some water. Some are borderline uh, undrivable, so the word is just stay put. This is not the time to go out, hey, I want to drive around a tropical storm. You're just asking for potential problems of uh, things being blown around as well as this type of intense rainfall and the wind pushing the rain and water and preventing it from draining out. We're starting to see water rise, Kelly. So uh, uh, flash flooding, even here on Key West, is going to be an issue as we head throughout the heavy rain duration uh, of this east side of Elsa. Kelly? All right, let's talk about what we know right now with Elsa. Hernando County has uh, offered sandbags for folks. Um, we are have a voluntary evacuation for some as well. There's local state emergency um, involuntary evacuation orders.
and uh, for mobile homes, low-lying and flood-prone areas for his governor, Ron DeSantis, has also issued states of emergencies in uh, 27 counties. And tonight's Tampa Rays and Cleveland uh, Indians baseball game, that has been postponed. You may be thinking, well, they play in a dome, right? Well, in consideration of people trying to travel through this mess, uh, they don't want anyone getting hurt in that. So certainly, I think, a good call uh, to postpone that game. Jen? All right, well, let me show you what we're dealing with right now, the latest. And by the way, new advisory comes out at 11 o'clock this morning. Um, but this is as of the 8 o'clock advisory. Winds at 60 miles per hour. But watching Paul's shot, he's been getting wind gusts up over 50. In fact, the latest uh, peak wind was 56 miles per hour in about the last half hour there in Key West. So the movement is still to the north-northwest um, at 12 miles per hour. We're going to be watching these conditions, though. I mean, look how they extend all the way down, still through. Cuba getting lashed with that uh, big batch of rain and showers and storms and probably winds gusting 40 to maybe even 50 miles per hour. So that's going to keep us in the zone here for this kind of weather all day today here in Key West and, and up through the, the middle keys as well, though it's not as bad there. You can see where we're just in some lighter rain, the worst of the weather affecting us in the lower keys. This is starting to make its way in across southwest Florida, like around Naples, watching around Port Charlotte, maybe Fort Myers. We're getting some light rain coming in right Right now, but look at Key West. The worst of the weather is just off to your west, though. I mean, take a look at this. These brightest colors out there, that's where the heaviest of rain and the strongest of the wind is. But we are getting lashed by just this very persistent area of rain, some thunderstorm activity, not a ton of lightning, but there's some. And the rainfall rates are heavy. The wind has been very persistent for the last nine hours. We've had tropical storm force conditions here, and we are going to continue to watch that throughout the day today. Now, New as of this morning, there was a hurricane watch that has been issued from Egmont Key near the St. Pete area up towards Steinhatchee in Florida. So there is the possibility that it strengthens back to a hurricane. Much more likely, though, it stays as a tropical storm, but a strong one. I mean, the conditions like you see with Paul, you won't get anything better than that. It's going to be certainly um, dealing with that here up and down the entire west coast of the Florida Peninsula as we get through the next, say, 12 to 18 hours. Just a reminder, you can watch the Weather Channel here. Uh, the White Street Pier in Key West. So uh, as people are driving around town, they're finding sometimes it's difficult to get through, of course, very dangerous trying to get through standing water because you don't know if there's a power line in there. You don't know uh, actually how deep that water is and if you'll be able to make it through or stall out. Once again, though, we uh, had been getting a little bit of a break from the rain. However, it's starting up again, and so is the wind. We expect it to continue as the storm is close to Key West. Live in Key West, Ted Scout, CBS 4 News. And Ted, we see you're in a parking lot, mostly empty, as it should be, but there there are some people there. We see some cars, some people just running around. Uh, any idea what they're doing? I mean, are, are they just taking pictures, or, or what's going on there? Well, it's kind of a thing here in Key West to go out to the end of the pier when there's a storm, which is uh, very dangerous to do, but a lot of people do that. That's just something that's, that happens here. Uh, we spoke to someone who just came back from out there, and it, it's, it's a good clip out there. And uh, what he was telling us is that the water appears to be uh, kind of thigh high out there, so uh, definitely flooding out there from all mm -hmm. the uh, waves and water from the ocean being pushed onto the pier. All right, Ted, thank you. Hopefully you'll be able to take a break. You deserve it and mm -hmm. get, uh, get out of that wet clothes. Thank you so much and stay safe. And now for the latest on Elsa's track, here's Lisette. Yeah, Ted has been a trooper. I mm -hmm. wanted to show you a live view from our Key West camera, and you can see the torrential rain and the palm trees swaying due to the strong winds, which, as Ted mentioned, really have been the strongest so far. Here's a look at Tropical Storm Elsa. You can see the center is just to the west, northwest of Key West. The worst weather has been moving through so far this morning and even through the early afternoon as we are on the east side, the wet side, where all those rain bands have just been streaming in from the south, from Cuba, the Caribbean, and just continuing on and on and training here across the lower middle keys. And that's the reason why the flood advisory has been extended until 12.30 p.m. for Big Copa Key, for Key West, and also for Stock Island, as there's already flooding taking place there. And the rain is spreading out across the middle and upper keys with some heavy downpours embedded with some of these cells. And you can see the southwest coast of Florida is also getting getting hammered right now. As Elsa lashes the island, and you can see right here just how strong 
The winds were and how heavy the rain was with the storm as it made landfall yesterday. About 23,000 waited out the storm from the safety of government shelters here. This storm has also unfortunately killed three people in the Caribbean. And here's the latest right now on Tropical Storm Elsa here in the United States. Uh, hurricane watches are in place along Florida's western coast as we await Elsa's arrival early tomorrow morning. It's uh, going to be impacting between now and then. Uh, Florida is under a tornado watch until 11 o'clock this evening. Tampa International Airport will suspend operations at 5 this evening. An evacuation shelter has opened in Hernando County where a voluntary evacuation has been issued. Two more shelters are open now in Pinellas County. And now we want to go to hurricane uh, expert and storm specialist Dr. Greg Postel, who's uh, tracking the latest with this storm. And Dr. Postel, uh, with the latest uh, update from the National Hurricane Center, a little bit stronger. Do you think that increases the chances now just, uh, you know, four miles an hour away from being a hurricane? Do you think it increases the chances there will be a hurricane out of this again? Yeah, it does. But I mean, just a few miles per hour on the wind speed, Chris, materially won't make a whole lot of difference. I don't think there's a, a lot of room on the upside to strengthen a whole lot. Maybe Maybe a little bit, but uh, a few miles per hour, if it goes up by five or ten, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't even notice the difference in that. It's very impactful weather still on the way, but that's a really good point, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. And there is Elsa right now offshore churning, and you can still see that really all of the rain and the bad weather is on the right side of it. Yeah, it's still windy out here, but the worst of it is north and east of the center. In some cases, over 100 miles away, we're still getting some pretty strong winds. Uh, right now, along the east coast of Florida, Looking pretty good. Earlier, Key West had a 70 mile per hour wind gust. The winds have now weakened a little bit, but they will strengthen as Elsa continues to move on its way in this area of North Florida. So while the weather here is very manageable, showers and thunderstorms, some light breezes, it's going to get worse later on today and tonight. There's the latest advisory, a 70 miles per hour in the wind speed, pressured down to about 1,000 millibars, but that was expected, and that's confirmed by the reconnaissance aircraft that went in there and were measuring and slicing and dicing their way through and did indeed find that Elsa was a little bit stronger and there was always some room for that. But the question is, is there room for it to get a lot stronger? And I don't think so. So that's good news there. Uh, here's what the re recon was finding in their first pass here right there. They found winds in the mid 60s ish and right now they're flying here and they're flying flight level level winds over 80 miles per hour. But at the surface, there's somewhere closer to 50. So there's a, a gradient as you go up in altitude. And that's expected with all those showers and thunderstorms in the vicinity. So that reminds us that on the west coast of Florida today, there may be some really gusty thunderstorms with wind gusts still over 60 to 70 miles per hour in some of the stronger ones. Look at this, though. The center circulation, guys is right about there. As long as this is here, the area of lowest pressure and the circulation right near the ocean surface is removed from most of the thunderstorms, like it's pretty much been for a while, we are not likely to see a whole lot of strengthening. Maybe a little bit, but this is why the upside, unless things change, is not likely to be a, a whole lot. But again, tropical storm force wind gusts likely extend out a good ways, perhaps up to 70 miles per hour. And here's that dry air that we've been talking about which has really been the important factor at keeping Elsa at bay. And that is one of the key things that we're watching. This is my last graphic. I'm going to show you this forecast as we bring now Hurricane, look at this, Hurricane uh, Elsa, probably right around 75 miles per hour or so, northward into Florida and then northward from there. So we've got to watch this very carefully, as I said. It was a mess today across North Miami. We had a lot of heavy rainfall, gusty winds. That led to some issues there with uh, traffic. And now a lot of that area is also under a street flood watch due to all the heavy rain. The reason for that is Tropical Storm Elsa. This is a great satellite view. You'll notice the center of circulation right here, a great shot of that. But the western side has no rain. Most of the cloudiness and the rain is sitting across the eastern sector and that is just drawing a lot of moisture across the Keys as well as southeastern uh, southeast Florida including Miami-Dade and Broward counties. So as of the 2 p.m. advisory 70 mile per hour winds plenty of rain again all of it on the eastern side that continues to track towards the north now being eyed out of Tampa 
just under 200 miles away. So what are we looking at here? Well, for the moment, we're still dealing with one feeder band right across Broward and offshore Miami-Dade County. Broward, still plenty of heavy rain across northern Broward County from I-595 north to the county line with Palm Beach. And from the coast, as far west as the sawgrass, that's impacting the turnpike uh, 441 and I-95. Meanwhile, southern of uh, Broward County, still dealing with a little rain across Davie. And right along the coast here, Hollywood's starting to dry out just a little bit. And then, because of all the heavy rainfall, there's a street flood advisory in place from the beaches west of I-95, almost to the turnpike, south of Fort Lauderdale, in through the county line. That remains in place until 545. Now, the heavy rain across Miami-Dade has basically come to an end. There's a big downpour sitting just offshore. Should sideswipe northeastern Miami-Dade moving into southern Broward for the next 30 minutes or so. But a lot of heavy rainfall has come down. A few inches came down rather quickly because of that. This entire area highlighted in green from the beaches west to Liberty City and I-95 and uh, from Fisher Island north of the county line has that advisory in place until 545 as well. The storm is trying to get its act together sufficiently to become a hurricane. Remember how much we had talked about the pressure being so high, the barometric pressure atypical of a tropical cyclone. Well, today it's finally below 1,000 millibars, still pretty high, I'd say, uh, for a storm that's packing 70 mile an hour winds and attempting to become a hurricane tonight. Uh, the wind, or rather the movement, is straight towards the north at 10 miles an hour, making the forecast of a exactly where it's going to make landfall on the west coast of Florida quite difficult because, of course, it's moving right parallel to the coast. Now, let's talk about what happened here in South Florida. Now, the uh, southernmost point, Key West, uh, that's within our viewing area, and you sustained the worst weather from the system. Uh, you had winds sustained at 47, gusting to 70 miles per hour. That happened today, uh, very close to noontime, 1150 or so. That's when you got the worst wind. Uh, since yesterday, four inches plus of rain and a bit of a storm surge, one to two feet was observed there in that area. There's that tornado watch, Trina, that you mentioned. Uh, it encompasses really a good percentage of the southern half of the state of Florida. It excludes the majority of the Florida Keys. It also excludes a bit of a corner of uh, Broward County. But let me let me refine this just a little bit for you. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, who's in charge of these uh, tornado watches, indicated that really the highest risk of tornadoes is on the west half of this uh, parallelogram here on the west half. So we're kind of on a quieter side of it. And frankly, as I look at local trends on radar, it doesn't look very likely that we're going to see anything that could produce a tornado. Obviously, if a tornado were uh, to be heading our way, we would break into programming. But right now, there's the storm off of Cape Coral and Port Charlotte moving towards the north. And here we sit in relatively quiet conditions right now with not a lot going on in terms of, of showers and thunderstorms in our area. Maybe one new shower there headed for the Key West area. I'll update this and give you the local Local forecast for the next few days coming up in a few minutes. John, thank you so much. But while the Keys dodged a direct hit from Tropical Storm Elsa, the system's outer bands lashed the area with heavy rain and gusty winds. The Keys experiencing those winds overnight and into the afternoon, the impact also being felt on the end of a holiday weekend. One of the busiest for the Keys since the pandemic first hit. Many businesses on Duval Street closed this morning waiting for Tropical Storm Elsa to exit. We're out here, it's a day off for us. Uh, this town's been slam busy. Um, everybody in the service industry has been knocked, so it's actually kind of nice. Luckily, the tropical storm didn't cause any major damage, we're told. On the ground in the Tampa Bay area, people now prepping for a possible close encounter with Hurricane Elsa. Sandbags being stacked along front doors and garages, just in case the system does strengthen to a hurricane, all in an effort to keep out the expected storm surge and flooding out. Rain already falling in Gulfport, which is near St. Petersburg, where some restaurant owners continue to pack up and pull inside everything they can. Just before the break, if you were uh, with us, we just learned breaking news that uh, Tropical Storm Elsa is now 
Hurricane Elsa once again. Uh, the 8 o'clock advisory coming a little bit early, uh, giving us that confirmation. Why have a conversation uh, about the intensification, what we've been seeing, and how much longer perhaps this might be uh, before it makes landfall? Bringing in Mike Bettis and, and Dr. Rick Nab, our hurricane expert and former director of the National Hurricane Center as well. So, Dr. Nab, not really a surprise to see this uh, breaking to uh, hurricane status, but uh, how much stronger do you think this thing could get? Well, I don't think it is a candidate for really rapid intensification in the last few hours before landfall. Doesn't mean it can't get a little stronger. Uh, now, one thing working for it to strengthen some more is its relatively small size uh, in terms of its inner core. And small systems can kind of go up and down in a real hurry. But I think that the environment argues for not rapid intensification, but you can't rule out a little bit more. Um, it's moving north at 14, so that buys it a little more time, right? The center of circulation will probably stay over water uh, for a little while longer. Now, here's what's interesting is that the hurricane hunters have not quite gotten into the inner core. You know, they based the, uh, in t the increase in the intensity from 70 to 75 miles an hour based on radar data, which you can't do for systems that aren't really close to shore. So that was one advantage the forecasters of the Hurricane Center had uh, in this case of having Doppler velocities to look at and then try to make some adjustment, uh, as difficult as that can be sometimes, to adjust the radar velocities at an elevated location with the radar beam down to what surface winds might be. But we'll, it'll be interesting to see what the aircraft uh, finds to see if they can confirm what's going on. And the radar data and the aircraft data are so critical in this case because satellite estimation in this case would not be very reliable. We've got this upper level trough causing the wind shear. But Mike and Jackie, when I look in closely, two things on satellite do jump out at me. One is, despite the shear, look at the upper level outflow uh, that is in the immediate vicinity of the storm looking pretty healthy so at the smaller scale it doesn't look like it's too terribly sheared and that low level center that was exposed earlier is now tucked in under the convection a little bit more and then of course the other thing that has really started to catch all of our attention is this I like feature I don't know if this is really an eye or really an eye wall but it certainly is trying to get better organized and so um, with an inner core that's producing that kind of convective signature on radar with all that lightning, with the velocities on the radar. Uh, either way, 70 or 75 mile an hour uh, tropical storm or hurricane, this is going to hammer the uh, Tampa Bay area and going north from there, guys, in just a few hours. It's, it's a right offshore. Dr. Nab, it always seems like once a system gets into the Gulf of Mexico, and even if it has just the smallest window of opportunity, it takes advantage of it, and it has in this case. Yeah, the, the, you know, one thing about the Gulf of Mexico is it's pretty much always warm enough <laughs> during hurricane season, and uh, the waters there are you know, well above 80 and 85 degrees in spots, and that often gives systems you know, a little bit of an advantage because even if you have some wind shear, you have so much fuel there. But the other thing too, Jackie and Mike, if you guys noticed that Elsa seems to have as one of its personality traits that it seems to be stronger than you think it should be given the situation mm -hmm. it's in. When it was over the Eastern Caribbean, mm -hmm. it was zipping along at 30 miles an hour and it was still a hurricane. That is a rare occurrence. So this one has been feisty all along. So let's talk about landfall. You know, this thing is going north, so it's paralleling the coastline, which makes it really tricky mm -hmm. to pinpoint landfall until that uh, turn begins to happen. How long do you think before this could be making landfall? A and talk about the coastline, too, because, you know, we ha it kind of goes out. It's a little bit more <laughs> uh, convex near Tampa, and then it goes in again. Yeah, and this is one of those cases where it might scrape land, uh, you know, more than once. So technically speaking, it could possibly, at the center circulation, you know, intersects the coastline there near St. Petersburg and Clearwater where it juts out a little bit. Technically, you could possibly have a landfall there or it passes just offshore. But that distinction isn't going to matter for Tampa Bay because I don't think it's going to go over or east of Tampa Bay. It doesn't look like anyway. And that's going to put that metro area along with Sarasota Bradenton on the stronger, heavier rain onshore flow side. So, you know, when, when you see the gust that we've observed here on the visible imagery uh, over the last several hours, uh, it's been pretty gusty, uh, you know, a good distance away from the center. So even if the center misses, uh, you know, some certain areas, uh, it's not going to spare people 
people from uh, getting the worst of it. But Jackie, I think to your point, uh, eventually it's gonna make landfall in the Big Bend area for good, at least for Florida. <laughs> Definitely. And then, thanks so yeah, much for and Mike and Jackie, after that, we've got the East Coast to worry about, and it's stronger than we thought. One of many, many threats we have over the next several hours, Dr. Nab. Yeah, and the tornadoes tend to be in the right front quadrant of the circulation relative to the forward motion, especially if there's land to add to the, the friction and the spin-ups. And that's just one of the ways in which the Florida Peninsula is on Elsa's bad side, right? You're on the east side, the rainier, windier side, the onshore flow side, all that. So far, the hurricane hunters have not confirmed uh, sustained winds of hurricane force, but they have not even come close to completing their mission. Uh, still got flood advisories here uh, in Naples. Uh, so that's a beginning of the flooding problems. That goes till 1130. And this training is going to ramp up the flood concerns as we go through the next uh, few hours. And the rain rates in this part of the storm, the business end of it, are really going to be high. And we could have a combination of fresh water and salt water flooding. Now let's take a look at some of the observations that we're getting on shore. Still, you haven't gotten the worst of the winds on the coast yet. The storm's going parallel to the coastline. Gusts at 35 miles an hour at uh, Sarasota, 29 at Fort Myers. Let's zoom in on the Tampa Bay region. Uh, Venice has gusted over 40 for a while. St. Petersburg gusting to 38, and it's all kind of in this direction, so it's coming from land. And that slows the winds down a bit. But once the center of circulation gets up in here and you get the open exposure from the Gulf, then the winds and the wind gusts will be even stronger. So, Jackie, it's going to be a rough night with wind and water in the west coast of the Florida Peninsula. Another big story, Elsa. The storm now a hurricane and expected to scrape Florida's west coast in a few hours with storm surge, high winds, and a lot of rain. Let's get out to South Florida's Chief Meteorologist John Morales and the new 11 p.m. advisory. John. And it's uh, pretty much a beam Tampa at this hour. Elsa is, and the National Hurricane Center is maintaining minimal hurricane strength at this hour, although the trends over the last few hours certainly show, again, a weakening system. Now, you do notice, one of the first things you should notice is that the central pressure here uh, is down to 997 millibars. You might recall we had talked about the fact that when the pressures are high, uh, we simply couldn't understand how we got a tropical storm going with pressures well above a thousand millibars but uh, this is more like a tropical system uh, to be below a thousand millibars and that's the case tonight moving north 14 miles an hour winds 75 miles per hour now when the storm passed key west at a distance of 50 miles it produced a 47 mile an hour sustained wind and a 70 mile an hour gust in key west also key west got over four inches of rain and a bit of a storm surge one to two feet as it crossed through that area there were some power outages as well now tonight uh, we have seen our tornado watch be replaced by one that does not include us here in south florida so the original tornado watch there it was it was supposed to be in effect uh, until 11 and of course that's gone away and now we've got this other one that encompasses areas outside of our viewing area from Naples all the way up uh, towards the west central Florida coast. Now look at this uh, radar sequence here and as you look offshore to the center of this storm this storm is really struggling tonight. It's always been a fragile system. Uh, right now the core is uh, pretty much falling apart. Upper level wind shear affecting it but these bands of precipitation continue to be very strong and likely producing some tropical storm force wind gusts there from Port Charlotte all the way to Tampa. Locally though things are pretty quiet tonight. Uh, now that the tornado watch is over we're not seeing a lot of rain heading our way so Thankfully, it looks like a pretty tranquil night, I would say, across our viewing area. I'll be back with a forecast for the rest of the week and the weekend coming up in a few minutes. And as we look at some uh, live uh, earth camps here, we are looking at Tampa on your left, Orlando on your right. And, well, a two-degree difference as far as air temperature, but not a lot of difference as far as air uh, as far as the cloud cover, of course, we're having the heavier rain bands in Tampa, but uh, time to time we'll see those heavy bands of storms move through Orlando and a good part of central Florida, as we've seen with Elsa really throughout the entire uh, existence of Elsa. It's always been a type of storm where a lot of the activity, most of the impacts were was east of the center circulation, and that continues at this hour. We're seeing a lot of it. 
of showers and storms uh, farther inland, even though the circulation still remains out over the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Heavier bands continue uh, basically uh, in around just to the east of Sarasota up through Tampa, Lakeland and Spring Hill. We're going to continue to see the heavy rain in a short period of time. Already had a tornado warning, a brief little spin up. Will not be surprised. We have a couple more of those as we head through the rest of this morning. Bigger perspective shows yet another cluster of storms just to the south of Fort Myers. So we're not quite done yet, even though the circulation is now off to the north and west. Uh, yeah, this is a far reaching type of thing. Tropical storms are often like this where you're seeing the impacts very far away. Still awaiting landfall and that'll happen here probably within the next hour. It's already really lashing out at where it's going to finally meet its destination, but still have a shelf life after that. But next landfall for the U.S. happening here in about 30 minutes. It is 35 miles to the west of Cedar Key, Florida. So if you're familiar with this area between Tallahassee and Gainesville, it's called the Big Bend area. They're getting hammered now with the downpours, tropical in nature. Embedded in those are some gusty storms and storm and, thun and uh, tornadic activity. 8 a.m. advisory puts the winds at 65 miles an hour. Next advisory is at 11. But those winds aren't going to really lose too much intensity despite the interaction with land. So again, it's a distance offshore, maybe between Perry and Apalachicola, it makes a run for it moving north at 14 miles an hour and continuing up through Georgia still as a tropical storm and a strong one at that two o'clock this afternoon. After that it heads across the Carolinas but in those inland areas that could be uh, problematic because those Piedmont areas of the Carolinas can flood typically eastern North Carolina typically floods uh, east of the Delmarva when the mid Atlantic region then past uh, Long Island and then even all the way up off the New England coast still as a tropical storm Elsa relentless, not giving up. Anyway, here's what we have. Uh, we have uh, showers and storms to our north. Uh, west of Lake Okeechobee is about as close as we get to any action so far today. We haven't seen a lot. We see this counterclockwise spin here. So around Gainesville, there's heavy rains, Cape Coral as well. And this is look at all the reports that we had, storm reports. We had some flooding, of course, on the west coast. We had some uh, reported radar indicated tornadoes. There was rain wrapped tornadoes. Uh, zilch here, nada. So it looks good. I mean, we're grateful. It looks uh, like a nice clean sweep currently. I mean, it's definitely murky outside a uh, cloudy or type day here for sure 86 in Boca it's 84 in West Palm it feels like the lower to mid 90s because of all that high moisture in the atmosphere we're in the low 80s on the Treasure Coast and any impact I mean you can see it's it's not a lot today because the clouds are going to kind of suppress the storm potential as the system moves away but um, put it there because you know we are in a uh, tropical system in Florida so we're, we're going to watch it for you Well, here we are checking in on a few locations here being impacted by our tropical storm Elsa, Cedar Key, that's the big uh, screen there for you, kind of on the left side of your screen. Horseshoe Beach, a couple of locations showing up there on the right side. Horseshoe Beach, one of the spots where we uh, just saw a report here uh, of an uh, uh, unofficial report of a 71 mile per hour wind gust. So, yeah, we'll see if that uh, gets verified or not, but still some strong winds associated with Elsa and still, of course, the heavy rain coming in as well. And here's the latest in Tropical Storm Elsa. More than 52 million people will feel the impacts of this powerful storm as it makes its way across northern Florida and up the east coast over the next few days. That's right. More than 10,000 now without power. 10,000 customers uh, are without power here in Florida. Thanks to this uh, tropical storm with 65 mile per hour winds, more than 6,000 crews are on standby to respond to power outages in Florida this week. Well, thank you so much for sticking with us here as we continue to track uh, Tropical Storm Elsa. I'm meteorologist Alex Wallace. And I'm meteorologist Jen Carfagno. We're tracking Elsa as it continues to push inland today. It's made landfall. Now the impacts are spreading inland. Yeah, and we'll continue to do so here and move up the East Coast as well. So lots of uh, opportunity to track this thing. It's a marathon we've been following for yeah. quite some time and still more to go. All right, let's get you the very latest here. What's going on with this system here? And again, we are following this thing now uh, with uh, that uh, landfall that took place here around 11 o'clock or so Eastern time. I think it happened uh, a bit before that, but nonetheless, Taylor County, Florida, as a tropical storm with 65 mile per hour winds, central pressure sitting at 999 uh, millibars. So there's that latest advisory here for us. The movement still at the north to the north at 14 miles per hour. Of course, what has been the case here, it seems like all uh, lifespan, the whole lifespan, the east side is where the worst it has been. That continues to be the case here for us. The bit, the bit of a tail that extends off towards the south with some still some rain showing up there for you in and around the Fort Myers area. Winds have been gusty at times as well, but that rain, that seems to be the big issue here for us now, beginning to rotate out of the zone where we do have a flash flood warning for Dixie as well as Taylor counties. That does include the city of Horseshoe Beach, Horseshoe Beach until 145. A lot of rain coming down in that zone, but the heaviest is now starting to exit. So that's certainly a better scenario, but now some of the heavier rain 
pushing on off towards uh, the north. Now we're talking about Lake City up towards Gainesville. And look, hey, Jacksonville, you're kind of right on that edge of some of the heavier rains getting ready to move into the now the southwest portion uh, of town. Again, there's that tail that extends from the east coast all the way back towards the southwest, uh, just south now Fort Myers, seeing some of that heavy rain. The visible satellite showing you the clouds that are spreading well on off towards the north here across parts of South Georgia into South Carolina as well. But the core that's there, and you can see some of those bubbling up thunderstorms here showing up. That's where the most intense uh, rain and some of the gusty winds are right now. The enhanced satellite shows you that as well. The darker shades of that red, even some of that white showing up, that's where we've got, again, the tallest of the clouds and the tallest of the thunderstorms. All right, let's talk about those alerts that are in place. Still tropical storm warnings here for you. Anywhere you see that red, so tropical storm conditions expected in those zones, North Florida, South Georgia, into South Carolina along the coast. And now extending northbound here, we did have tropical storm watches here for you into southeast parts of Virginia, but now extending eastern Maryland, Delaware, up into New Jersey, uh, some of those coastal areas uh, could experience tropical storm conditions as as the system moves off towards the north and east. So there's that projected path moving our way into the end of the week by Thursday morning at 35 mile per hour. So tropical storm here for us potentially uh, with some gusts that can't rule that out. And then continuing up towards the north and the east here with potential strengthening now. If it moves out over waters, that potential is there, but nonetheless impacts all the way up the east coast as we work our way through the end of the week. So Jen, a long ride yeah. when it comes to Elsa. Now the threat for flash flooding exists with Elsa. As we're tracking uh, Elsa, tropical storm Elsa with a 50 mile per hour tropical storm. It's moving to the north at 14 miles an hour, and it will continue to move through Georgia, the Carolinas, and then eventually all the way up to the northeast with some strong winds at times and also there's going to be this heavy rain and with the flood threat also comes a tornado threat for some right now lightning showing up just west of Jacksonville and some of the J Jacksonville suburbs here flash flooding happening here between Perry and Valdosta and including Valdosta Georgia so right along the Florida Georgia border the northern part is where there is some of the heavier rain and some of the uh, more dangerous weather, frankly, right now. And then as the storm continues to weaken, it will still be bringing some heavy rain to many of these locations and then could be back to tropical storm strength by Friday morning as it is interacting with the northeast with wind and rain before finally, Molly, getting out of the United States and into Canada and beyond by Saturday. So tracking Elsa, which stormed ashore in Taylor County this morning along Florida's northern Gulf Coast. And we are now seeing what it was like just to the south in Cedar Key as Elsa came ashore. The area felt the brunt of the storm early this morning. Residents braced for storm surge, strong winds and heavy downpours, but are relieved the storm caused minimal damage. I couldn't open up my sliding glass door because of the pressure of the wind. Yeah, our yard right now is underwater, wow. but no big deal. The storm has made its way north of Cedar Key and crews are now out making repairs, cleaning up debris and resolving power outages in the city. And Elsa is still affecting the Gulf Coast right now. Here's a look at the latest satellite imagery of that big storm. Look at that. So where is Elsa right now? Let's go to Luke Doris here with the very latest and a 5 o'clock advisory. Well, the latest advisory has for the first time today. Elsa is now out of Florida. It's about 60 miles northeast of Tallahassee in south central Georgia near Valdosta. Uh, winds at 45 miles per hour. The winds have come down, but still a tropical storm moving north at 14 miles per hour. The, it's still a lopsided storm. The worst of the weather is over on the right side of the center. This is a tornado warning. Bad weather in northeast Florida, southeast Georgia. They'll watch for tornadoes as we go throughout the evening. As we go into tomorrow, it's expected to, to weaken it into a depression, but then after it moves through the Carolinas and gets up into the northeast, the New England area, it taps back into water and is forecast to once again become a tropical storm. That would be by the end of the week. So Elsa is already, you know, tacking on to what has been a very busy 2021 hurricane season. We've had three U.S. landfalls. This is ahead of last year, and Elsa, by the way, was the earliest east storm on record. Here's the good news. Nothing out there is brewing. We're nice and quiet in the tropics. Calvin and Nicole. Where are the warnings? And I'm really getting more and more concerned about what could happen in places like Savannah and Charleston overnight tonight. Right of the track, outside of the cone. I mean, it's made a little progress since 5 p.m. and it'll be crossing into South Carolina in the wee hours uh, tomorrow morning. And it's going to be a right loaded system. It's going to be 
to the right of the cone and mostly outside of it where we are going to have the greatest threat of what could be life-threatening flash flooding. That's why we've got to stay off the roads. Um, and it will proceed northeastward from there as we go through Thursday and Friday. And it's because Elsa, has, ever since it's gotten to the Gulf of Mexico, it's been right loaded because of the wind shear. And this is the stronger side of the storm. And now it's tapping into the warm moisture off the Gulf Stream. And we've got very, very heavy rain on the right side. So it doesn't matter that the center circulation is going to be over land for a while. It's going to bring in a lot of water off the Atlantic and dropping it on land areas. Yes, it's going to be windy. It's increasingly windy in Savannah. We've gusted over 30 at times. Brunswick has gusted near 40 with the help of the, uh, the air being brought down from above by those strong thunderstorms and the heavy rainfall. But it is continuing to come down. Extremely heavy rainfall in Brunswick. And now we've got a new flood advisory to the north of Brunswick until uh, 930. That could be a pre-flash flood warning. This is just the beginning of the problems there. Look at this. In Brunswick, last hour, radar estimates that it has rained in three inches in just one hour. So we still got a flash flood warning in Brunswick till nine uh, local time. And when you look at the big picture, Mike, Savannah is next. And this is going to be a big, big rain event for Savannah. And then Charleston, you are after that. So what all these flash flood warnings are telling us is that we've got a significant risk in the very flood vulnerable areas of Savannah and Charleston. Go to bed tonight, stay off the roads, and wait till after breakfast tomorrow to get back out on the roads. Tonight, we are also tracking the latest path on Tropical Storm Elsa as the storm is now approaching South Carolina. Elsa made landfall just before noon in Florida's Big Bend. That area hit with strong winds, heavy rainfall and flooding. Thousands of people lost power. And this is the scene in Cedar Key this evening as the storm moved through. Rising waters in Gainesville led to at least one water rescue after this woman's home was flooded. Elsa now expected to travel along the east coast, threatening some major cities. Now, although the storm is weakening now, it may regain some strength. Our severe weather expert Mike Lyons joins us tonight with the latest on Elsa. Mike? Yeah, that storm system is expected to regain some strength overnight. It will weaken just a bit, likely be downgraded to a depression, but then as we head toward Friday, the storm will become a tropical storm once again and could threaten the Northeast with those tropical storm force winds. Let's begin with a look at the satellite imagery of our system tonight, and you'll notice a convective burst just off, off the coastline of the Carolinas and Georgia. Look at this big burst of activity. Now, the center is still back here by Brunswick, but if that center happens to get over the warm waters of the Gulf Stream, there's a chance the storm could intensify even more. In the meanwhile, heavy, heavy rain what a night in Savannah, Georgia tonight and not far from Charleston, South Carolina. Again, the center here about 150 miles away from Charleston. This is a storm that just won't go away. Right now, winds are right around 45. But again, as Todd and Tiffany pointed out, the storm made landfall almost 11 hours ago. It's been over land now for almost 11 hours. The forecast from the Hurricane Center as we head through the next couple of days calls for some weakening. You can see a tropical storm tomorrow, but as it moves into the Carolinas, it will weaken to a depression, then perhaps make a comeback. That's why tropical storm warnings are now in effect for the Mid-Atlantic region and a tropical storm watch as far north as Nantucket, where we could see tropical storm conditions as we head toward the weekend. Finally, by Friday, the system moving through the Canadian Maritimes. That's the latest on Elsa. Thankfully, elsewhere in the tropics, nothing going on. And the Hurricane Center says we're unlikely to see any activity over the next five days. Back here at home, hot and dry. We'll talk about that when I'm back with my full forecast in a couple minutes. This is CBS 4 News This Morning. Good morning. It is 6 o'clock on Thursday, July 8th. I'm Francis Wang. And I'm Maribel Rodriguez. Thank you so much for making us a part of your morning. This morning, we continue to track Tropical Storm Elsa. The storm now making its way into the Carolinas, soaking the south with drenching downpours. The storm making landfall in northern Florida yesterday, leaving behind a mess, flipping vehicles, downing trees, and knocking out power. In Jacksonville, one person was killed after a tree struck two cars. For the latest on the storm and a check of our local forecast, let's turn things over to meteorologist Isaac Gonzalez. Good morning. 
Good morning, Francis and Maribel. Good morning to all of you. As we look at the 5 m advisory, Tropical Storm Elsa is moving into the southern parts of South Carolina and headed to the northeast at about 18 miles an hour. And tropical storm warnings are in effect from the Carolinas and all the way up the east coast, now including parts of the mid-Atlantic and New England areas, as tropical storm conditions will likely be impacting some of these areas, as Elsa is expected to continue to move to the northeast and eventually head near the mid-Atlantic maybe by overnight tonight into tomorrow morning and then throughout the day tomorrow could be bringing some heavy rain and gusty winds through parts of the northeast New England areas before it finally becomes a post-tropical cyclone as we head into the weekend and then heads into the Canadian Maritimes. But as we take a look at the radar and satellite, you'll see some nasty weather right now moving across the Carolinas. We've had some tornado warnings issued. There's a potential for flooding as well because of all the moisture associated with all sudden that it'll continue Continue to write up the East Coast. There was no need to set an alarm clock this morning. Elsa taking care of that early wake up call for just about everybody before sunrise. Plenty of lightning and thunder. By the way, this is the same man that's moving through Myrtle Beach. All right. Um, strong wind, heavy rain, occasional tornado warnings, especially up through Charleston. We got anywhere from two to five inches of rain and a lot of localized flooding there uh, in the downtown Charleston area. But no damage. Uh, thank goodness to the significant jam is to speak of. Here's what we know this hour. Emergency operations centers have been activated in both South and North Carolina uh, as people deal with the flooding down power lines and trees. And of course, now new oncoming power outages. The U.S. with its first confirmed death due to Elsa, a man in Jacksonville killed yesterday when a tree fell on his car. Three people were killed in the Caribbean because of Elsa. The power companies in the Northeast, which have already been dealing with thousands of power outages from storms over the past several days, unrelated to Elsa, mind you, are now waiting for Elsa and bringing on extra contractors. So, Steph, we're going to be ready for this thing tomorrow morning. I think we'll have a twofold threat. Uh, we'll have a storm that may have a little bit more of a bump up in the wind yeah. overall and potentially flooding. I mean, it's wet here. It is wet here, and we're going to see more of it. Let's show you where Elsa is right now, and then we'll talk about it. Moving on into the northeast, it made landfall as a tropical storm uh, in Taylor County, Florida, and it brought winds of 65 miles an hour. Wait till you see the video we show you of landfall. You won't believe. I mean, everyone's like, oh, it's just a tropical storm. It cranks. When you're in the worst winds, it's pretty impressive. So we've had numerous power outages here uh, anywhere from South Carolina, Things are looking better in South Carolina. I will say we were over 30,000 customers without power, so thumbs up that we're getting an improvement there. The rain has brought up to 11 inches in some places here in Florida. Punta Gorda, also Port Charlotte, we've seen that double-digit rainfall. Sanibel, not too shabby, and a record in Gainesville of over three inches. So this thing is racing off to the northeast at 18 miles an hour, just barely a tropical storm. Tropical storm force winds start at 39 miles an hour. And notice that we have those tropical storm warnings all the way up to Massachusetts with this system. So there is your rotation. There's a tornado warning we've been following. We'll go live momentarily to Jackie Jarris to talk more about that. But we have seen our winds gusting. Highest wind gusts so far, South Carolina, uh, 80 miles an hour. Trees down in places like Adams Run, South Carolina. Uh, Charleston Airport gusting to 47. And that rain from Columbia over to Florence on I-20. Orangeburg, Manning, you're seeing that rain as well. And there it is, that tornado warning that we're following going right up 17. And the red means the winds are going away from the radar. Green means it's going towards. And so as you can see, that's why you get that rotation. And that's what we're seeing. And it is headed straight up to Coning, uh, Nixonville, and uh, farther northbound as well here as we head through the bottom of the hour. Tropical storm Elsa doing major damage in northern Florida, whipping winds, overturning mobile homes and leaving debris in the street. In a similar situation in South Carolina, trees toppled and power lines knocked down as Elsa makes its way up the coast. Millions are feeling Elsa's impacts with thousands left without power. The damage even turning deadly. Heavy rainfall drenching Florida's northern Gulf Coast Wednesday. After Elsa made landfall in Taylor County Tuesday night east of Tallahassee with maximum sustained winds of 65 miles per hour. Video here from Horseshoe Beach near the Florida Panhandle shows the storm surge in action. Watch as this peninsula disappears, swallowed by the sea. There's a tornado right there. That is a big tornado. On the east side of the storm, a tornado whipping through parts of Jacksonville. Some residents capturing the twister as it tore through town. 
Photos from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office show down trees and power lines ripped down by the tornado. He saw the sky turn very, very dark, and all of a sudden he said that he saw his fence come down. He a reporter in Columbia County, north of Gainesville, reports on damage from another possible tornado. Residents there seeking shelter as conditions worsened. Flooding also a big concern. The Alachua County Sheriff's Office tweeting out pictures of roads turned to rivers. In Georgia, this was the aftermath of a suspected tornado at Naval Submarine Base Kings Bay. State and local officials in Florida say the state was spared from any significant structural damage. Tens of thousands of people without power as of Wednesday night, but Florida overall didn't see widespread outages. There are more than 10,000 restoration personnel prepared to respond to these outages. Lifeguards have been quite busy in Atlantic City telling swimmers to stay closer to the shore as Elsa moves north. Officials to our north telling people to get ready for whatever Elsa may bring. A tropical storm watch in place. So everybody in general should take uh, uh, take this opportunity to check their emergency kits, you know, their preparedness kits, make sure that they have, you know, all the necessary items, you know, should they lose power um, or even if they should evacuate. So this is a good time to uh, drill at home. At least 10 people were injured at Kings Bay Base in Georgia, all of them taken to the hospital. Where Elsa is right now, I'm meteorologist Chris Warren as we are all here at the Weather Channel tracking Elsa and what's going on with Elsa and around Elsa. A lot happening with this and this storm is bringing more than just rain and wind. It's also bringing the threat of tornadoes and some very rough surf as well. So the effects of some of the wind and the spin associated with this storm leading to some complications here. 45 mile per hour tropical storm right now. It's moving to the northeast at 20 miles an hour. So it is clipping along through North Carolina. Next stop or next pass through it will be Virginia through Maryland and then Delaware, New Jersey and up to New England. And a lot of heavy rain around Raleigh, especially to the north. A little bit of thunderstorm activity as uh, we watch this little batch approaching Norfolk and Virginia Beach. And the Outer Banks also going to be a bit on the stormy side. There is that tornado threat with this tropical system like we've seen the past couple of days as it was making landfall and then moving inland, bringing that threat for more tornadoes uh, across the mid-Atlantic and then more severe weather possibly in the northeast as well. Here's Raleigh and this yellow, orange and red is where some of the heaviest rain is coming down at the moment. Well, we are getting a look at some of the damage left behind after tropical storm Elsa moved across the state. Widespread damage reported in Jacksonville. A man dying after a tree branch fell and hit two cars. New video shows a possible tornado passing through the area. Many homes were damaged. And a similar scene in Georgia here. An EF2 tornado left a destructive path at this naval base in Kings Bay. You see their vehicles were flipped upside down. There are reports of non-life-threatening injuries. Elsa now headed up the east coast of the U.S. Chief Certified Meteorologist Betty Davis is here with our tropical update. Good afternoon. Those outer rain bands still do carry a tornado threat from northeastern North Carolina toward the Delmarva Peninsula. That's where a tornado watch is in effect. And then outside of that, notice New York City under a severe thunderstorm watch. As of the 2 p.m. advisory, Elsa has winds of 45 miles per hour. So, yes, it's over land. And, yes, it remains a tropical storm moving quickly toward the north east at 20 miles per hour. Here's the projected path. It's going to stick pretty close to the mid-Atlantic states and head up toward the northeast. By Friday night, the U.S. should be done with Elsa. Elsewhere in the tropics, not a whole lot to talk about. Things are pretty quiet. There is a broad area of low pressure right here over Texas, but this system is over land, so it does not have the potential to develop. Nothing out there for us to be concerned about. We can head into our Friday and the weekend feeling pretty good about things. That doesn't mean we won't have a few thunderstorms. We'll talk about that coming up. Calvin. And I'm meteorologist Mark Elliott, joined by storm specialist Carl Parker. And Carl, I don't want anyone to, you know, put their guard down as this storm is moving up the coast. Maybe mostly because of what occurred today. 
without the tropical rains around New York City, as an mm -hmm. example, the uh, pretty intense flooding and now more rain on the way. A lot more rain on the way, and this thing has produced tornadoes today, and we've had a number of flash flood warnings in North Carolina and also in Southeast Virginia, so it is still packing a punch. It is far from over at this point, and in fact, it actually got more intense between yesterday and today, feeding off of the contrast between some cooler air uh, over the continent and warmer, more humid air over the ocean. A 50 mile per hour storm right now. It is moving rapidly to the northeast at 21 miles per hour. Expected to be a 50 mile per hour tropical storm as it moves across the northeast coast uh, overnight and into early tomorrow. So there is a look at the uh, radar picture. The current position of the storm is more like there. We'll get an update with the 11 p.m. advisory. So that's going to be coming up uh, probably in less than an hour. Some pretty gusty wind uh, right now. We're getting winds gusting consistently in the middle 30s in a lot of spots, Wallops Island and Norfolk, as well as uh, Patuxent River Naval Air Station. And then now uh, Elizabeth City gusting to 41 miles per hour on the back side of that circulation. And we've had some tornadoes as well. There was a tornado just outside of Suffolk earlier, did cause some tree damage and some damage to some outbuildings as well. We've not heard about any injuries as a result of that storm. But there's an ongoing flash flood warning, so please uh, be aware of that. That heavy rain now coming up through southeastern Virginia and crossing the Chesapeake Bay and now moving into southern Maryland near Salisbury. It looks like a lot of that is going to be outside of the D.C. metro area, but as you get farther south and east, certainly into eastern Maryland, it's going to get a whole lot wetter. Now, here's the model forecast showing you how this moves up the coast. And so 2 o'clock in the morning, very heavy rain coming into southern Jersey. And by the way, this is an update to our high resolution model forecast, and it's not as aggressive about bringing the rain into New York City early on. But what it does show is that it moves in more towards the morning hours before daybreak. So four to five to six o'clock in the morning could be an area of very heavy rain coming into the tri-state area. And so keep in mind, we just had all that serious flooding. And so perhaps as some of you are going to work tomorrow, uh, we will expect to see it at least a very, very heavy rain coming down and possibly more flooding given that there is so much water that's running off right now and water in the ground already. That then coming up across Long Island, very gusty wind, heavy rain into the Boston area around mid-morning and that continues into the early part of the afternoon. And by the way, some additional thunderstorms coming into New York City, we think by tomorrow evening. But we got to start with this, Jordan. Yeah, that is Elsa, which has wind Oof. stronger today than it did yesterday. 50 mile hour winds today. And it's yeah. heading into an area that has already had severe weather. Jet ski, no. yeah. In the Bronx. In the Bronx. In the Bronx. In the Bronx. I Only mean, in the Bronx. You yeah. see that. Uh, yeah. Good, good times. You may be able to do it again today. I hope not, though, because we, we do not need any more rain. Flash flood guidance is pretty low. Look at the rain, though, across all of Long Island, down the Garden State Parkway, up into the New England Thruway. This thing's moving, too, at 31 miles an hour. It's the fastest speed in nine days uh, that we've had, it, even when it moved through the islands. And it's just kind of holding on uh, to the Jersey Shore right now um, with, with, its, uh, with, its, with its circulation center. But that is going to eventually eject and head across the Cape. We had heavy rain yesterday across parts of North North Carolina, Raleigh set a record. Of course, this was, I'm talking about the rainfall associated with else. We had a lot of records yesterday, even Central Park. Uh, very, very heavy rain yesterday. And now we got this that's coming in on top of that. And look at this rain on the south shore of Long Island. We've been watching this band, this lead band, um, come ashore earlier uh, near Monmouth County. We had a tornado warning with that. There are still some appendages along this band, but so far not very strong rotation, which is obviously a good thing for those living along the south shore of Long Island. Now, this is what is very interesting to me, all right? The center of circulation is about right here, and we had winds with the circulation center of 71 and 75 miles an hour. That's amazing, and it was in the western part of the circulation center as well. Um, this thing again, right here. Now look at what's going on. Special marine warnings existing for that line almost along the entire shore of Long Island. Uh, no longer tropical. In fact, it is a post-tropical storm, uh, more academic than anything right now because it is still bringing and lashing the Northeast uh, with a lot of rain. It's bringing a lot of rain, some very strong winds as well. So flash flooding remaining a big concern here. Uh, and flash flood warnings posted from Portland all the way down to Connecticut and right down to the coast as well. And the winds still coming onshore 
across a lot of Massachusetts, uh, Hartford to Springfield. Flash flood warning in effect in New London to Norwich, Worcester, uh, all these areas here, including Boston. Uh, all of urban Boston here, uh, down to Brockton, just about down to Plymouth and around Duxbury, uh, flash flood warning does remain in effect. There's been a lot of heavy rain and there's still a lot of heavy rain. As far as the the winds though, winds now up a mile in Nantucket. The wind gusts at, at 49 miles an hour. And of course, Nantucket, beautiful island out here in the ocean and you've had the winds just zipping right along, nothing but the water to slow it down. And that doesn't do much to slow the winds down, we know. 33 mile an hour wind gust here in Martha's Vineyard, East Hampton at 23. And Boston with an onshore wind here at 15 miles an hour. That's your sustained winds. Post-tropical, Elsa, now with still tropical storm conditions expected. Again, post-tropical just mean the characteristics of the storm no longer uh, straight tropical. Don't have as much of an obvious warm core uh, deal here. Storm has moved on a little bit. It's now over Rhode Island and Massachusetts, and then it's going to be back over water. And as it moves, it's still going to be pushing a lot of rain and water. It's going to be a, a rough time at the coastal areas uh, in Maine uh, because this evening it's still expected to be a 50 mile an hour storm. And again, 50 mile an hour northeast at 31. So it's going very quickly. It's possible by sunset some of the worst of the weather will be out of here, but that's not yet. But this is summertime, and then you can see as we go through the late morning hours, we get towards around noontime, 2, 3 o'clock. That's when we pick up that chance for showers across the inland communities. Again, Lake O going to be the hot spot tomorrow afternoon. Here's a look at Elsa. It is post tropical. Look, winds are still at 50 as it continues. I told you it's going to hook up with that front. It is now riding the front up into Canada. Look at that forward motion northeast at 35 miles per hour. It's kicking it, booking it out of the picture. Thank goodness we can finally say goodbye to Elsa. We've been tracking that thing for at least a week, right? So back here at home, as we go through the overnight, showers diminish. Then as we go through tomorrow afternoon, notice there will be some scattered showers possible around the coast, but the bulk of the activity will stay around Lake O and Florida's west coast. It's going to be hot, it's going to be humid. Temperature between, let's say, 88 and 90. Then as we head through Sunday, high pressure and a nice little easterly breeze because it nudges on in. It's going to allow for more showers to be confined to the southwest Florida.